Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Saved by the Bad Boy A Billionaire Fake Fiancé Romance Book 13 of the Irresistible Brothers series by Scarlett King and Michelle Love. Narrated by Google Play Auto Narrated Voice. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Blurb. She came back into my life, reminding me of a pact we'd made when we were kids. But she wants to shave a few years off the planned date. Marriage. Right now. Not for us. What she wants is all fake. I made a pact with her that if we hadn't found true love with anyone else by the time we turned 40, then we would get married. Pretending to be in love with someone whose smile melts my heart isn't easy. What I feel every time I touch her isn't fake. She's not the same girl I used to know though. Her manipulative ex made sure of that. She used to shine so brightly, and he's taken that light away nearly completely. But there's a glimmer, I get to see in her now and then. Love, real love, could make her shine again. If only we could get rid of the threatening hole, who seems set on destroying her completely. Chapter 1 Chance The sound of the waves crashing against the shore just outside my office window did little to distract me from my work. The soothing sound in the background, the perfect white noise, actually enhanced my thinking abilities. I worked on a design that would enable our machine to not only use the waves of the ocean to generate electricity, but also to store the energy for future use. This was my dream, and it was my job to make it happen. My older brothers had given me all the time I would need to make my dream come true, which was great. It was much easier to think creatively, without anyone breathing down my back. And one had to be on the creative side to invent something like I was trying to. My computer dinged, telling me that my assistant in the reception area had messaged me. It seemed that I had a personal visitor, and he wanted to know if I should send her in now. I had no idea who her was but still, I replied with a yes. Closing my laptop, I looked at the door, wondering who was about to come through it. The door moved, and in stepped a young woman. It took me a second to realize I knew her. Ruby Salazar, I said in greeting as I stood and went to her. I held out both hands and she took them, smiling at me with the biggest and brightest smile I had ever seen. Chance Duran. Leaving a kiss on her cheek, I asked, what do I owe the pleasure of this visit from one of my oldest friends? A blush colored her plump cheeks. It's kind of a long story. Think we can sit down and talk about it. Leading her to the sitting area nearest the open window, I sat down with her on the white leather sofa. I love long stories. Please tell me your tale, Ruby. I should warn you that this tale does not have a happy ending. A slight frown pulled her full, caramel-colored lips down into a horseshoe shape. Maybe I can fix that for you, I said with a grin. I hate to see you frown, Ruby. Well, it's hard not to. See, I came to you because I didn't know who else could, or would, help me with this problem that I've gotten myself into. She fidgeted in the seat, revealing that she was nervous about what she had to say to me, which was ridiculous. Ruby, it may have been a while since we've seen each other, but we've known each other since kindergarten. You know that you can tell me anything. Her dark eyes lit up as she looked into mine. Chance, this is exactly why I came to you. We have this long history between us. I feel closer to you than I have ever felt to anyone. So try not to judge me too harshly. I would never do such a thing. She had me anxious to hear what she had to say. Just dive right in and start talking, girl. You can trust me. I know I can. She closed her eyes and laid her head back on the sofa. It all started two years ago. I met a man who'd moved into Brownsville from Matamoros, Mexico. He and some of his friends came to the fishing charter company that I work for. They wanted to go deep sea fishing, 
and I set them up on a trip for that morning. I guess I made some kind of an impact on the leader of the group, a man named Logan. Because he asked you out? I took a guess. Nodding she sighed. He did ask me out. And it was the best date I'd ever been on. He took me on a private plane, keeping everything a secret. It kind of made me nervous but also excited. I can see that. Where did he take you? I thought that was risky behavior, and not much like the ruby I knew. But I could see the attraction of it. Marina del Rey, in California. We had dinner on a private yacht. It wasn't his, but it did belong to some group he was a part of. And we had the whole gorgeous thing to ourselves. Well, there was the crew, but other than them, we were alone. And they stayed scarce, you know what I mean? I do. They kept to themselves, only popping out when they saw that you two needed something. I've been on a few of those myself. One of my brothers has one. It's quite the adventure, and so luxurious too. So, I'm going to venture a guess and say that this guy swept you off your feet from the get-go. Yes he did. Her cheeks went scarlet, as she must have been remembering the night they had on the yacht. He was sort of full of fire, and the passion was like nothing I had ever experienced before. And he didn't let up on me either, which flattered me. You know what I mean. Of course. I knew that it could be hard not to be attracted to people with passionate personalities. But I also knew that passionate people could be over the top at times. You're here, talking to me though. So this whirlwind love affair must have gone haywire at some point. It was a whirlwind. You got that right. He took me all over the place. He showed me things I had no idea even existed. He lived in a world that was as foreign to me as life on another planet. The opulence overtook me. I fell for the money, the lifestyle, all of it. So, this guy is part of the billionaire circle. I too was a part of that circle, but I preferred not to be too flashy about that fact. Not that I was cheap. I was just more down to earth than others who were as fortunate as me. No he's not. But I didn't realize that until it was too late. Not that I was with him only for the money. You know that's not me. I was with him mostly because he was always there, scooping me up, taking me to exotic places, feeding me insanely good food. You haven't said one word about love. We said the words to each other. I meant them. I don't think he did though. I think I was more of an object to him than the love of his life. See he went from treating me like a queen, to treating me like I belonged to him. He stopped asking me if I wanted to go with him places, and began telling me about the things we would be doing. I had my job to think about, not that he cared about me making money to pay my bills. But he didn't pay them, so what else was I going to do but keep working? He didn't seem to understand that though. And this is what led to your breakup. I realized that she had left out that ending. Did you break up with him? She nodded then gulped. In like the worst way ever chance. And what is the worst way ever? I really had no idea about that. Breaking up was never easy or nice, so they all seemed like bad ways to me. I left him at the altar. I was going to marry him. I really was. But when I stood there, looking at all our guests, I saw something that just didn't sit right with me. It became clear to me who Logan really was. And who was he? He works as the manager of a car dealership here in Brownsville. When we met he had just moved into town to take the job. Which dealership is it? The Lamborghini dealership. She shook her head. But I think that's just a cover. I don't think he really runs anything there. His real job doesn't have a thing to do with expensive cars. I think he's involved with something much worse. Things I shouldn't elaborate on, or it might put you in danger. I'm not afraid. Her hand wrapped around mine as her smile beamed. I know you're not. But I'm afraid for you. So let's leave it at that. See when I stood there looking at all the people who'd come to our wedding, I finally noticed something about Logan and his friends that I had never noticed before. They were exceptionally tight. How do you mean? So, 
Logan had only introduced me to his mother once. His father passed away a couple of years before we met. Other than his mother, there were no other relatives of his at our wedding. Instead, his half of the church was filled with men in black suits. Some had women with them, but most didn't. His mother sat alone in the front, dabbing her eyes with a linen handkerchief. A lot of moms cry at their son's wedding. I knew my mother had cried at all my brother's weddings. It doesn't mean she doesn't like you. No. I mean, I know she didn't know me well enough to even form an opinion of me. Like I said, he took me to meet her only once. It was more like that she was the only one showing any emotion on his side. The others just stared at me. It was almost like they were sizing me up or something. It gave me chills. What about the man waiting for you at the end of the aisle? The groom mattered more than his guests, after all. Logan looked at me with no smile on his face. He showed no emotions either, which was odd to me. The man had been full of passion. Yet he stood there, stone still, no evidence of happiness on his face at all. I'd been smiling all morning as I got ready for my big day. My family and friends were all smiles too. My mother had shining eyes as she looked at me with so much love. My father even smiled at me. So what made you turn tail and run? It was the look on Logan's face when I failed to step forward while the wedding march played on and on. His jaw clenched. His eyes narrowed. And then I saw his hands ball into fists. He looked at the man who stood beside him, his best man, a man I hadn't even met before, and he nodded just a little. That man began glaring at me, the same way Logan was. Wow. I couldn't imagine anyone doing something like that, at their wedding. I mean, I get that he would become nervous when you didn't start walking down the aisle. But being angry. So uncool. Despite the heaviness of the story, I couldn't help but be glad that Ruby had come to me with this. Talking to her now, it was like no time had passed. Yeah, I know. I sort of froze with fear as he and his best man glared at me. And then I looked at Logan's guests and found they finally were showing some emotion. Only the emotion was anger, hatred even. So I turned and walked away. I didn't run. I had made a decision, and that decision was that I didn't know Logan well enough to marry him. And I wasn't sure if I even wanted to date him anymore. So, did you see him again after you left him standing at the altar? He came to the dressing room where I had already changed into the clothes I'd come to the church in. He was beyond angry with me. I told him that I felt that something was off and that this wasn't the right time for me to make such a huge and life-changing decision. And I said that I was sorry. He told me that if I didn't get my ass back into that wedding gown and back down that aisle, I would find out how sorry I was going to be. Wow. I didn't know what else to say to something that horrible. He seems like a total lunatic. He's more than just a jerk. She took a deep breath, closing her eyes. He told me that if I didn't marry him, things wouldn't work out for me. And that is when he made a slight admission as to what he really was. He said that he could make it so I wouldn't wake up the next morning if I didn't do as he said. My adrenaline went crazy and I jumped up. No way. I'd never been so mad in my life. I slammed my fist into my palm. Where is this jerk? No. She reached out, taking my hand and pulling me to sit down again. Chance, no way in hell. He's dangerous. Far too dangerous for you to go beat up. I managed to talk my way out of things with him. I told him that I just wasn't marriage material. I told him that I hadn't thought about it before, but that I wouldn't be a good wife to him. I said that he deserved more than I could give. I wasn't good enough for him. I said all those things to pump up his ego and to make him think that I'd finally realized things about myself that I didn't like. And he went for it too. Which made me happy. So he left you alone after that day. Pretty much yeah. That was six months ago. But then two days ago, I ran into him. He said that he hadn't found anyone better than me, and that we should give it another shot, which I was never going to do. So I told him a lie. About what? About you and me. 
us. I was lost as to what she was saying. What about us? I didn't want him bothering me anymore. Like, not ever again. So I told him that you and I had made a pact when we were kids. You do remember the pact we made, don't you? The one about marrying each other, if neither of us had found the right person by the time we turned 40. I remembered it well. But I hadn't ever really thought it would come to us getting married for real. Yeah that pact. Our one and only pact. But I changed up the terms a bit when I told him about it. I said that you and I had been in love since we were kids, and we had finally realized it. I told him that was why I couldn't give him my heart, it had always belonged to you. So, what are you going to do now? I know we're 15 years shy of being 40 since we're both 25, but I'm going to ask you if you'll marry me Chance Duran. Marry me to keep that man away from me. That's the only way I'm going to be safe. Chapter 2 Ruby You know, this is the first time I've been to your new house, Chance. It was no house. It was a spectacular beachside mansion. And let me say, it is astounding. Well, I call it home. He leaned against the doorframe of the bedroom suite he'd told me I could use during our engagement ruse. If we're going to do this, then we're going to do it right. I have a porter bringing over the new Range Rover I bought for you. It's pearl white and glistens just as brightly as a pearl too. All leather interior, also pearl white with polished oak accents. There's a sunroof of course because this is a beach town and wasting fresh air is like a sin around here. I have my little Ford Escape chance. I began unpacking my things to put them away. My fiancé does not drive a ten-year-old car. He reached into the pocket of his shorts, drawing out a credit card. Here, take this. He walked over to the bed where I was unpacking my things and handed the card to me. This is an unlimited credit card. Use it for everything. I've made an appointment for you at Harry's Beauty Salon, too. I told them to give you the works. He ran his hand through my hair. Some golden highlights for your dark hair will make you look even prettier than you already are. You don't have to do all this. Just pretending to be my fiancé is more than enough chance. Really. Don't go spending tons of money on me. Too late. He slipped the credit card into the pocket on the outside of my purse, which lay on the bed. Just so you know, I think a coral color would look great on your fingernails and toenails. You know, in case you want to make your fiancé happy. Chance. I wasn't liking him going overboard the way he was. I don't see a need for all this. Well, I do. He chuckled, sitting down on the bed. Everyone has to think this is true, Ruby. The people you work with. Our friends and family too. I'm not about to lie to my family. That was taking it too far. I thought you said this guy was into bad things. He is. If he's into bad things, then chances are he's got eyes and ears everywhere. I just think it would be best to make everyone, and I do mean everyone, think that we're going to get married. And that we're hopelessly in love with each other, too. That part is key. I'm going to take you out, show you off, make sure everyone knows that we're a thing. A great thing. I'm keeping my job. I thought I should make sure you know that. Like I said before, Logan didn't think anything of me missing work. And my boss came close to firing me for that. I'm not about to tempt him a second time. We can do whatever you want, only make sure it goes along with my work schedule. Which is, he asked, pulling out his cell phone. I've got to make a note of when you'll be working. Six to ten each morning, excluding Mondays and Thursdays. I'm off until three in the afternoon, then I go back and work until seven. Most weekends I work overtime hours, rarely getting even an hour off for lunch. His brows raised and his green eyes twinkled as he asked playfully, and how did you do this gruesome schedule while you were dating the jerk? I wasn't doing it well at all. I worked mostly mornings and found someone to cover my shift most evenings. And weekends were a problem for me too. I lost tons of hours in the two years we were together. I'm not going to make that mistake again. 
especially since I will be going back to my life once Logan moves on with another woman or moves out of Brownsville and forgets about me. Whichever comes first. Chance laid back on the bed, looking at me from under those thick lashes of his. Who knows, Ruby? You might end up never going back. I've got a pretty sweet place here. Much bigger and better than that little apartment I just moved you out of. That you do, Chance. But I'm keeping my car, and I will be moving somewhere once this ruse is over. I let the apartment go, so I can't go back there. But I can get another place. Don't forget you sold all your furniture to the landlady too. So, you would have to buy a whole house of furniture and all the other stuff you let her have. I just want you to know that you've got a place to live for however long you want. Chance was the best friend anyone could ever have. That's why I love you so much. You're the most generous person I know. Ah shucks. He sat up and looked around the bedroom. You can use that card I gave you to do anything you want in here. Make this your space. I mean that. The suite was decorated beautifully already. I don't think I'll be making any additions or subtractions from this gorgeous bedroom suite. The decorator you hired to do this place has outdone herself. I love it just the way it is. Well, if you do find anything that will make this room, or this home for that matter, more like your own, don't hesitate to buy it and bring it on home, baby. Baby? I asked as I arched one brow. Well, we've got to make it look and sound real. Baby. So, what should I call you? Hot stuff. Handsome. Lover. He wiggled his eyebrows as he grinned at me. So, what are we going to say about our physical relationship? I don't think we should say anything about that. I went to the closet and opened the door to find another room inside. Holy cow! I looked back at him. You call this thing a closet? It's bigger than my apartment. Yeah, I know. And it has a washer-dryer combo in there, too. If you leave your dirty clothes in the built-in hamper beside it, the maid will wash them and put them away for you. She comes on Fridays and Wednesdays. The maid? I had no idea Chance had spoiled himself so much. Yes, the maid. You don't think I have time to clean and do laundry, do you? I mean this place is over 8,000 square feet. I had to hire someone. I think she brings a small crew with her. I'm not sure though. I'm always at work when she cleans the house. Looking around the closet I asked, what else do I need to know about living here? Only that I've hired people to do all the work around this place. He came up behind me, gesturing to the padded bench that ran along one wall. There's even seating in here. I think it's so you can sit there and look at all you have to wear before coming to a decision. I pointed at the front section of the empty closet. All the things I own will fit right there. So I will use this bench little, if at all. You have that card. Fix that situation. He sat on the bench, looking around. Shoes go into those cubbies over there. And the larger cubbies are for boots. He pointed at a line of hooks. Those are for hats, I think. That's what I use the ones in my closet for anyway. You might use them to hang purses. I know you're not into wearing hats. I headed out of the closet and grabbed an armful of clothes and went back in to hang them up. Sweetie, I said. How do you like that little term of endearment? Not much at all. Did you even hear the ones I suggested? He got up and went to grab the rest of my clothes. I want something manly, rugged. You know, I want it to sound like you think I'm super hot. Ah, that's why you brought up lover. I wasn't into saying things like that much at all. I had called Logan babe. But I didn't want to call Chance the same thing I'd called Logan. Yes. That is exactly why I brought up that one. He hung the clothes up, as they were still on the hangers they'd been on back in my closet at the apartment I'd left behind. I don't much care for lover. A word sprang into my mind. Oh, but I do like Corazon. He looked at me with a grin. Heart. Nodding, I knew I had my term of endearment for him. Am I Corazon? You like? I like. Laughing. 
he went back out to the bedroom, then over to the other door and opened it. Come see your private bath, baby. I don't think we have to use our little love words when no one else is around chance. I walked up to him, glancing into the bathroom. But then the grandeur of it took my full attention, and I walked inside. Oh my gosh. Floor-to-ceiling windows looked out at the blue ocean. It felt like the seashore came right into the bathroom. The walls were the color of the water that moved in waves outside. The tiles were the color of seashells. This shower is big enough to fit a whole party of people. I know. Cool, right? He walked over to the bathtub, pointing out the control panel. So this is a jacuzzi tub, and it's got loads of things that it can do. The best one, in my opinion, is the endless hot water. You can heat it up to any temperature you want, and it will stay there. It's gonna be hard to leave this bathroom chance. Scanning the large room, my eyes rested on the toilet that certainly looked as if it were made for a king. It's elevated. They call it a throne for a reason. At least, the developers of this home thought that anyway. I know it's over the top, but I call it home. I had to do something nice for Chance, since he was doing so much for me. Since it's my day off, I want to make you something great for dinner tonight. Do you still like barbecue ribs? He walked back to the bedroom and I followed as he said, I want to take you out tonight. We need to start making appearances in public. This has to look real. I honestly don't want that jerk even thinking about you, Ruby. What he did to you was really bad. I mean really, really bad. I can't promise you that I won't hurt him if I ever meet the jerk. That worried me, so I grabbed his arm turning him to face me. Chance. You have to promise me that you will never, ever do anything like that to him. I can't tell you much about what I saw when I was with him. But I can tell you that he's part of a group that's very dangerous. People go missing all the time. He and those he's associated with are part of the reason behind it. I can start carrying a gun. He put his hands on my shoulders, then pulled me closer and closer until he had me wrapped in his strong arms. His lips pressed against the top of my head, making my heart speed up. I can protect myself and you. Can you protect me from actually falling in love with you? I tried to push the thought aside, but it was stubborn. The thing about Chance was that I'd had a crush on him all throughout our school years. He was way out of my league even back then. Chance was a cute little boy, and he just kept growing taller and getting cuter as the years went on. Meanwhile, I had been a chunky little girl who was on the plain side, and I'd stayed that way. Chance had light blonde hair that had turned into a darker shade of blonde by the time he was in high school. With those blonde waves and green eyes he stole all the girls' hearts. He still did, as far as I knew. My dark hair and eyes made me blend it while his looks made him stand out. He was muscular, and I was still chunky. Basically, he was attractive, and I was not. He held me in his arms, not letting me go. Do you know why I made that pact with you about getting married? I really don't have a clue. I pulled my head off his shoulder and looked up at him. He was at least a foot taller than me. His eyes turned soft as he spoke quietly, almost in a whisper. You were sitting at the second desk in the second row of desks the first day I walked into our kindergarten classroom. I had butterflies swarming my stomach that day. I thought for sure that I was going to blow chunks right there in front of everyone. In the sea of faces that looked a lot like mine, nervous and shy, I found yours. Your smile was as bright as any beacon. Your eyes held mine, drawing me to come and sit right in front of you. To me, it had seemed that you had left that desk empty just so I could sit there. I didn't want to sit in the front row, that's why I left that desk empty and sat in the second one instead. I was afraid the teacher would call on me often if I was right up front. And when I saw you, you were tall already, even though you were just five. I knew your body would hide me. So I smiled and hoped you would come and sit in front of me. And when you did, I knew the teacher would always pick you to answer questions and leave me alone. He let me go, looking a little upset. Are you serious? Yeah. I hadn't meant to upset him, with the truth of why I'd been smiling at him that first day of kindergarten. 
My older sister had told me about the teacher asking kids in the front row most of the questions throughout the school year. And she told me to look for a kid that was bigger than me and to smile at them, and they would hopefully come to sit in front of me to hide me from the teacher's view. You only smiled at me because of my size? He turned away from me and walked toward the door. I didn't know what else to say. Chance. Don't be mad. I'm not mad. He stopped and looked at me over his shoulder. Disillusioned maybe, but not mad. He turned to face me. I thought you liked me. I thought that you had been the first girl to ever like me. And that's why I asked you to make that pact with me. I came to like you. I thought that meant something too. I really did. You know that I did. We sat next to each other every day at lunch that year. Don't you remember that? Because we lined up according to where we sat. That's why we sat next to each other, Ruby. It wasn't like either of us chose to do that. He looked at the floor, and I knew I had screwed up what he'd considered a good memory. I began to wonder about something and asked, Chance, you thought I smiled at you because I liked you from the moment I saw you. But did you like me from the moment you saw me? He turned and walked away. None of that matters anyway, Ruby. Welcome home. Let me know when you're ready to go out to eat. We have to make this look real. And then he left me standing there, my mouth slightly ajar and my mind filling with questions that he wasn't going to answer. Did he really like me from the first moment he saw me? Chapter 3 Chance Our first week together as a fake couple was better than just nice. I'd never spent that much one-on-one -on -one time with Ruby. So far I loved it. Her job had its perks, fresh fish being the main one. She came home about eight each night, usually with a fresh catch in the cooler she took to work with her. Mahi mahi, she called out as she came in through the back entrance. My mouth watered as I jumped up from where I'd been chillin' to get to the kitchen. Great. I brought home some sushi and pickled asparagus that we can have with it. She laid out the plastic bag with the chunks of fish in it. Do we have any rice? I've got some in the pantry. Putting on my apron, I turned the gas stove on and found my favorite iron skillet. I'm thinking blackened fish. What do you think about that, Ruby? Sounds yummy to me. She filled a pot with water. I'll get the rice going. We snacked on the sushi and asparagus and had some white wine while we cooked together. You know, before you came to live here, I usually ate out. I bet this kitchen hasn't been used more than a handful of times before you moved in. It's such a great kitchen. She looked around. How could you have not used it more often? A brilliant idea popped into my head. You know what we should do? What should we do? She topped off my glass of wine before adding more to hers. We should have people over for dinner. We could do it next week on your day off. I know you're off tomorrow, but that's way too soon to plan something that would be any good. Maybe we could save up the fish you bring home and make it all at once for our guests. Or, she said as she raised one finger, as if she'd had an idea of her own, we could go on our own deep sea fishing trip and catch a bunch on our own. We could do it tomorrow, since I'll be off. There's a boat that hasn't been chartered yet. I could take it. It'll be my treat to you, Chance. I'll pay for it. You don't have to do that. No. It's a perk I get. If there's a boat that no one has chartered, we can use it. The captains love it when we do that. They get a chance to check out other places to fish instead of taking the guests to their tried and true fishing grounds. She picked up her cell phone and tapped the screen. Done. I've booked Nancy's dream. We leave at 6.30 in the morning. That was quick. I tossed the seasoned fish into the pan that I'd already heated olive oil in. I'll just text my assistant that she has the day off tomorrow, since I won't be going in. What sort of fish should we fish for, she asked. You know, for our dinner party? Laughing, she picked up a piece of sushi with red caviar on top. My family likes everything. What about yours? They'll eat anything too. 
I thought about what would sound super cool, and one thought came to mind. Swordfish. Oh yeah. We can go for that. Those things can be anywhere from 100 to 400 pounds. Think we know enough people to feed that amount of food to. I guess we'll have to make our guest list once we catch our fish. I hadn't felt this excited in a long time. I'd been focusing too much on work lately, and not enough on my personal life. You know, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Thanks Ruby. Sure chance. I'm looking forward to it too. Taking the lid off the rice, she inhaled the citrusy aroma. I love cilantro lime rice. It's just so perfect. She'd always been into food. Ruby really took the time to taste the food she ate. She'd always been that way. Since you're such a food connoisseur, I'll let you take charge of the menu. She looked at me out of the corner of her eye. What do you mean by that? I mean that you like food way more than I do. I turn the fish over to sear the other side. So you should be the one who comes up with the food we're gonna serve our guests when we have our party. Taking a drink, not a sip but an actual drink, of the wine she walked away from me, heading to the fridge. When she came back, she had another bottle of wine. Her lips formed one thin line which told me that she was a little miffed about something. But I didn't say anything. After opening the new bottle of wine she said, I know I like food chance. I mean it shows and I know that about myself. Did I mess up somewhere? I'm sensing an attitude, Ruby. And I'm not sure why that is. I know you like food too. That's precisely why I think you should come up with the food we're going to serve. You know how to pair foods. You know what you like and don't like. And I know how to eat. And maybe I eat too much. And maybe I could stand to lose a few pounds or even more than that. I know. Believe me, I know that I eat too much. She downed the rest of the glass of wine before filling it from the new bottle. Let the fat girl make the menu. She knows food. She for sure knows food. Hold on, baby. Her eyes shot daggers at me. Don't call me that when no one else is around. I'd hurt her feelings without even meaning to. So I turned the fire off underneath the fish and went to her, taking her into my arms. Her body was rigid, but she didn't pull away from me. Ruby, I didn't mean to say anything to make you mad. And I do not think that you're fat in any way at all. I think you're perfect. I like the fact that you seem fine in your own skin. Well most of the time you do. I'm not sure why you felt offended by what I said. I like that you're not afraid to eat what you want to eat. So let me rephrase what I said. Ruby, I admire your skills where food is concerned, and I think you would come up with some badass food to serve at the first party we're throwing together. I kissed her cheek to make amends. I'm sorry if you took it any other way than how I meant it. You don't think I'm fat, she asked as she looked up at me with wide eyes. Really? You're not just saying that? I do not think you're fat. Not even a little. I actually like the way you fill out your clothes. I like those dangerous curves you've got going on. I wouldn't change a thing about you. I swear that to you. Is that because you don't look at me like a romantic prospect? You know, I'm getting the idea that the jerk you were going to marry made you feel inadequate about your beautiful body. Just one more reason to rip his head off if I ever see him. Her hands ran along my arms then she wrapped them around my neck. He offered to pay for me to get lap band surgery so my stomach would be small and I wouldn't eat as much. What a good for nothing. I meant that too. Nothing is wrong with you in any way. I had paid for her to get highlights in her hair and for her nails to get done, but that wasn't body altering. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to mold you into something. I just wanted you to get your hair done so you could look even cuter than you already are. I want you to feel special. I want you to feel pampered. And you have done that. She leaned her head against my chest and it felt so right holding each other like that. I want to make you feel special too Chance. That's why I've been bringing home the fish and cooking with you most nights this last week. I enjoy spending time with you. And I appreciate all you're doing for me. 
I'm sorry that I let something that jerk said affect how I am with you. I should have known better than to put words into your mouth. You've never made any negative comments about my body. I guess what Logan said ran deeper than I'd thought. Well, it was mean. I understand completely. It hit you in a vulnerable area. But you really shouldn't be worried at all about your weight. You're healthy and that's what matters. I ran my hands down, following the curve of her hips. I like you, Ruby. I admire you. Having a romance with you has never been off the table. Not for me at least. Although I'm not sure how you felt about that. Slipping her arms off me, she pulled out of my embrace. Chance, you always have been and always will be way out of my league. I'm not a fool. I know this. Knowing it is the main reason why I've never put up a guard with you. I know we're friends and that's all we'll ever be. I'm not saying that things couldn't get intense and we could end up in bed because we are only human. I am saying that we're two very different people. For one, you're a genius billionaire who happens to be one of the best-looking men I've ever laid eyes on. And I am, well, I'm an average woman with a job that doesn't require me to have limitless brain capacity. As far as looks go, mine are simple. What I'm saying is that we would never work out as a real couple. Really? So you think that those big brown eyes of yours are simple? I had to laugh. Have you ever really looked at yourself in the mirror? Almond-shaped eyes, thick dark lashes that make a natural eyeliner effect around them, and perfect eyebrows. You've always had them. Like you were born with such symmetry in your face. Women work hard to mimic what comes naturally to you, Ruby. Not only does your beauty not wash off when the makeup comes off, but it goes all the way to your bones. What I'm saying is that you're beautiful, inside and out. And I am not out of your league. But you might be out of mine. Chapter 4 Ruby Chance, this is Captain Jack and his crew, Little Joe and One Toe Pete. No one on Jack's crew wore shoes, so I pointed to Pete's right foot. For obvious reasons. Guys, this is my fiancé, Chance Duran. It felt very odd saying that out loud for the first time. Nice to meet you guys, Chance said. Jack looked at my hand. No ring? You mean to tell me that you said yes to a man who gave you no ring? I wasn't sure what to say to that. Chance and I hadn't even thought about a ring. But Chance was quick to say, the ring is being fitted for her. It was my great-grandmother's, and it was too big for her. I could have bought her something off the shelf, but a woman like my Ruby deserves something with roots as deep as the ones we share. Good save, I whispered in his ear. He turned sharply, catching my lips with his for only a moment but the effect left me nearly breathless and my knees went weak. Only the best for my one true love. Young love is magical, Captain Jack said before going to the wheelhouse to get the fishing trip started. The crew got to work, leaving Chance and I alone at the bow of the boat. So, can I expect you to be that romantic all day? You bet. He draped his arm around my shoulders then kissed my cheek. We have to put on a good show, don't we? Smiling, I thought it might be fun to put on a show with him. Caressing his bearded cheek, I kissed his lips softly. Let the show begin then. An hour later, we were so far out in the Gulf of Mexico that no land was in sight as the sun began to rise. Pink and blue hues formed on the horizon, and Chance held my hand tightly as we sat there, watching the sun come up on a new day. The poles had been baited with squid, and the lines had been set out before sunrise so as to take advantage of the nighttime feeding habits of swordfish. What are the chances of us actually catching a swordfish? Chance asked. The tinkling of a bell, penetrated the cool morning air. Fish on! Captain Jack yelled. To the fightin' chair groomed to be. The captain had already adjusted the chair to fit Chance perfectly. I'm sort of freaking out, Chance admitted. I've never caught anything this big before. I've never been in the fighting chair before. I was so excited for Chance. Well let's strap you in. This can last up to eight hours in some cases. One Topete said, mostly it takes between an hour and four hours. 
just stay focused and you can bring this one in. Just as they got Chance all situated, something blew out of the water's surface. Holy shit! Chance shouted. Is that my fish? A 200-pounder, little Joe shouted. She's a good one. Wow, Chance whispered in shock. He looked at me. Can I do this, baby? You've got this, am I Corazon? I kissed his cheek. Good luck. I'm right behind you. Putting my hands on his shoulders, I lightly massaged them as he fought the big fish. And when the sweat began to drip down his forehead, threatening to fall into his eyes, I used a rag to wipe it off before misting him with cool water to help cool him down. The crew remained focused on Chance and the fish he was reeling in like the expert he was not. Captain Jack said, I thought you'd never fished for game fish before. I haven't. Chance gritted his teeth and set his jaw as he reeled up the slack in the line. This is exhilarating, though. I'm gonna do this a lot more often. My heart swelled, knowing that I'd given him this opportunity to fall in love with the sport I loved as well. My father used to take me sport fishing once a year. My first big catch was a marlin that my father had to help me reel in. And I was hooked from then on. Logan liked to fish as well. But he wouldn't let me do it. He said it wasn't a thing a female was supposed to be doing. I was to watch him and be proud for him. That man was such a jerk in so many ways. Why did it take me so long to see him for what he truly was? The swordfish leapt into the air, only a few feet away from the boat. Holy cow! Chance yelled. She's huge. One toe Pete grabbed the hook. We're about to bring her in. Get ready on deck. With the fish so close to being caught, the captain took the straps off Chance. Get up. Bring her in. The fish ejected out of the water, flying high into the air as it fought to gain its freedom. My gosh that is some sight. Chance shouted. This is insanity. I can't believe I'm doing this. You haven't done nothing yet, groom to be, Captain Jack shouted. You've got to get her on deck before you can say you caught one of God's leviathans. Chance had this. I knew he did. I climbed up on top of the wheelhouse to use my camera to film him bringing in his first gamefish. Bring her home to mama, baby. He looked over his shoulder at me for just a split second, and the fish jumped, erupting out of the turbulent water at the back of the boat. The smile on Chance's face was beyond priceless. I'm bringing her to you, mama. Fifteen minutes later, the fish was on board, and everyone was taking pictures with the beautiful beast that Chance had bested. He and I hugged as the captain took a picture. Now give me a kiss, he coached us. Chance looked at me with something in his eyes I had never seen before. Thank you, Ruby. I love you, baby. His words sounded so true to me that I sucked in my breath. And then his mouth crashed down on mine as he leaned me backward and kissed me hard. The picture ended up looking like something out of a movie. As we headed back to the docks, Chance and I sat together, looking at the pictures everyone had taken. The one of us kissing was the best of them all. This one gets blown up and hung in the house, he said. It's my favorite. I like the one I got of the smile you had on your face when that thing came out of the water so close to you. We'll blow that one up too. We had a good haul of pictures to show everyone at our party. It would help them to see us as a real couple. I knew it was going to be a long shot for the people closest to us, since we hadn't been seeing each other at all as far as anyone knew. And now we were saying that we were getting married. Cuddled up together, Chance pulled out his phone and took a selfie of us. We need to get a story straight. I agree, I said, looking around to make sure no one would overhear us. And when we get back home, we'll line that out. Why wait? An impish grin made me want to kiss him. You and I have been seeing each other since a week after you left that jerk at the altar. We've kept it quiet up until now because we finally feel that enough time has passed since you broke things off with the jerk. Pretty good, I had to admit. It could work. If that had really occurred, my mother would have been all over my ass, telling me it was way too soon to be jumping into another relationship. She would have said it was a rebound 
and would never work out. But what we'll show them is that we did work out. And now people can be happy for us, instead of saying negative things about our relationship. I like it. I had to hand it to Chance, he really did know how to iron things out. I'm glad you're so smart. Ah thanks babe. He kissed the top of my head. I'm glad you're so cuddly. He squeezed me playfully. If I had known you were this cuddly, I don't think I would have given you your own bedroom. I hadn't even thought about that. Chance, you want to invite people to the house for the dinner, right? That was the idea. His lips grazed my cheek, sending lightning bolts through me. Chance, we can't let anyone come over or they'll find out about me having my own room. I knew we hadn't thought everything through yet. We'll just have to do it somewhere else. We'll do it at home. No one is going to go snooping through our bedrooms. You don't know my mother. She's a super snooper. The party was going to be more work than either of us had time for. We'll have to move my things into your room just for the party. And then we'll have to move them back after everyone leaves. That's a lot of work. And what about your maid? It had just occurred to me at that moment that she and whoever worked with her knew that I was staying in a separate room from Chance. Gosh Chance, I hadn't even thought about her. What a day, huh guys? Little Joe said as he came up front to join us. You two lovebirds got yourself a big fish. What are you gonna do with it? Eat it, Chance said as he laughed. And you and the rest of the crew are invited too. We'll be having a shindig next week. Will there be plenty of free beer at this shindig? One toe Pete popped out of nowhere. Did someone say beer? Yeah, little Joe said. These two are throwing a party next week, and we're invited. He looked at Chance. So free beer or what? With them looking right at us, I began to feel a little weird about being all knotted up with Chance, so I sat up disentangling myself from him. Of course there's going to be free beer, I said. And lots of food. You guys can bring dates if you want. It's not often you guys have something super amazing you can gussy up for and bring dates to. Gussy up? The captain asked as he joined us after parking the boat at the dock. For what? The other two ran to tie the boat up, as Chance told the captain about the big party. For our engagement announcement party. Ruby and I haven't told a soul about our engagement. We wanted to keep it to ourselves for a while. You guys are the first to know about it. And we'd like you all to come to our party. Bring a date. It's gonna be a blast. How dressed up do I gotta get? The captain asked as he eyed me. You know I don't like to get dressed up if the occasion doesn't call for it. We live in a mansion on the beach. I winked. So dress up. A mansion? He looked at Chance. Well, I'll be damned if this little lass hasn't found herself another rich man. Chance's body went stiff, and I put my arm around him to chill him out. Ha ha Jack. He's just messing with me, Chance. Yeah well it's not funny, Chance said as he eyed the captain. Jack wasn't one to shy away from a fight. But he knew better than to try to spar with Chance. I apologize for the remark, Chance. Just a little joke. You're right. It's not funny. My bad. Apology accepted. Chance took my hand, leading me to get off the boat. We'll let you know the date and time of the party. You showed us a great time, and we'd like to show you guys one too. He slipped something into my hand, and I closed my fist around what felt like a wad of cash. This is their tip. Distribute it as you see fit, baby. I'll meet you at the truck. We've got to get this fish into our cooler and get some ice on it. Okay. I'll be right there. I opened my hand and heard a gasp come from behind me as Chance walked away. Captain Jack's eyes were huge as he looked at what I held. How many hundred dollar bills are there, Ruby? Twenty. I handed ten of them to him. I'll split the other ten between the boys. He took the cash. You do that. My woman is gonna be happy with me tonight, that is for sure. I bet she will be. The tip was too much and I knew that, but it felt good to be making a few of the people I worked with happy. 
See you in the morning. Thanks Captain Jack for showing us a good time. You know I was joking about you finding another rich guy, right? I do. And I was kind of glad that Chance had wasted no time in letting him know it was unwelcome. He was right to defend you, you know. Nodding, I agreed. Yeah. He's a good one. Seems so. Don't let anything or anyone get in your way, Ruby. Keep each other happy. Get married. Have babies. You deserve a man like him. The other was a huge jerk. A smile formed on my lips. Funny, you never said that about Logan before. Yeah, I know. But I always thought it. You always deserved better than that good for nothing. He shoved the money into his pocket. Tell your groom to be that I appreciate the hefty tip. He's welcome on my vessel any time he wants. Will do, Captain. I left the boat, walking down the long pier to get back to the shore. I saw Leslie working the stand, a line of customers keeping her busy. But not too busy for her to shout, What are you doing here, Ruby? It's your day off. Suddenly an arm wrapped around my waist then lips pressed against my cheek before Chance said, She took me out for the best time of my life is what she's doing here. She looked at Chance, then back at me. Yours? Nodding, I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. He is mine. Before I knew it, Chance had scooped me up into his arms and carried me away to his truck as the people cheered for us. I buried my face in his chest, feeling the heat of embarrassment but also the heat of something far better than that. I'm yours, huh? He whispered with a husky tone to his deep voice. We have to make it look good. I said with a grin. And you do make it look good. I have to give you that. He put me back on my feet, and I found my back against the passenger door of his truck. Do I now? He licked his lips as he stared at mine. Things inside of me began to heat up to the melting point. Chance, what are you about to do? Make it look good. His mouth descended on mine, and the kiss took me so far away that I didn't know where I was anymore. I felt his hand sliding down my arms and then he pulled one up, and his mouth left mine, leaving me unable to breathe. My future wife. Everyone on the docks cheered for us, like we were some sort of celebrities or royalty. I'd never been so embarrassed and turned on at the same time. Chance. He opened the door for me, then lifted me up to put me inside his tall truck. Buckle up, baby. This ride might get a little dangerous. Holy cow! I bit my lower lip as he closed the door. Blinking a few times, I couldn't believe the expressions I saw as the people around us continued looking our way. So many smiles. Everyone seemed so happy. Happy for me. Happy for chance. Just happy to be a part of something that seemed to be all about love. But it was all fake. Nothing either of us had said was real in the least and I had to remind myself of that. Chance was putting on a show. A show I'd asked him to put on. And I couldn't let the act get so big that I would forget that it was only an act. Chance got into the driver's seat then started up the loud engine. I took a deep breath to bring myself back to reality. The crew said to thank you for the generous tip. They deserved it. He pulled out of the parking lot gunning the engine as we drove away. I had the best day ever. Yeah. Catching that fish was something all right. That was nice. He licked his lips as he looked at me, while waiting at the stop sign for traffic to move. But that wasn't the highlight. Come on, I said, it was too. Who wouldn't love catching a fish like the one you did? I liked that part of the day. But there was a part one enjoyed even more than that. Cocking my head, I looked at him in question. I didn't want him to keep up the act when no one was around to witness it. It would just be too hard when this was over. So I turned my head and looked out of the window. I'm just glad you had a good time. I said. I'm glad we can make some fun memories out of this thing. You know, before Logan finds someone and moves on. After that, we can stop pretending. Chapter 5 Chance 
Maybe I was the shittiest actor in history, because I'd started out pretending that I was in love with Ruby and ended up having real feelings for her. Either that, or all that touching and kissing we'd done on the boat had riled up my body. Whatever it was, it wasn't fake at all. It was real, very real. But Ruby wasn't letting the acting get to her. She could so easily turn it on and off like a light switch. And I wasn't sure I liked that. I had a difficult time figuring out what to say to her, to make her see that I had developed real feelings for her. It was difficult because she didn't seem to be feeling the same way I was. And that left me feeling somewhat insecure. Everything I had thought about Ruby being the first girl who liked me, was a lie. I've been living a lie all these years, thinking she and I had this sort of love at first sight thing. So, it wasn't easy on my ego to adjust to that fact so quickly. Only it was more than a bruised ego that I was suffering from. There was a lot of self-doubt too. I couldn't beat myself up over what my five-year-old brain had done to me. My inflated ego wasn't something I was proud of. I hadn't ever admitted this to myself before, so it was taking some time to sink in. I am not Ruby's first true love. Ruby and I had never dated, so I had no idea why I'd let the idea that she was in love with me keep floating around in my mind. She obviously was not in love with me, and I wasn't even sure she was all that physically attracted to me either. My silence as we drove home must have bothered her, because I felt her hand on my arm and looked to find her smiling at me. You know I really appreciate everything you're doing for me, right? I do know that, my words came out terse. So I took a deep breath to try to let some of my frustration go. I guess it's just that we had such an amazing day, and I don't want it to stop. It doesn't have to stop. I mean, we're going home together. We can still have fun. Maybe we can play a board game like we used to do when we were kids. If you stop by the store, I'll go inside and grab Clue. That was always our game of choice, right? I didn't want to play board games with her. I wanted something much more than that. But she obviously didn't want to do more than that with me. I'll stop at the next store so we can pick one up. I haven't stocked up on board games, so you won't find one at the house. It'll be fun. She looked excited, and her joy over something so simple made my heart wiggle a bit inside my chest. I'm sure it will. After dropping the fish off to be professionally butchered, and then stopping to pick up the board game, we went home. I went straight to the shower, and she did too. The day had left its stench on me, and I couldn't get it off fast enough. Clean and with a fresh change of clothes on, I walked to the kitchen in bare feet, finding Ruby preparing something that smelled delicious. What is that heavenly aroma? Seafood chowder. She took a tablespoon and scooped some up, blowing on it. Here, have a little taste. Moving in close to her, I smelled the crisp, clean scent of coconut lime shampoo on her freshly washed hair. Sipping the soup from the spoon I moaned, so good. I wanted to whip something up for us that wouldn't take long but would taste good and fill us up. We've had a pretty tough day. Especially you with all that reeling in you did. Staying in place so close to her that I could easily lean in and kiss her sweet plump lips, I had to close my eyes so I wouldn't see her freshly scrubbed face. She had such a healthy glow about her, and it drew me in. I need a beer. How about you? Sure. It took everything in me to walk away from her. But I did it, and grabbed a couple of cold beers out of the fridge. Popping the caps of both bottles, I handed one to her and noticed that she'd set up the board game on the island bar. I think we were in sixth grade the last time we played Clue. I think so too. She turned the fire down under the pot of chowder to let it simmer. I've got garlic cheddar drop biscuits cooking in the oven. When the timer goes off, dinner will be ready. I don't know how you managed to shower, change clothes, and put this all together in the same space of time it took me to shower and put some clothes on, but I'm glad you did. It smells wonderful, and I am starving. That fish really took it out of me. My shoulders ached a little. I think I'll have to get a massage tomorrow. She looked at me for a few seconds before saying, I would give you a massage tonight, but... I finished her thought, but that might lead to more. Her eyes clouded over. 
You know Chance, I think Logan broke something inside of me. I wasn't the most secure person in the first place. I've never thought I was attractive. I've always thought I was on the heavy side. And being sure of myself hasn't been my strong suit. I wish you could see what I see when I look at you. Her lips pulled up on one side. Chance, you've always been so nice to me. Tell me what makes you think that jerk broke something inside of you. I wanted to be able to understand what was going on in her head. So far, nothing made sense to me. Shaking her head, she said, I'm not sure when it began. Probably from the very first time we went out, I guess. But he was so slick, I never really noticed what he was doing to me. He wouldn't say things in a mean way. But he would say mean things. They're just words, Ruby. You don't need to take anything he said to heart. Just blow off everything he's ever said to you. It's not that easy. I know it sounds easy, but it's just not. It's like he put these little burrs underneath my skin, and they can't come out. They sort of burrowed down deeper and deeper, until they became a part of me. She ran her hands up and down both arms. I know it sounds nuts. Tell me some of the things he said to you. It sounds stupid, but this one time, he came to pick me up at my apartment. He said where we were going was a surprise, but that I should dress in something cool and comfortable. I put on a sundress and wore some sandals with it. My hair was in a braid, and I had on very little makeup. I thought we'd be doing something that was outdoors. Did this guy ever let you know where the hell he was taking you when you went out on dates? Not really. He liked to surprise me. I think that's weird. I didn't like this guy at all, and the things she was telling me only made me dislike him more and more. Go on, finish your story. Okay. Well, the first thing he did when I walked out to his car was pull his sunglasses down so his eyes could scan my body. He didn't even say hello. He just went right to telling me that my dress was too short, and to go change and throw that dress in the garbage. I hope you told him to back off. She shook her head. No. I turned around, went inside, and changed my clothes to shorts and a t-shirt. But I didn't throw the dress away. I guess that's something. So, I went back out and found him leaning against the hood of his car, talking on the phone. He took one look at me and shook his head, turned his finger in a circle, and pointed at the door to my apartment. I wasn't sure what he wanted me to wear, so I asked him what I should put on. He asked me if I knew how to dress appropriately, to go to a bar on the beach. I am sorry. That guy is a complete jerk. I can see that now but for some reason, I couldn't see it back then. It went like that for two years. He made me feel inadequate all the time. He made me feel like I'd been wearing the wrong clothes my whole life. He made me feel like I had no clue what was appropriate. When he took me to meet his mother, the one and only time I was ever allowed to meet her, he told me not to talk much so I wouldn't make her dislike me. I'm sorry he did those things to you. But what I can't understand is why you kept seeing him. You two didn't live together, right? No, he said we shouldn't live together until after we were married. She took a drink of beer then sighed. And I know I could have broken it off with him at any time. But I just didn't do it until I was standing there, looking at one half of the church filled with guys just like him. More than just jerks. They were really bad people. I guess there was a huge part of me that was afraid of what he might do to me if I stopped seeing him. You walked away from him, leaving him in a church full of people, and he didn't hurt you at all. What I'm telling you is that you're stronger than you're giving yourself credit for. And you can shove out the shit that he put into your brain. You're smart. You're funny. You're beautiful. You are a great person, and any man would be lucky to have you. So let those words replace all the negative ones he said to you. You don't know how much I wish I could do just that, Chance. I really, really do. That's what I'm saying when I say that I feel like he's broken something inside of me. Like whatever it is, it's broken in two. Like it can't be fixed. She took another drink, then put the bottle on the bar. Chance, I want to feel things but I just can't. My heart broke for her, and I couldn't help myself as I moved to her taking her into my arms, hugging her tightly as I rocked with her. 
Oh baby. I kissed the top of her head. I really had no idea you were feeling this way. This girl needed help and patience. What she didn't need was me wanting anything from her. Because she had nothing to give at the moment. Her arms moved around me, hugging me back. I'm glad you asked me to tell you about him. I haven't talked to anyone about the things he did to me. I felt embarrassed that I allowed him to say those things to me, and then stuck around for more. I wasn't sure why she had stayed with the jackass. But I knew that she wasn't the only person to have done something like that. You're safe now. You're safe with me. No matter what, I'll always be here for you. You're not going to hear me say anything like the garbage he fed you. Because you are none of the things that he made you think you were. You're like a light on a dark night, familiar and bright. And I'm not the only person who sees you that way. Your smile is as contagious as your laughter. She laughed but it was a little sad. You're making me sound sort of great. Because you are great. The timer on the oven went off, startling us. We both looked in that direction and began laughing. Biscuits are done. Wiping her eyes she went to get them out of the oven while I got a couple of bowls out of the cabinet and filled them with the chowder she'd made. I had to wrap my head around the fact that Ruby needed my friendship right now. She didn't need me as her lover. She needed me to put my attraction for her to the side and help her find herself again. We played Clue while eating our dinner and drinking beer. It was like old times but this time there was beer. And much more laughter than I remembered. Is it Colonel Mustard with a candlestick? You're forgetting about where it happened, she said, then erupted into a fit of laughter. Can you picture Colonel Mustard holding a little candlestick above his head, ready to bring it down on Mrs. Peacock's head? I could picture it and broke down laughing too. That would only be enough to piss her off. Right? She nearly fell off her chair as she got up. You're making me laugh so hard that I'm about to wet myself. Me. You're the one with all the jokes. I tried to catch my breath as she left the room. Ruby and I had always had so much fun. There was never a dull moment when she was around, she made sure of that. I just couldn't understand what kind of person could see that light in her that shone so brightly and try to snuff it out. Only a person who was pure evil would want to do a horrible thing like that. Only someone who had the ugliest of souls would do something to destroy the brightness that had always been inside Ruby. I truly hated the man who'd done that to her. I had never been a violent person, but with that man, I was sure I could destroy him without feeling any remorse whatsoever. Maybe someone should. Chapter 6 Ruby With our game of Clue finished, we worked together to clean up the kitchen, then headed to bed. Chance walked in front of me, and I watched as he ran his hand over his right shoulder. It's getting stiff, isn't it? I knew reeling in a fish that size had to have been hell on his shoulders. It took him almost four hours, after all. I've got some stuff in my room that I can rub on your shoulders to make them feel better. I'll go grab it while you get into your bed, then I'll come rub it on for you. He turned around and looked at me. You sure? Yes, I am sure. I pushed him to get moving. Go on, get your shirt off and hop into bed. I'll be right there. Would it be a torturous thing to do to myself? Of course. But Chance had done so much for me that I couldn't just let him lie in bed in pain and not do anything about it. Not when I had plenty of different things to rub on sore muscles, just sitting in my medicine cabinet. Standing on my feet for hours at a time at work made it so that I always had something to rub on my legs each night before going to bed. Grabbing a tube of ointment that didn't smell too much like old people, I went back to Chance's room. He was already laying in bed, the blanket covering up the bottom half of his body, leaving his extremely muscular back uncovered. I stood at the side of his bed, wondering how I was going to be able to do this without getting too intimate with him. Um. Ah. Uh, just straddle my back, Ruby. He turned his head facing me, and I saw a huge grin on his handsome face. You know this is purely platonic, right? 
I wanted to be sure he knew this wasn't some ploy of mine to get him to sleep with me. Purely platonic. And much appreciated, too. My shoulders and back are killing me. I promise that I won't get turned on by what you do to me. Or at least I'll try my best not to. I'm thinking about my grandma and how one time I walked in on her rubbing my grandpa's back and he was moaning and it was just super gross. Sounds gross. I got on the bed then straddled him. You've got more muscles than the average man chance. Squirting some of the stuff that smelled of eucalyptus into my palms, I rubbed them together to warm the stuff up, then ran my hands over his shoulder and down his back. And they're hard as rocks too. Thank you, he mumbled. That feels good. My right side is worse than my left. Can you make sure to give that some extra attention? I'll do just that. I tried not to look at the way his muscles rippled as I massaged the bomb into them. This stuff works wonders on my aching legs after a long day of standing up at work. I think it'll work on you as well. It already is. You like my tanned body, Ruby? He chuckled. I'm just making conversation. But you do have a nice tan. It goes well with the sun streaks in your dark blonde hair. That's all I'm saying. Um him? Thanks. Gosh. He's killing me. We screwed up that game of Clue, didn't we? I wanted to think about something that wouldn't turn me on. I didn't know I could forget the rules of the game, but I forgot a lot of them. Me too. I've played mostly drinking games since high school. No room for the rules of kids' games left in my brain. I never asked you about your college days. I went right to work at the charter service after graduating from high school. You went to, where was it again? I went to Austin, to the University of Texas. And it was fun. Really fun. I bet it was. I wasn't the only member of our graduating class who hadn't gone to college. But I had to admit that watching my friends take off, leaving town to gain more education, had made me envious at times. We had fun here too. Probably not as much fun as all of you who went off to college, but we had our fair share of fun. Your job is pretty kick-ass. He moaned again as I rubbed his right shoulder hard. Yeah, right there. That is the spot. I like my job. It's fun. You know, most of the time. I get to meet all kinds of people from all over the world, too. We chit-chat while they're waiting for the boat. It's cool, I guess. It's kick-ass is what it is. I love the water. All kinds of water. Getting to work anywhere near it is a gift. It makes it feel like you're not even really working at all. You're just there having some fun, and making money is a perk. Yeah. I had never thought about it that way. I guess my job is cool, right? Yeah. He moved a little. Do you think you can sit at the base of my back to put pressure on it? It's sort of sore too. I'd been hovering over his body, wanting minimal contact with it as I rubbed his back and shoulders. But I wasn't going to deny him what he needed to feel better. Sure. I sat on the small of his back. Right here. He groaned, making his body vibrate. Right there. This is such a bad idea. So, did you have a special girl when you were in college? I don't know why I asked that question. It wasn't like I wanted to know about Chance and other girls. The idea sort of made me jealous. I played the field. I knew I wasn't staying in Austin. My brothers had already begun talking about building our own company before I even went off to college. So I kept things light. You know, I didn't want to break any hearts. I bet you broke some anyway. He was one of the good ones. Any girl who got a taste of him probably didn't want to stop. Nah. Not me. And no one took hold of my heart either. I kept it under lock and key back then. I had my career to look forward to. Love wasn't in the mix of things back then. And I suppose now that you've got the company and things are moving along, you could start thinking about finding the right woman and settling down. And I was there in his way of doing that. You know, I'm not really ready to settle down. 
I'm not going to just grab any girl who comes along. We have to connect on a deep level if we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. And what about having kids, raising them together? That would take some real commitment and the ability to compromise too. Kids ain't easy. I can see that from my nieces and nephews. They're cute as hell though. And being their uncle is a blast. But the times they get sick, the times they get cranky, the times they want attention like nonstop, yeah, that's some hard shit right there. I've got nieces and nephews too, and I do know what you mean. They can be adorable one second, and little demons the next. You're right, it would take a lot of teamwork to raise some little hellions. You wouldn't want to pick just anyone to do that with. I think people who get married need to have more than just love between them. You know what I'm saying? I think so. They should be able to get along well too. And lift each other up whenever the other person needs it. You know, regardless of what one is going through, the other can help them rise up and get back on the old horse. He moaned again, as I used my elbow to really get into his back muscles. Damn you're good. I just want to take all the kinks out. You've got to work tomorrow, and I don't want you all stiff and achy. Leaning over him as I used both elbows to work his muscles, I inhaled his scent. Even with the smell of the ointment, I found hints of the soap he'd used to shower with. Vibrant aromas that sort of leapt up to greet my nose, and forced me to take a deep breath as if trying to draw some of his essence into my lungs. I've been thinking about this since the captain pointed out that I haven't gotten you a ring yet. I'm going to go in late tomorrow. I need to find you an antique engagement ring. I'll go see my mom and ask if she'll give me my great-grandmother's ring set. I can't take your great-grandmother's ring, I said as I shook my head. I mean, I know I'll give it back to you but wearing it wouldn't be right. That should be kept for the girl you will really marry. Something like that shouldn't be used for this act we're putting on. I can find something fake that looks antique. I don't want you to even think about it. Well, I have thought about it and I want you to wear my great-grandmother's ring. So you don't worry about it and let me do this. It's my job as the groom. Plus, I don't want to have to lie to Captain Jack about it. Since I was going to give it back to him anyway, I didn't feel the need to argue about it. If it's something that you really want, then okay. But you don't have to do it. I know that. I want to do it. He moved a little. I think that's plenty of back rubbing. Hop off and lay beside me. We can watch some television together. Let me go wash my hands. Knowing me, I would wipe my eyes and have them red and burning if I didn't get the stuff off immediately. Okay. I'll find something to watch while you're doing that. He flipped over and grabbed the remote off his nightstand. I wonder if I can find old episodes of Ren and Stimpy. We used to love that goofy cartoon when we were kids. That would be crazy chance. I haven't watched that show in forever. I went into his bathroom to wash my hands and found his scent filling the room. I took in several deep breaths, loving the way the cool air felt in my lungs. When I came back out, I saw that he had found the show and was already laughing. Yep, just as funny as I remembered. He slapped the bed beside him. Climb in. I dressed in pajama bottoms and a t-shirt after my shower, so I was ready for bed and climbed in next to him. He'd fluffed up a couple of pillows right next to him. Lying back in the comfy bed, I couldn't help the way I felt. Being with Chance was easy. He didn't care that my hair was hanging in limp strands, as I'd let it dry naturally and hadn't even run a brush through it. He ran his arm behind me, pulling me to snuggle with him. Come here, girl. Thanks for the back rub. He kissed my forehead. It's been a long day for us both. I think we should just chill out here and watch some television while we fall asleep. Looking up at him, I wondered if this was a good idea. Chance, we're not little kids at a sleepover. We're adults. And things might get complicated if I stay the night in your bed. I'm not going to let them. You need a friend. And I am your friend. Plus, I feel like you need a hug. Maybe one that lasts all night long. He gave me a little squeeze. 
Let me be here for you. I know your first impulse is to push me away. But that's not the real you. And feel free to hug me back. I promise you that I won't think it's anything more than just friendship. So you understand me. I had never in a million years expected him to even come close to understanding me. Somewhat, he admitted. Things are complicated with you right now. I'm not going to lie and say that I know exactly what you've gone through and are going through right now. But I know that you need a friend. And I am your friend. Above all else, I am your friend Ruby. I didn't know how I had gotten so lucky to have Chance Duran in my life. But I was thankful for him. And I am your friend Chance. Thank you for being so understanding of your messed up friend. You're not messed up. I prefer to think that you've been traumatized by the last couple of years. But you can come out of that. With lots of support and the knowledge that you're loved, you can come out of it. I'd always loved Chance. Maybe it had never been romantic love, but I had always loved him. I love you too, Chance. He kissed the top of my head, then we snuggled down. I don't recall the animation of this cartoon being so, well, terrible. It is bad, isn't it? I laughed. We didn't have much else to compare it to back then. They've gotten much better at it, that's for sure. But still, it's funny. He chuckled, and I liked the way his chest moved when he did it. Laying my hand on his chiseled abs, I knew I was one lucky woman. Any woman would have died to trade places with me at that moment. Sleeping while in Chance Duran's bed wouldn't even be a consideration to anyone but me. And none of them would have the same thing on their mind that I had on mine. I sure could use some cookies and milk right now. Wonder if Chance wants some too. Chapter 7 Chance Waking up in my bed with the smell of ruby in my nose, but no woman in my arms, turned my smile into a frown. Damn. Of course she had to be at work early, and that's why she wasn't there snuggling with me. But I missed her already. Throwing my legs over the side of the bed, I felt the pain from the events of the day before. A smile curved my lips as the memory of catching that monster of a fish flooded my brain. There wasn't time to be lying around, reveling in my memories though. I had to talk to my mother about my great-grandmother's rings. She told me that I could have them when I found the woman I was going to marry. But I wasn't sure she would let me have them when I hadn't even told her I'd been seeing anyone. Calling my mom, I wanted to butter her up a bit before asking for something so important to her. Morning my baby boy. Morning mom. I was thinking about you, and thought I would see if you wanted me to take you to a fancy brunch today. I haven't eaten anything yet. Your father went to play golf early this morning. So it's a great time for us to do brunch then. I felt the stars aligning for me. Pick you up at nine. I'll be ready. An hour later, I picked up my mother, and we set off for the champagne brunch buffet at the best hotel restaurant in town. No one does brunch like this hotel, I told my mother. How'd you come to find it, if you don't mind my asking? She looked at the glass structure that we were about to go into. This is really lovely. We actually had a meeting here with our cousins from Austin in Carthage a few months ago. I held the door open for her. She stepped inside, taking off her sunglasses. Very nice. I thought you might have some steamy story of bringing a young woman here for a night of naughty debauchery. I stifled a laugh. Mom dang it. Well you're young. Things like that can happen when you're young. I led the way to the dining area. It's this way. I do love this place. I'll have to bring your father one day. Paying the cashier for two buffets, I pointed out a table near the glass wall. We can take that table over there so we can see the ocean while we eat. Chance, you sure know how to show a woman a good time, don't you? She walked toward the table. I blushed as the cashier asked, are you two like together? She's my mother. But she's acting a little odd today. Laughing, the lady shook her head. Enjoy. Thanks. 
Mom was already browsing through the different areas, plate in hand, putting a little of this and a little of that on her plate. I came up beside her and put a crepe on my plate. These are good, Mom. You should try one. Fruit first, I think. There's so much to choose from that I'm having a hard time figuring out what I want to eat first. We've got lots of time. No reason to rush. I, on the other hand, knew what I wanted and went for it. Filling my plate with scrambled eggs and three of the little sausages, I was set. The waitress had filled our glasses with coffee and orange juice by the time we got back to the table. As we sat there, me eating and mom nibbling, I thought I might start in on my fake love story. So, I've been seeing someone and haven't told anyone about it. You have? Her brows rose high on her forehead. Anyone I know? You remember Ruby Salazar, right? We were in school together from kindergarten on up. Ruby. She looked a little stunned. We saw her down at the docks last year. She works there with some fishing service thingy. How long have you two been seeing each other? I'm a little less than six months. I took a bite and tried not to say too much. Mom's head cocked to one side as she seemed to be thinking. Chance, I do recall her telling me that she was engaged. Not to you, I would guess. No. Like I said, we've been together for about six months. She broke off that engagement about a week or so before we ran into each other. I knew I had better keep track of my story to tell Ruby later. We'd both have to be telling the same thing when he had the engagement party, which was a week away. Leaning forward she whispered, Oh, what happened to her engagement? She didn't love the guy. He was a real jerk. Anyway, we've been pretty much inseparable ever since we ran into each other. And I've even moved her into my house. Surprise filled her face. You have? Yeah. Last week. And now, we're ready to take it to the next level. I gulped down my orange juice, feeling extremely nervous about how she was going to react to that bit of news. The next level, she asked with confusion. Son, you're going to have to spell it out for me. Unfortunately, I don't always understand your hip way of communicating. We're going to get married. I sat there perfectly still. Waiting for what, I did not know. She was silent, her eyes glued to the ceiling, and then she looked at me. Am I the first to know about this? Other than Captain Jack, Little Joe, and One Toe Pete, she was the first one in the family to know. Yes you are. I had to tell you first. Ruby hasn't even told her family yet. Clasping her hands, I knew I'd made her day, maybe even her year. Well this is wonderful news, isn't it? My last child. My baby boy is getting married. And to none other than one of his childhood friends. It's adorable, is what this is. I'll reserve the country club so we can announce the news. I hadn't thought about her wanting to do that. Um, we sort of already made some plans for doing that. We went deep sea fishing yesterday and caught a 200-pound swordfish. We're going to serve that and some other food at our announcement party next week. But you can totally help with the planning. I know Ruby would love your help with that. Are you sure? She looked a little grim, not being able to host the engagement party. And where are you planning on having this party anyway? My place. I paused and added, I mean our place. I chuckled. I've got to get used to saying things like that. She's the best mom. I know you're going to love her as much as I do. So, how long until the wedding? You have to give me at least a year to make the arrangements. Your brothers robbed me of the dream weddings I wanted to throw for them. You wouldn't do that to me, would you? Never. I had no idea my mother was so driven about being able to put on a wedding. I'll talk to Ruby. I'm sure she would love your help with planning that. There's no rush. We can wait a year or so, I guess. Ruby and I hadn't discussed anything like that. I wasn't sure we would ever really get married. And now, I thought that if we didn't, it might crush my mother. You two haven't spoken to each other about a date yet, she asked with a frown. That's sort of strange, don't you think? I mean, if she broke it off with one man, who's to say she won't break it off with you? 
I'm not sure how to answer that, Mom. Especially since all the signs pointed to Ruby wanting to end our fake engagement once her old fiancé moved on. I have faith in her. We love each other. I'm sure she thought she loved that other man too. I don't know, Chance. Worry furrowed her brow as she stabbed a purple grape with her fork. This worries me. No need to worry, Mom. We're in love. You'll see that when you come to our party. I just don't like to see you get hurt. Not that I've ever seen it, but I don't ever want to. You're my baby, Chance. My last little chicken. I only want what's best for you. Reaching out, I patted the back of her hand. I know, Mom. Everything is going to be okay. You'll see. Of course, Ruby was probably going to break my heart and leave me. But I would survive. I hoped. And Mom would too. I prayed. I suppose you want to have your great-grandmother's rings so you can have them fitted before your engagement party. I'll give them to you when you take me home. Thank God I didn't even have to ask. That would be nice. Thank you. While Mom went to get another plate of food, I texted Ruby the good news. I'll be bringing the rings home today. So be ready to go with me to the jewelers to get them fitted for you. She texted back. What? That's awesome. I'll be ready. Mom came back and sat down. I want you two to come over for dinner this evening so you can tell your father the good news. We would. We would definitely come tonight. But she doesn't get off until late. You guys like to have dinner around 5 and she'll be working then. What time do you two eat your dinner? Around 8 or 9. That's much too late to be eating dinner. Since you two are going to be married, let her quit that job. Her fork hovered in the air as she went on. She can do whatever she wants now that she's marrying you. She likes her job. Ruby wasn't about to quit her job for a fake engagement. With a stupefied expression, Mom asked, how could she? She stands there all day. And in the hot sun, too. She's not in the sun. There's a canopy over the sign-in area. And she likes it. It's sort of a killer job. She's going to be the wife of a billionaire. She doesn't belong on the docks, Chance. Maybe she doesn't want to come off as a gold digger. Do you think that's why she hasn't talked to you about quitting the job already? I don't think that's why, Mom. She's going to need her job when she ends our fake engagement. This was getting too complicated. And I knew that with more and more people thinking we were actually engaged, things would only become even more complicated. It wouldn't make sense to anyone for Ruby to stay at her job. Her family was sure to think that as well. And if she quit, then it was doubtful that her boss would hire her back once she left me. He had been about to fire her for blowing off work for the other guy. He most likely wouldn't trust her if she up and quit. Once you two start having babies, she'll have to give that job up anyway. It wouldn't be healthy for her to be standing up for hours on end when she's pregnant. I'm just saying that it's inevitable. She waved her hand as if clearing the slate for a new conversation topic. Anyway, she can ask for the night off. Maybe tonight is too short notice, but tomorrow should be fine. Ask her chance. Just ask. I will ask. But don't count on it. It's their busy season. I finished off my plate while mom poked at her food. So, I went to get more food while waiting on her to peck around her plate. An hour and a half later, I'd left my mother at home and had my great-grandmother's rings in my pocket. Ruby had made it home for the long break she had between shifts. She didn't look all that happy when I showed her the rings. So she just gave them to you without asking lots of hard-to-answer questions. She did ask lots of hard-to-answer questions. But I managed to dodge around them pretty well. I pulled the engagement ring out of the box. Do you like it? It's very pretty. She didn't even hold out her hand to try it on. So, I guess we should head out to get it fitted. I see no reason to get the wedding band fitted, since I'll never wear that one. I had an idea. You know what? I think I need to make a real proposal to you. You don't have to do that. 
She ran her hands over her face. That's just too much, Chance. No, I said as I got down on bended knee in front of her. We have to have something to tell our families and friends, don't we? Gosh? She nodded. I guess we do. So many made-up stories. At least a few should be true. Good. I took her left hand in mine. Ruby, I don't know your middle name, Salazar. It's Conception, after my great-great-grandmother. What's yours? Michael. I smiled at her. So, let me begin again. Ruby Conception Salazar, will you do me the great honor of becoming my wife? Okay. She wiggled her fingers. Really? I knew she could do better than that. That's gonna be our story. I. Uh, okay. Do it again. She huffed loudly. I was on the verge of frustration with her. So I took a few slow deep breaths before I said, Ruby, you've been with me since day one. When I left my mama's side and walked into the first day of school, you were right there with a smile on your face, meant just for me. Her eyes began to shine as she tried to hold tears back by blinking. I suppose you're right. I knew then that one day, you would be my wife. And in sixth grade, I asked you to make a pact with me, that if neither of us had found the right person to marry by our 40th birthdays, then we would get married. What do you say to marrying me, just 15 years shy of that? One tear fell down her cheek then she nodded. Yes. I would love that. I slid the ring on her finger and we both gasped when it fit perfectly. No way she hissed. I looked at the ring that my great grandmother had worn most of her life, then looked at the woman I'd just put it on. Tears streamed down her face and I felt a lump form in my throat. I pulled her to me and kissed her softly before saying, everything is going to be okay. Chapter 8 Ruby Since the ring fit perfectly, Chance took the set to the jewelers to have them cleaned. And I went back to work. I had to get out of there. There were too many emotions going on for me to handle. Things had begun moving too fast. I began to feel out of control. It wasn't supposed to be like this. My intentions weren't this dishonest. I hadn't actually thought we'd tell everyone we knew about the engagement. I honestly didn't know how I thought the whole thing would play out. But lying to our families wasn't the thing I had ever thought about or wanted. I couldn't fault Chance for going in the route he'd gone. He was trying to make things look real. And he was doing an excellent job of making that happen. Maybe too excellent. The kissing we'd done before was nothing compared to the kiss he gave me after proposing. It felt way too real. It felt way too honest. And I had to stop him from falling for me. Once upon a time, I was worthy of Chance Duran. Not now though. Not at all right now. Things weren't right in my head. I felt afraid of things I'd never been afraid of before. One of them being falling in love. I couldn't say I had ever fallen in love with Logan. I'd loved him for some damn reason. But the falling part had never happened. And maybe it wasn't even love that I had felt for him. Maybe it was nothing like love at all. I knew I loved Chance. In the way friends love each other, at least. But there couldn't be anything more than that. Not on my part, anyway. There was no trust in myself anymore. I couldn't trust my judgment. I had gone along with Logan when I should have walked away from him. And I did not know why I had done that. With such a struggle going on inside of my head and my heart, I wasn't the girl for anyone at the time. My cell rang and I saw it was Chance calling. I walked away from the stand to take the call, not wanting anyone to overhear me. Hey. Hey great news. The jeweler cleaned the rings while I waited, so I got to bring them home with me. And you will never believe this. The guy had a man's wedding band that matched the set. So I bought it. Why'd you do that? We weren't ever going to wear wedding bands. Why did I do that? He got quiet for a second. I just did. Now I have a whole set. And the ring fit me right off the bat too. 
The jeweler said it was a sign that I was meant to wear it. Like the original owner was blessing me with the same love he'd had when he wore it. I think that's a killer story to go along with our proposal story. Everyone's going to want to hear about it when we have our party. Anyway, about the party. I think we shouldn't invite too many people. I'm going to invite my parents, but not my siblings and definitely not my cousins, aunts and uncles. There are just too many of them. Well, mine will be there. So I think that you should most definitely invite yours. And mom wants us to go for dinner at their place sometime before the party. It's not like they haven't met me. I saw them here about a year ago and we talked. I don't have the time for that and you know it. I told her that I would ask you. I'll tell her that you don't have the time. No. If you did that it would hurt her feelings. I'll take tomorrow evening off. I'll get Leslie to cover for me. Okay. Anyway, you'll get to start wearing the engagement ring when you get home tonight. You know, so you can get used to wearing it. That's a bad idea. I'll put it on whenever we're going to be around people, but I don't see the need to wear it when I'm home or even here at work. I don't want to lose your great-grandmother's ring. It's too much responsibility. Well, I think you should wear it all the time but that's just me. You know that you can do whatever you want, right? I'm not trying to run the show here. But I sort of feel like you're doing a whole lot of no show at all, so I'm trying to take up the slack. And my mother really wants to be in on things too. So I'm just giving you the heads up about that. In on what things? I rubbed my forehead as a headache was coming on. Wedding things. There isn't going to be a wedding. Yeah, you and I know that, but no one else does. We will tell them that we're not going to have a formal wedding when they come to our party. And I don't see why you need to invite your brothers. It should be more intimate. Just our parents. And Captain Jack, Little Joe, and One Toe Pete, he laughed. Don't you remember that we invited them too? I would hate for them to feel uncomfortable. Come on, baby. Let's just have the party and have a good time. What can it hurt? Why do I feel like it can hurt in more ways than either of us even realize? You seem excited about the party. It's gonna be fun. I've talked to some guys that play down at the smokehouse, and they've got next Saturday night free. So I was thinking we should have the party then. I cannot do weekends and you know that. I wasn't going to mess up my job for some phony baloney engagement. I've already thought about that. His laugh had a little bit of evil in it. I'm going to go and see your boss tomorrow. And I'm going to pay to charter every boat for the entire 24 hours of next Saturday. Plus, everyone in your company is invited to the party. My jaw just about hit the floor. Chance. You're the fiancé of a billionaire. I want it to look that way. This was going way too far. And when this ends, then what? Let's not think about that. Let's think about right here and right now. And right now, we're planning to tell everyone we know that we're getting married. But it's a lie, I whispered. You're making me lie to everyone I know. Am I? He got quiet. You're right. I'm sorry. I just want to make this work out for you. I didn't mean to make you feel like I was making you do anything. I never want to push you. I just wanted to make you happy. There's this sadness about you that wasn't there before. I want to help you get out from under that cloud and back to who you were before you met that piece of absolute shit, Ruby. That's all I'm trying to do. But if that's how you really feel, then I'll cancel everything. All of it. He was right. Being with Logan had changed me. You know, he made me think I wasn't the person I had seen myself as. You're right. I am sad. I'm sad that there are people like him in this world. I'm sad that I used to not look so hard at myself, and now I can't help it. I'm more critical of myself than I ever was before I met him. Let's fix that together, baby. You know you're not supposed to call me that, 
unless there are people around. Sorry. Let's fix that together, Ruby, my oldest and dearest friend. That's better. I had fun last night. And sleeping all cuddled up with you was nice too. You really are the best friend I've ever had. I mean that chance. I don't know of anyone else who would do this much for me. My girlfriends all sort of scattered when I began dating Logan. I guess they saw through him and couldn't figure out why I couldn't. That was another reason I didn't want to invite our friends from school to the party. I was embarrassed by how stupid I'd been. Can we just make it family and work friends and leave our high school friends off the guest list? We can do whatever you want, Ruby. I really mean that. I'm through taking over. You tell me what you want, and that's how it will be. My co-workers would love having the day off and going to this party. So they're in. And if you really want your parents' and brothers' families to come, then I'll invite mine as well. I had to stop letting Logan's words get to me. Chance was right. They were only words. What the hell? Invite our high school class too if you want. Maybe being engaged to you will redeem me in some of their eyes. Hey, we all love you. We were a tight group back then. There were only a hundred and five of us who graduated, and we've lost some along the way, unfortunately, to some rough shit. I think we should invite them all, it'll be a nice reunion for those of us left. You know stay tight like we were back then. I almost forgot about all that bad stuff. I guess I put it in the back of my mind, so I wouldn't think about them all. When Fallon overdosed, it nearly killed me. She lived right next door. I should have noticed that she had been staying inside much more than she ever had. She never came out to chill in the backyard while our parents barbecued. And I just didn't reach out to her. Seems you might have carried some guilt around that you shouldn't have been carrying. You know, we all were affected by those deaths. How could we not be? But the thing about our class was that we stuck together, and with each death, we just got closer and watched out for each other more than we had before. We do come from a good graduating class, don't we? I couldn't believe that I'd let it slip out of my mind that we had some seriously deep ties between us. Invite them all. I should be ashamed of how I didn't listen to my friends when they tried to tell me that I wasn't acting like myself when I was with Logan. They were only trying to help. And I thought they were jealous because he was nice looking and had money. Ouch, he yelped. What happened? You said he was nice looking, and it felt like a knife plunging into my heart. He laughed. Sure you're jealous. He might have been nice looking, but you damn well know that you are the bomb.com. He's got nothing on you, Mr. Handsome. I had to laugh. Chance made me laugh all the time. Logan never had. Well, if I'm super handsome, then okay. Just as long as you know that you're super amazing, and one hot mama. I am not hot. I said, then turned around to find three teenage boys had been looking at me. Hey. They scattered like flies. Sorry, one of them called out. But you have an amazing body. I heard that, Chance said, and he seemed to be dying of laughter. Just as you said you weren't hot, some kid was looking at you, right? That is ironic as hell, baby. See, you do have a great body, and great other stuff too. You're great all over. You used to know that. Nothing has changed about your body. Well, that's not true. It's gotten even better with time. Like a fine wine, right? I joked. I felt much better than I had when I had come to work. The boats are coming in, so I'm about to get real busy here. Got it. I'm ordering Chinese tonight. Leave the fish for someone else, okay? Will do. Make sure you get plenty of egg rolls and shrimp fried rice. Also, don't forget the honey chicken. I love that stuff. You're going to order from the Asian Palace, right? Are there any other fabulous Chinese restaurants in this town? No, there are not. And tell them not to forget about giving us two fortune cookies. I want to see what they say. What the jeweler said about the ring fitting you makes me wonder about things a little. Like that fact that my great-grandmother's ring fits you perfectly too. Just don't forget the fortune cookies. 
I saw the line of boats pulling up to the docks and knew things were about to get crazy. And the pork sparrows, don't forget to order those too. And one more thing, Chance. Beef and broccoli? I had to laugh. No. It's not about food. It's about you. You are one amazing man. I want you to know that. I mean, you probably know that, but I want you to know that I know that. And you are an amazing woman. Always have been and always will be. So get to work, and I'll be here with dinner and wine waiting for you when you get home. Plus, I found your stash of muscle cream. I'll rub your legs with it tonight, since you were a sweetheart and rubbed my back with it last night. That stuff worked miracles on my muscles. I watched as people began streaming off the boats, all looking my way, ready to book their next fishing trips. Hey, you know that I love you, right? And you know that I love you too. Friends to the end. Oh gosh. Don't use that phrase. Why not? Haven't you ever watched Child's Play? With that creepy doll, Chucky? I have not. That's a horror movie, and I do not do horror. Mom said it made me pee the bed when I was little, so I don't like to chance it. A woman elbowed her way through the crowd to get to me first, as I stepped up behind the computer. Let's say this instead, friends forever. Maybe. We'll have to work on it, I guess. We have nothing but time to figure out all the little kinks in this complicated relationship we've got going on here, fiancé. Fiancé? I did ask and you did say yes. I think your exact words were, yes, I would love that. See you around eight, baby. I need three passes for next Saturday night, the lady shouted at me as I stuffed my phone into the pocket of my khaki slacks while others gathered in line behind her. Next Saturday is sold out, I let her know. Chance had said he was going to book the entire 24-hour period for that day. I made sure to black out that entire period and would have to explain it to everyone before I left that night. Plus, invite them to the party of the century. Well shit. Okay, Saturday morning then. I really wanted a night trip. Um, that morning is booked too. Might I suggest the Friday night trip or the Sunday night trip? I couldn't the grin that spread over my face, knowing the exact reason why that day was booked. Chapter 9 Chance In my truck, we drove to my parents' house for dinner. Sure, it was only 4.30, but mom always had dinner on the table at 5, so it was going to be a very early dinner for us. I hope you like meatloaf. It's my mom's go-to whenever she has company over. She's got this recipe she found in a Better Homes and Gardens magazine from like 20 years ago that she thinks is the bomb. It's okay. It's just freaking meatloaf, but she's proud of it. I'll be sure to let her know I think it's delicious. Ruby fidgeted with her seatbelt, then sighed a few times. You're nervous, but there's no reason to be. You know my parents. Yes, I do know them. And I'm about to sit at their dinner table and lie straight to their faces. So yes, I am nervous. Who wouldn't be? She looked at me then shook her head. Except you. Why are you so calm, cool, and collected when we're about to tell your parents things that will most likely end up disappointing them and maybe even hurting them? I hadn't wanted to put my real feelings out there, and I still wasn't going to. Ruby needed my friendship above and beyond a romantic relationship. So, I talked my way around the new love I had begun feeling for her. The way I care about you and love you isn't fake. And you care about and love me too. So none of our feelings are fake. Yeah, but not like the love two people have when they get married. You know I adore you, Chance. You're the best friend. I stopped her as I said, yes, yes. The best friend you've ever had. But we do have genuine feelings for each other. Right? I suppose we do. She huffed and looked out the window. I just wish we didn't have to say that we're actually going to get married. The engagement is fine. People break engagements all the time. But saying that we're going to get married is going too far. At least, that's what I think. Like I said before, everything is up to you. So, 
if you want to tell my parents and everyone else that we aren't in a rush to get married and won't be setting a date anytime soon, then I'm with you, baby. I'm with you in whatever you want to say and do. Thank you. That is a relief. The thing is that I've already told you this. You keep drifting back down every time I lift you up. I don't go back on my word, Ruby. You should know that about me by now. What I say is what I do. You're leading this excursion. The whole way. So keep your head up and remain confident. I'm not going to pull the rug out from under you. I'll never do that to you. You mean way too much to me for me to ever do anything to hurt you. You really are the best. She smiled, and my heart just about melted as I looked at that perfect smile. So are you. Pulling into the drive of my parents' beach house, I watched Ruby's face light up. Oh my gosh. This is so pretty. You and your brothers must have had this house built for your parents. We did. It's nice, huh? It's absolutely gorgeous. I bet even the mansions in Malibu can't rival this house and the one you live in. We live in, I corrected her. That's our house. Well, it's not really. She got out of the truck after I'd parked. I got out too and walked around to take her hand. Yes, really? I told you that you can stay as long as you'd like to. And that won't be that long. Surely, Logan will move on soon now. It's been a little over six months since our breakup. He's sure to find someone who will take his attention. I let her hand go to run my arm around her waist. Even if he does, you can still stay with me. I like having you there. You're a great cuddler. Plus, you give me a reason to look forward to going home each day. Sleeping together two nights in a row is probably not the best idea. I don't see why not. We're just watching television and going to sleep. I liked the little nightly ritual we'd started. It's harmless. Plus, I think you need some cuddles. I know I do. It is nice. Mom opened the door before we even got to it. There you are. Dinner is almost ready. She opened her arms, looking at Ruby. Ruby Salazar, it's so nice to see you. Ruby gave my mother her best smile and hugged her. It's nice to see you too, Mrs. Duran. We're going to be much too close to call me that. Evelyn is just fine, dear. Evelyn, Ruby said. Thank you for inviting me to dinner. And your home is out of this world. Our boys gave us this place. We adore it. Mom led the way inside, through the opulent foyer with double staircases that led up to the second floor. Your father is back here in the smaller dining room where I had the staff set things up for our special dinner. I don't smell meatloaf cooking, I said as I took Ruby's hand pulling her close to me. I didn't cook. I had a chef come in and make something special for us. This is a real occasion, son. I wanted to have something we all would remember. Dean, you remember Ruby, don't you? Mom said as we came into the dining room. He turned away from the sidebar to greet us. I certainly do. It's nice to see you, Ruby. How have you been? Great, actually. She held up her left hand. The ring fit. Mom gasped. Eat did. You didn't even have to get it sized. She took Ruby's hand and put her fingers on the ring, moving it to check for the snug fit. Oh my goodness, it does fit you perfectly. That is a good sign, you two. My grandmother and grandfather had a long marriage that was full of love and laughter. I wish I had my grandfather's ring, only he died a year before my grandmother, and she buried him with his. I brought along the ring I'd bought for myself. You're gonna freak about this. I pulled the wedding band out of the box and slipped it onto my finger. When I took her rings to the jeweler to get them cleaned, the store owner found this antique men's wedding band that matches great-grandmother's set. It fit me perfectly too. Mom had to test the fit then laughed. Well this is great isn't it Dean? Seems so. He wiggled his finger at Ruby. Do you watch much cooking on television, Ruby? I do. I love to learn how to cook new things. She walked over to him, continuing the conversation. I would rather cook a meal than eat out. 
Have you ever heard of a chef who's famous for cooking French cuisine? He asked her as he led her away. I looked at my mother. What's he doing with my girl, mom? She's going to die when she finds out. Mom followed them, and I joined in right behind her. I've heard of a few of them. My favorite is. Dad pushed the door open between the kitchen and small dining area. Him. What the bloody hell are you doing with that lobster ravioli, Sebastian? It's taking you forever. The roasted chicken is nearly done, and that ravioli is the appetizer. The chef turned around and finally saw us. Ah, you must be Ruby. Chef Richards, Ruby shouted. Really? She looked at my father with wide eyes. You hired him to cook for us this evening? Evening isn't quite accurate, is it, love? The chef said with a chuckle. It's more like lunch at this point. But still, here we are cooking away for this wonderful day for you and, he looked at me, and you, Chance. He looked back at Ruby, who'd gone to stand by him. Can I see the ring? She held out her hand. It was his great grandmother's, and it fit me perfectly right out of the box. They say that's a good sign. I tend to agree. He whistled as he looked at the ring. They do not make them like this anymore. You can't get this type of work from modern jewelers. Such a wonderful way to begin sharing your lives together. Congratulations. You both look very happy. We are, she said as her cheeks flushed pink. You're my favorite chef. I know you're hard but you're really fair. And you make the best foods too. The chef put his hand on her shoulder, leaning in to talk quietly, but I still heard him as he said, your future-in-laws asked me if I would cater your wedding. Would you like that? Ruby's hands covered her mouth, but her wide eyes told everyone how much she would like that. Get out. I will not, he said. Is that a yes? She dropped her hands to her sides. Gosh yes. Oh my gosh. She looked at my dad and then at my mom. You too. Oh my gosh. This is amazing. Beyond amazing. I cannot wait to tell everyone I know that Chef Richards is going to cater my wedding. Ah. It looked to me like Ruby was about to change her mind about making a wedding date. And the crazy thing was that I was all for it. When we sat down to eat the delicious meal, my mother asked, Have you two talked about setting a date yet? I'm not rushing you. I just would like to give the chef some idea of when the wedding will be, so he'll pencil us in around a certain time. Ruby looked at me with wary eyes. So I said what I could to make her understand that this was her decision to make. Honey, I'm available to marry you anytime you want. You can make that call. It's just that I've got to really think about this. She looked at my mother. At least a year. Of course. It takes time to plan a wonderful wedding. I would say you should pick a date anywhere from a year to a year and a half from now. And there's the venue to think about too. The number of people you want to invite is another thing. All the rest can be figured out once you've made those choices. And I'm more than happy to help you, Ruby. Anything you want, all you have to do is ask. Ruby blinked a few times to hold back tears that made her dark eyes shine. Evelyn, that's really nice of you. I mean that. She looked at me. We can talk about this tonight and come up with something very soon. Then she turned her attention back to my mother. And your help would be very much appreciated. I don't think I can pull this off without you. Mom clapped, and her smile told me that she loved Ruby already. Yes? I would love to help you with this. It's like a dream come true for me. My other sons didn't let me help them with their weddings at all, and it was such a disappointment. With no daughters of my own, my dream wedding has never happened. But I can help you make your dream wedding come true. I promise not to push my opinions on you, either. I'll just help you make your dreams happen. Ruby's chest heaved as she sighed heavily. Thank you. You have no idea how much that all means to me. I mean that. You are all so amazingly nice and supportive. There really are no better people than you guys. Ah come on babe. You're gonna give us all big heads. No. I mean it. 
You all are just so amazing. I'm lucky to know any of you. Well, you'll soon be one of us, my father said. A Duran. And us Durans stick together through thick and thin. You'll see. I wasn't sure she would see that day. But it was nice to think about it anyway. You know, babe, we can even wait a couple of years if that's what you want. It's not like I'm going anywhere. There is really no rush at all. Long engagements are pretty commonplace nowadays. But not too long, my mother said. But not too short either. She looked at Ruby. Of course, that's up to you, honey. Whatever you want, we will be happy with it. We're just so happy that you two have found each other. All these years you were school friends and now you're going to build a life together. It's just adorable. The conversation continued through dinner, though Ruby and I tried to our best to avoid more questions about the wedding. Later, when we got back home, Ruby walked into the house without saying a word. She'd been quiet the whole ride home too. I knew this might have been too much for her. Coming up behind her I took her hand, stopping her and turning her to face me. Hey, it's just you and me right now. Tell me what you're feeling. I honestly don't know what I'm feeling. Despite that, or perhaps because of it, I knew she needed to know how I really felt. Ruby, I'm not sure how you feel about me. I mean, I know you love me as a friend. But I love you for more than that. Still, there is no rush, and I don't want you to feel like you need to say the same thing to me. I just want you to know that this can turn from fake to real in a single heartbeat. Because what I feel for you is real. I have fallen in love with you, and the truth is that I would love to be married to you and share our entire lives together. But only if you want that too, and only when you're ready for that. Well that's out there. Now what? Chapter 10 Ruby as I stood there, looking into the gorgeous eyes of the most gorgeous person I'd ever known in real life, I knew any other woman in the whole world would have just said yes to the man. But not me. We need to talk. I pulled him along with me, and we sat down on the closest comfy couch I could find. From the floor to ceiling window in front of us, the view of the ocean, the sun casting orange and yellow hues over it as it set, was almost as amazing as the words he'd just said to me. I want to let you in on the me that I am right now. Forget about who I was before, this is me right now that you're dealing with. You're still the same person. You just have to reach down deep, find her and pull her back up to the surface. He caressed my cheek as he looked deep into my eyes, trying to see where the girl he'd known had gotten off to. Okay, so the thing you need to know is that I can't find that girl. She's not inside of me anymore. I don't know where she went. I don't know how to find her. It's like she's just gone. I knew it sounded overly dramatic, but I hadn't been able to get through to him just how different I really was since being with Logan. He moved his hand off my face and huffed. I can't imagine you losing yourself over some jerk telling you that you don't know how to dress. It was more than that. Lots more. I just told you about one day and only one scenario on that day. It was like Chinese water torture. It never really stopped. It was time to let Chance know even more about what I'd gone through. Look, this is embarrassing for me to say these things out loud. But I am going to tell you some of the more humiliating things he did to me. And that I did to myself. I don't mean to make you relive this stuff. But I truly don't get it. We were out later that same night when he made me change my clothes. I'd had one margarita, just one. I wasn't tipsy. I didn't have a buzz at all. I'd eaten lunch, and even had a snack while I was getting ready to go out, so my stomach wasn't empty. So when I laughed at something the bartender said, what Logan told me shocked me. He said I was drunk and laughing too loudly, and making a fool of myself. Chance rolled his eyes. Yeah, the guy's a total jerk. I get that. What I don't get is how you let that shit bother you, when you knew you weren't drunk and you weren't being too loud. I wish I had the answer for that. I truly do. It would help me a lot to know that too. So, after he said that to me, I got quiet, 
and I ordered water while he continued to drink screwdrivers. And he got louder and louder, until the bartender asked me politely if I could get him the hell out of there, which wasn't an easy feat. I had to tell him that I was feeling sick and needed to go home before he would finally leave the place. All the way home, he chided me about getting drunk so early in the night and getting sick and ruining his night. Mind you, I was driving his car back to my place since he had drunk too much. He kept telling me that I had almost hit like three cars already and needed to watch what I was doing. Yet you didn't stop seeing him, Chance pointed out. I know. That night, I drove to my apartment and got out of his car. He went around and got into the driver's seat. I told him he should stay at my apartment and not drive, but he just sped off. That's on him not you. You tried to get him to do the right thing, and he didn't do it. Well, I should have tried harder because he hit a car only a block away from my apartment complex, and it ended up being my next-door neighbor and her five-year-old son. They were taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. All of them. I only found this out when I got a call an hour after he'd left. It was from the hospital, telling me he was asking for me and whether I could get there before they took him into surgery. So I rushed to the hospital and found him crying, begging me for forgiveness, and I gave it to him just before they wheeled him into the operating room. It took six hours for them to find all the internal injuries and stop the bleeding. Chance sat there silent as a church mouse staring at the floor. My gosh. I haven't stopped kicking myself for that. The person I was before I met him would have stopped him from driving off. But I didn't care. Not enough to stop him. I could have taken the keys with me, so he couldn't have driven away. In all reality, I think I left the keys in the car on purpose, hoping he would just leave so I wouldn't have to deal with him. That little boy still limps to this day. And he spent over a year in a wheelchair. And that was all because of me. That's a lot, Ruby. He nodded. That really is a lot. And that ain't all. He looked at me with his mouth hanging open. How could there be more than that? While still in the hospital, making his recovery, Logan became the most difficult patient. He didn't want the food they gave him. So I had to go out and bring him some. Sneak it to him because they had him on a strict diet. He complained about everything I brought him, too. He threw most of it into the trash. I'd paid for that food out of my own pocket. I'd paid for the gas to go get the stuff. I'd taken time off work to be there for him as much as I possibly could. Not even an ounce of appreciation came from him. But the guilt kept you going back, he said, finally understanding why I had become this person I wasn't before. All the while, his constant complaining, the way he made me feel that I couldn't do anything right, kept building up inside of me. I wasn't good at anything in his eyes. Don't say anything else. I don't want you reliving that shit. Chance pulled me into his strong arms. You do everything right. You're such a good person. Everyone has their off moments and that's all that was, Ruby. You had an off moment. You didn't want to deal with that drunk jerk that night. You made a mistake. But he drove you to do that. I want you to see that he drove you to leave those keys in the car, so he would leave you alone. And I nearly killed three people by doing that. It's not okay. It wasn't some freak accident that I had no control over. I had absolute control over it. I just chose not to accept that control. The memory of that night, and all the ones that followed haunted me. We'd been dating for about three months when that happened. I took care of him for about a month before he was back to his old self and told me he didn't need my inadequate help any longer. He never gave me any credit for his recovery. Instead, he would say that in spite of my help, he managed to get better on his own. That must have worn you down. Chance hugged me tightly. I'm so sorry that happened to you. If I could go back in time and stop you from meeting that good for nothing, I would do it in a heartbeat. Being with you does make me feel better and more like myself. But it's crazy how easily I slip back into the beaten up person I've been for the last couple of years. I mean, 
it's been six months of not having anything to do with him. How come I'm not better yet? Will this never go away? I'm here for you, baby. Whatever you need, I am here. He kissed the top of my head. I really had no idea how much you've been through. I don't know how you've managed not to go stark raving mad through all that. Pulling back, I looked at him. So, you can understand now that I'm not girlfriend material. I'm not fiancé material. And I'm certainly not wife material. Not right now. And honestly, maybe not ever. Don't say that, Ruby. It's not true. You can get through this. You just need someone who truly loves you to help you. And I truly love you. I knew he did. He'd proven that to me. I'm not saying that I don't want to get through this, because I really do want to get back to feeling the way I did before. But I don't want to drag you down with me. And I feel like that could happen. I don't want you to end up hating me. Like I could ever do that. He kissed my cheek. I just told you that I love you and would love to marry you. Sharing a life with someone means taking the good with the not so good. I feel certain that, with time, little by little, I'll be able to prove to you that you're worthy of everything that comes your way. All we need is time and a bit of faith in each other. I've got faith in you. Do you have faith in me? I have more faith in you than I have in myself. I dropped my head, wondering what I should do. I couldn't accept Chance's real marriage proposal. I couldn't be the right woman for him at the time. But things could change. And I didn't want to let Chance go. But I also didn't trust my judgment. I have plenty of faith in you. I've known you forever. You will get through this. I know you will. Whether you decide to stay with me or not, I'll never turn my back on you. I want you to know that. I mean it. I am your friend to the end. He shook his head. No. You said that wasn't a good way to say it. I am your friend forever. No matter what. I was sure he meant what he said. But I was also sure that if I left him, it would change the way he felt about me. He was human after all. Rejection hurts. I don't care who you are or how much money you have. Being walked away from hurts. We can just put this on the back burner for now. We do have an engagement party to plan, and we don't have much time to do it. I sighed as I thought about the wedding that would probably never be. It's gonna suck that I can't have Chef Richards cater the wedding. Don't count it out yet, Ruby. The offer of marriage is still on the table. Don't forget that. Please don't forget that. How can I marry this man when he deserves someone so much better than I think I can ever be? The way Chance looked at me made me feel stupid for even thinking the way I'd been thinking. He wasn't a liar. He wasn't mean. He was a good person, and I knew that for sure. You know, I think I've sort of made you worried. About me. Yeah, you have. He pulled my hands up and kissed each knuckle, one at a time. I. Do. Not. Want. To. Lose. You and I would be a fool if I walked away from you. Plus, it would probably send me over the edge if you walked away from me. I will not do that. You can count on me. It would have been nice to be able to tell him that he could count on me too. But I didn't want to say that, unless I knew it would be true. I know I can. And one day, I hope to be able to honestly say that to you too. You know, it's nice that you can be honest with me like this. Most girls have just said whatever they thought I wanted to hear. But you're up front with me. I like that about you. You're up front with me too. And I like that about you. But I get why most girls would tell you what you want to hear. If I was smart, I would accept your proposal before you got smart and took it back. I am smart. And I'm not taking it back. Having you here has been an eye-opening experience for me. I love seeing you every day. I would miss you if you weren't here. And I don't want to miss you. Do you know that you're adorable, Chance Duran? Like how do you have so many great qualities? I don't know. 
How do you have so many great qualities? He asked. And before I could tell him that I didn't have so many great qualities, he added, like being able to smile even though you have some tremendous personal struggles going on. And thinking about me all the time. Like bringing fresh fish home for dinner and taking me on that badass fishing trip. Plus, you made my mother very happy with the way you acted tonight. She's already in love with you. Just thought you should know that. Well, to be honest, I think your mom and dad are the best. I mean, they hired my most favorite chef in the whole world to cook for us. And they want to hire him to cater our wedding. I mean, they are really the very best ever. It would be an honor to call them my parents-in-law. Is that how you say that? I'm not even sure. But it would be an honor to be part of your family. And that's the truth. If you sat down and wrote a list of the pros and cons of marrying me, I think you would find the pros list much longer than the cons. Just saying? Yeah? Well, if he wrote a list about marrying me, he would find the cons list much longer. Chapter 11 Chance The next day, I sat in my office looking out the window while thinking about everything that Ruby had been through when my brother Casey walked in. Hey baby bro. How's it going? Turning in my chair to look at him, I told him the truth. You know, I'm not really sure how it's going. He took a seat and smiled at me. So, mom let it slip that you've been keeping a secret from everyone. Yeah. I figured she wouldn't be able to keep it to herself. She's excited about it. You don't seem that excited about it, he pointed out. Wanna tell me why that is? The situation is complicated. I've known Ruby nearly my whole life. You know that. What you don't know is that when we were in the sixth grade, I asked her to make a pact with me that if we hadn't found anyone else for us by the time we turned 40, then we would marry each other. That's odd but sweet. Is the problem that you're only 25 now and not 40? No. Not really. The problem is that Ruby isn't the person she used to be. A sixth grade kid, he asked with a grin. No. The confident young woman with no trust issues that she'd been before she met the man she almost married. Mom did tell me that Ruby had been engaged to someone about a year ago. Has she told you how that ended? Yes. And she's told me how he treated her, which was beyond atrocious. I have to admit that I hadn't fully understood the trauma she's been through. Not until she filled me in a lot more last night. The jerk told her not to talk too much when he introduced her to his mother, so that his mother wouldn't dislike her. Wow that is shitty. Yeah it is. And I had wondered out loud about how she could have stayed with someone who spoke to her that way, which, as it turned out, wasn't really the right thing for me to do. He nodded. She got mad at you. No. It's just that he put her through so much more. What else did he put her through? Well, one time he was driving drunk and got in an accident that sent him and two other people to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. And Ruby takes the blame for that incident. Casey looked confused. You said that he was driving drunk, so how does she feel responsible for that? She was sober and drove them home after he'd been in jerk to her again. She just wanted away from him at that point. So when they got to her apartment, she got out of the car but left the keys. She did tell him that he should go into her apartment and not drive, but he got behind the wheel and ended up hitting her neighbor and the lady's little boy. The poor kid was in a wheelchair for like a year, and he still walks with a limp. Casey cleared his throat as he shook his head. Wow. That is bad. She's got guilt that's piled up on her. But it's more than just that. I'm not sure how to describe it. You know, he put her down a lot. All that disrespect he gave her has made her think less of herself. You know what I mean? She's not confident anymore, and she doesn't think herself worthy of much at all. Sounds like she endured a long time with a wrongdoer, he pointed out. But she agreed to marry you. But that wasn't true. Ruby hadn't agreed to marry me. Only I couldn't tell him that. Yeah. But she won't commit to a wedding date. 
So there's that. It was some of the truth, just not all of it. And this thing with her bruised and battered ego worries me. I want to help her. I want her to find herself again. I love her. That part was true. I want to marry her. That was also true. But most of all, I want her to be able to move past what's been done to her. I want her to find her happiness again. It's in there. I know it is. Now and then, it rises to the surface. But inevitably it's forced back down, and the insecure person comes back out. I was watching this old horror movie about a vampire who'd bitten this guy who didn't want to be a vampire. It was so easy to fix that. All he had to do was kill the vampire who'd bit him, and he was turned back into a normal human man instead of an immortal bloodsucker. It would be nice if things worked like that in the real world. You know, I have had thoughts of killing that man. I smashed my fist against my palm as I thought about it. Chance don't even say things like that. What if something happens to this jerk, and someone who'd overheard you say that told the cops? You would become a suspect, and might get arrested. That would destroy our mother. So no more thinking like that. Promise me. I know what you're saying. And I'm not stupid. But damn it, this guy got away with too much. He turned someone who was so full of fire into someone who barely has any light in her anymore. And when it does begin to shine, something inside of her puts that light out as quickly as it comes up. It sounds like Ruby has been mentally hurt. So, like any victim, she's going to need professional help to get through this. And you're going to have to understand that she might never be the same person she was before this happened to her. Please don't say that. I can't take thinking that way about her. It all comes down to this chance. Do you love her enough to take her the way she is or not? I sat there, trying to think about what he was asking me. And the answer was that the way she was right now made her uncertain about staying with me. That wasn't a way for anyone to live. I love her. I knew that for sure. I mean, I would literally kill for her if it came down to that. I know you don't want to hear that, and you don't want me to say that, but it is the truth. I would kill for that girl. I won't unless someone is physically threatening to kill her, but I would kill for her, and I would even give up my life for her. So I believe that I can take her the way she is now. But I want to help her get better. I want that because I love her. Does she want help? I think so. We hadn't talked about her getting professional help. I mean, she's accepting my help. And she wants to get back to who she was before she knew him. I read once that mental mistreatment is harder to get over than physical mistreatment. I'm not sure why that is, but I think it might be because when you lack the power to defend yourself, you can pretty easily accept that. But when you stay with someone who treats you badly and warps your mind, then it makes you distrust yourself. She does not trust herself. I know that for sure. Maybe he was onto something. She said that sometimes she feels happy and confident, and then it kind of just goes away. Like poof she feels secure, and then another poof, and the security is just gone and she can't seem to find it. Do you think this all comes from that one guy, he asked. I mean, do you know what her home life was like when she was growing up? I hadn't spent a ton of time at her house. The times I was around her family growing up, they were nice. You know, normal. I'm basing this change in her on the last time I saw her, which was about a month or so before she met this guy. She was the old Ruby that day I saw and talked to her. I didn't see her the whole time she was with the guy. I didn't see her until she came to my office a couple of weeks ago. Why did she come to see you at work? I'd said too much and now had to find a way around the truth I'd revealed. She just wanted to touch base with me since we hadn't seen each other in over two years. We had been close friends in school. Sure, we drifted apart a bit when I went away to college. But when I got back in town, we saw each other now and then. Of course, I wasn't back in town long when she met that guy. Wait. She came to you two weeks ago. His eyes narrowed. Mom said you two have been dating secretly for the last six months. That is what you two told her. Damn. Busted. 
Running my hands over my cheeks, I tried to think of how I would talk my way out of the mess I'd just gotten myself into. Did I say two weeks? I don't know why I said that. It was about six months ago that she did that. Nope. Too late, buddy. Mom also told me that you guys told her that you ran into each other about a week or two after she broke things off with her fiancé. You kept your relationship secret so that no one would find out and get into your personal business. But that isn't the truth. Shit. I didn't know what else to say. My mouth was digging me into a deeper and deeper hole. Just tell me the truth, Chance. He leaned back in the chair. I'll give you my scout's honor that I won't let anything you say leave this room. He held up two fingers. Tell me. The whole thing's fake. I wasn't sure why I began it that way. Hang on. No, the whole thing isn't fake. But some of it is. The backstory of us running into each other is fake. And the whole engagement thing was fake, at first. But now it's not. I have really asked her to marry me. And what has she said? No. Again, that wasn't exactly true. I mean she said yes. But she sort of thought it was a fake marriage proposal, and that's why she said yes. But she doesn't feel like she's in a good place right now to be a good anything to me. Not a girlfriend. Not a fiancé. And not a wife. So you two are just friends? Yeah. That wasn't even very true. I mean in my mind we're more than just friends. We've been sleeping together for the last few nights. Mostly just to put on a show for others around us. But the kiss I gave her after the marriage proposal, which she thought was fake and I meant, was a real kiss. On my part. And I would guess on her part too, because she totally kissed me back. And we were alone, at home, with no one around for us to try to fool. This is complicated, he said as he looked at the ceiling. Told you. I took a deep breath. You know, it feels really good to get that off my chest to somebody. You won't tell a soul. You swear that. Right. I won't tell anyone. Not even my wife. He looked at me. If you're not really being intimate, then what do you mean by sleeping together? Actual sleeping. Cuddling, watching television, and going to sleep. Holding each other. I started it because I felt like she needed to know she was cared for and loved for who she is. I felt like she needed to be hugged. And one night of that led to another, and another. Now, I don't want it to end, and I don't think she does either. So thus far there has been no intimacy. Yep. He pinched the bridge of his nose. There has been no acceptance of your real marriage proposal. Yeah. And our mother thinks there is going to be a wedding that she gets to help plan. He looked at me. This is a disaster waiting to happen, is what this is. I can tell you right now that this whole thing will blow up in your face if you stay on this path. See, Ruby sort of thinks like you do. So she is smart. And I'm guessing that you came up with this bright idea of the big engagement party where you both will tell huge lies to your families and friends. She's also said some things that are very similar to that. I began to feel like I was making bigger problems for us than we already had. Can you explain to me the reason for the fake engagement in the first place? Oh. I laughed. I left that part out. See, when she came to my office that day a couple of weeks ago, it was because she ran into her ex and he wanted her back. So she lied and told him that she was happily engaged, and told him about our pact. She asked me to be her fake fiancé, and I agreed to do that. I moved her into my house. I took her out. We made the scene, you know what I mean? And you just kept making the little lie bigger and bigger. Didn't you chance? Yep. That was all my doing. Damn it. Chapter 12 Ruby. Walking into the house, I saw Chance sitting at the island bar in the kitchen. Hey there, handsome. I used the credit card you gave me to book the boats next Saturday. I told everyone at work that they're invited, and I'll let them know what time the party is later on this week. He didn't say a word, 
which made me think that I shouldn't have used his card to do that. It wasn't okay to use the card for that? No. No. I mean no, it's fine that you use the card for that. He sighed heavily, and I noticed that there wasn't anything out for dinner, and I hadn't brought anything home. Are you hungry? Is that why you're sitting here in the kitchen? Were you waiting for me to come home so we can make something together, or? No. You want me to make something? I wasn't able to read him well at all. I mean, we can go and get something to eat. But we need to talk first. Sure. I went to the fridge to grab a bottle of wine. I'm thinking red. I held up a bottle. Sound good to you? I don't want any. But you go ahead. His expression was so vague that I had no idea what was on his mind. But I didn't like the way it made me feel. So no wine for you. You want a beer? I held one up. You know, while I'm here at the fridge. No, thank you. I put the wine and the beer back inside the fridge. I'm not going to have any either. Going to take a seat at the island bar, I was ready to get right to whatever was bugging him. Let's talk. First of all, you need to know that I accidentally spilled the beans to my brother Casey. All of them? I asked. All the beans? You spilled them all? Yeah, pretty much the whole pot of beans. I spilled them all. But he said he won't tell anyone, and I believe him. That's good. It is good. All of this is good. I mean really good. So, with him knowing everything now, he gave me some good advice. To call off the party, and not lie to any more people than we already have. I really hoped that was what he'd advise Chance to do. All the lying was getting to me, and I had no idea how I was going to pull it off with my family. Well, he didn't say that exactly, but he did make it so that I came to see that the party was all my idea, and it was a rather bad idea. So, if you want to call off the party, we totally can. But I've already told everyone at work, and your parents know, and I'm guessing your brothers know about it too now. Plus, I've already paid, with your credit card, for the boat charters for that Saturday, and we have this strict no-refund policy unless you cancel 10 days in advance. So, you would lose thousands of dollars. And that's not cool. We can still have it. I've already paid that band, and we have all that fish too. Invite whoever you want, or don't invite whoever you don't want to lie to. I'm just sorry that I got you into this mess. I take full responsibility for this. It was all me, baby. All of it. I just kept on going with my true feelings, and hoping that the more I did, the more you would see that life with me would be a wonderful ride that you would never want to get off. But that was a big mistake. A huge one, really. Don't beat yourself up over it. You meant well. It just got a little out of hand, is all. I just won't invite my family. I can say they had a prior thing, like a wedding out of town or something. No big deal. We can have even more fun now that I don't have to worry about getting caught in my lies by my nosy family. Yeah, that's good. He didn't look happy yet. So anyway, my brother said that you've been mentally mistreated. Wait, I stopped him. You told one of your brothers about the way Logan treated me. How much did you tell him? Pretty much all of it. He looked at me with raised brows. I told you that I spilled the whole pot of beans. I didn't know you meant the part about me and Logan and how he treated me. Gosh chance. Now I don't want to have to face your brother. Damn it. I told you all those things in confidence. I trusted you. The embarrassment that filled me was off the charts. Gosh. He's not going to think anything bad about you. He's Casey, my oldest most responsible brother. He won't tell a soul. He swore that to me. He's going to tell his wife. And he might tell your mother too. I could not breathe. I cannot believe you did this to me. I went to get the bottle of wine back out and filled a glass completely full of it. I think the glass is designed to be filled only partially to allow the wine to breathe ruby. Jerking my head, I stared daggers into his eyes. 
I am aware of the way the glass was made chance. What I'm not aware of is your big mouth that thinks it can share all my problems with everyone. I didn't mean to. But it's a blessing, really. See, I thought my love could help you get better. But I realize now that it's going to take more than that before you can be the old ruby again. That is, assuming that too much damage hasn't been done, and you can go all the way back to who you were before that jerk messed with you. I downed half the glass of wine before I came up for air. You suck. Hey, I'm still going to love you whether you get back to your old self or not. I thought about it long and hard while waiting for you to come home. I love you even now. And after some therapy with a professional, you'll be way better than you are right now. Then we can actually work out. Maybe you'll finally see that too, once you talk to a shrink. You want me to tell a stranger that I went from a fairly confident person to a shell of my former self in only two years' time? You want me to tell my most embarrassing, shameful moments to a stranger? Are you insane? No. No, I am not. And you should know that I know a good therapist costs a lot of money, and I will gladly pay for anything you need. Use the credit card I gave you to pay for it all. All of it. I mean it. I just want to get you better, baby. Chance I'm not crazy. I do not need a therapist. I am mentally bruised and a little broken. I thought about that for a second. Okay, maybe a lot broken in some ways but I'm a functioning person. I go to work. I do my job. I participate in lots of things. I'm not mentally incapacitated. And I do not need to see a shrink to tell him all my deepest secrets. I liked talking to you about those things. But that won't ever happen again, since you like to go blabbing my secrets to anyone who'll listen. It wasn't like that. I swear it wasn't. You said it yourself, you're bruised and broken. Well, don't people who are physically bruised and broken seek medical attention? Huh. Don't they? It's not the same thing. I gulped down more wine, trying to ease the burn of embarrassment that had sprung up inside of me. I cannot believe you did this to me, Chance Duran. It's just help, Ruby. Nothing will change. You're just going to get some help to get over what that creep did to you. If you had been kidnapped and someone treated you that way, the authorities would demand that you get help. I think. I was not kidnapped. I refilled my glass. I stayed with him of my own free will. I said yes when he asked me to marry him. Yeah, about that. His lips pulled up to one side as he eyed me. Why was it so easy to accept that jerk's proposal and so hard to accept mine? Like, it seems impossible for you to say yes to being my wife. Maybe because he'd mess with me into thinking, I didn't know how to do shit right. Maybe it was because he'd made me think that without him, I would just sort of flounder through my life. Maybe I didn't know how to tell that man no. But I do know how to say no to you. And I know that you will still care about me the same way you always have, even if I say no to you. And you are right about that. I still love you, even though you don't want to marry me right now. I may not ever want to marry you. I gulped some more wine before adding, I probably won't ever marry you. You shouldn't have told anyone the things I told you, Chance. You've betrayed my trust. Baby, he said as he came toward me. I didn't mean to. I held up one hand to stop him from coming any closer and to shut him up. Don't. Don't try to hug this out with me right now. I'm mad at you, Chance. I've never been this mad at you. And don't try to tell me that you didn't mean to betray my trust because you said all the things that I told you in confidence, and you damn well knew that I was ashamed of those things. They were meant only for your ears. Spinning around, I took one step before turning back to grab the bottle of wine to take with me. I'm spending the night in my bedroom. Alone. Don't come knocking because I'm not opening the door. Ruby, please don't. Chance, I said in a tense tone. You can't fix this for me. You can't fix me. You should just realize that I'm the person I am now. There is no quick fix for this. This took two years to make. 
it will take longer to fix the mess that I am now. I can see that the time frame is just too long for you. And that's okay. I didn't expect that you could deal with the new me, anyway. Not for long. Ruby, he said as I turned back around. Talk to me. Don't leave me here like this. I don't want you to go to bed angry at me. I looked back at him. You know what? I'm not angry at you, Chance. I'm really angry at myself. I just keep on trusting people I shouldn't. I can't trust anyone, not even myself. My judgment is bad on every possible level. That isn't your fault, and I am not mad at you for doing what you did. Of course, you felt that you had to reach out to someone to help you with the disaster that I am. I'm really mad at myself for asking you to deal with me. Don't do that to yourself. You were right to come to me. You were right to confide in me. I was wrong to tell anyone about your past. I am so so very sorry, Ruby. Please. Let's talk. Let's work things out. You know I'm better off alone. I really think that. I was great during those six months when I was with no one. Things went bad when I came to you for help. And that isn't your fault. It's all mine. I bet that if you talk to a professional, you'll find out that the way you're feeling right now is what anyone who has been through what you have feels. But it's not real, Ruby. I love you. I care for you. And you feel the same way about me. You know me. You knew I wouldn't just let you wallow in sadness. You knew I would do everything in my power to help you find yourself. He paused, shaking his head for a moment and taking a deep breath before looking me directly in the eye. I will leave you alone. For tonight. I'll let you think about things. But you have to keep this in mind. I want you. I want you with every flaw you have right at this moment, and with any that might come in the future. And I can tell you this too. If you didn't deserve all my love, I wouldn't have it for you. You are a spectacular human being, and I am proud to call you my friend. I would love to call you more. I hated how his words made me feel. Hopeful. Chance you are good. You are right. You are the absolute best person that I know. I stood there, the bottle of wine in one hand and the nearly empty glass in the other, not knowing what else to say to him. He moved slowly toward me, reaching out as he came my way. What do you say to you putting down the things you're holding right now and letting me hold you? In his arms I'd found comfort. In his arms I'd found an awful lot of affection. In his arms I'd found peace something that I hadn't felt in two and a half years. In just two years' time I'd found sadness, shame, tremendous guilt, and probably worst of all, distrust for myself and others. Chance, I'm just not fixable. I'm sorry. Your hugs can't fix all of my problems. I walked away from him then, the bottle of wine still in one hand and the glass in the other. I love you, Ruby Salazar. And I meant it back in sixth grade, when I asked you to make that pact with me and I still mean it today. Yeah, well, we're not 40 yet. Maybe by then, I won't be so messed up. Chapter 13 Chance I wasn't quite myself that night after Ruby walked away from me, nor the next day when she didn't try to contact me throughout the whole day. I hadn't tried to contact her, wanting to give her time and space. Nothing felt settled inside of me. My gut ached constantly, and my mind couldn't stay on the task at hand, no matter how hard I tried to concentrate. Somehow, I had to make things right between us again, but so far, I hadn't been able to figure anything out. And now it was time to leave work to go home. I had no idea how the night ahead would go either. Pulling through the gate of our parking lot at work, I noticed a yellow Lamborghini parked along the side of the road just outside the gate. It pulled in behind me, following me down the road. The fact that it was the kind of car that Ruby's ex sold for a living had me on edge as it continued to follow me, even when I pulled into a restaurant parking lot to pick up something for dinner. Not wanting to jump to conclusions, I got out of the truck to head inside to place my order and have a drink while I waited. I heard the gravel crunching under someone's shoes and then I heard a man say, 
Chance Duran, right? Every nerve in my body went on high alert as I stopped and slowly turned around to find a man a little older than me smiling away. I am Chance Duran. And you are? He held out his hand, wanting to shake mine. Logan Cuevas. I'm sure you've heard my name before since you're shacked up with my fiancé. I looked at his hand, not bothering to shake it. She's not your fiancé anymore, and I really have nothing to say to you. My body shook as it filled with hatred for the man who'd hurt Ruby so badly that it seemed there might be permanent scars on her mind. I turned to walk away. But I only got one step in when he said, you need to hear what I have to say. If you don't, then the things that happen next might come as a shock to you. Not wanting to play along with his little mind game, I thought about continuing what I had begun, walking away. But then I remembered what Ruby had said about Logan. He could be a dangerous man who had ties to other dangerous men. So I turned around. Say what you have to say. I've done my research on you, Chance, and found that you have made quite a bit of money for yourself. That's one fancy mansion on the beach you have. I bet Ruby has no idea what to do with herself in a place like that. Much too fancy for someone as simple as she is. She is anything but simple. She used to be as close to perfect as a person can get. Until you trampled all over her self-esteem. I bet you were the kind of kid that held a magnifying glass over helpless ants until they burned to death. He shoved his hands into the pockets of his knockoff designer slacks. I don't know what she's told you, but the girl doesn't have a great imagination, so I would assume she's said basic bad things about me. None of them are true. The truth is that she's the reason I was in a nearly fatal car accident that almost took my life and the lives of a couple of innocent victims. She told me about that, and she was not at fault in any way. It was obvious that the man considered himself a great manipulator. But I was not easily manipulated. Again I'm sure she put her unique spin on that as well. The fact is that she knew I'd had too much to drink that night. She pulled up at her apartment, got out of the car, leaving it running, and walked into her place without thinking about me at all. Well you are a grown man. But I was drunk. I wasn't capable of making good decisions at that time. She was my girlfriend and supposed to care about my well-being. Instead she left me and left my car running. Maybe you shouldn't have gotten yourself into that position in the first place. Maybe you shouldn't have said mean things to her that made her want to get away from you. I really had no idea why this guy wanted to talk to me at all. It seemed like he just wanted to say how he was the victim instead of Ruby, which was insane. Look, I need to get back to what I came here for. So, if this is all you're going to do, try to make Ruby look bad, you can't convince me of anything. Oh, I'm not here to do that. I'm actually here to make a deal with you. See, you have more money than you know what to do with. And I do not. But I'd like to know what that feels like. So here's the deal. You give me enough money to leave town, move to a new location of my choice, and I will leave you and the simpleton to your lives. See, I think I deserve some restitution for what she did to me. You know, the wreck and walking away from me at the altar in front of almost everyone I know. That was worse than a slap in the face. I want some way to clean the egg off my face. Money or her. You're not getting Ruby. I wasn't going to negotiate that point, at all. Then I want money. You can have her. I just want something to show for what she did to me. I was humiliated. I bet you were. Tell me, how did it feel to know that the young woman you tried so hard to beat down could actually stand up and walk away from you? You know, I can see that she's made you believe things that aren't true. But that's okay. Maybe you two are more alike than you are different. So, I think that I should get on with the amount of money I want, so you can get to thinking about that. 50 million. I wasn't sure that I'd heard him right. 50 what? Million. Are you insane? He was out of his mind if he thought I was going to give him that much money. No. You can give me that as restitution for what your fiancé did to my mental stability, 
or you can throw her out so she'll have no choice but to come back to me. Then I will reap my revenge on her. It's all up to you, hero. If you make even one more threat against Ruby, I will not be responsible for what I do to you. Do you get me? You look pretty strong. I'll admit that. He moved his hand inside his left pocket. But I doubt all those muscles are as lethal as this little Glock I've got right here. And it would be self-defense if I shot you. Your physical structure could easily overpower mine. Any judge would agree with that. You think you're pretty smart. I had hated this jerk before I had ever met him. But now that I had actually talked to him, hate wasn't a strong enough word for how I felt about him. Loathing wasn't a thing I'd ever felt before, but now I knew why someone had invented that word. For people like this son of a gun. I know that I am. So what will it be? How am I to know that you will keep your end of the deal if I give you the money? I wasn't going to give him shit, but curiosity made me ask. Well, it's not like I'm going to draw up an extortion contract if that's what you're asking. So you freely admit that what you're asking of me is extortion and not restitution, I said. Glad you can clearly see the difference. For a minute there, I thought you honestly believed the crap you've been spouting. Anyway, he said, shuffling his feet. There can't be any paperwork. There can't be a link at all. You will just have to take my word that I will take the money, move away, and neither of you will ever see my face again. You know, I highly doubt that. I think you would blow through all that money in record time. I think you would be back for more before I knew it. And the next time, you would threaten Ruby's safety even more. I could just jump to that right now. As a matter of fact, I should let you know that I'm part of an elite group of people who have a certain amount of power to get things done. So far, I haven't put my dogs on you two. But that could change in an instant. Cartel, huh? I could sense that he was part of the gang, but not very high up there. He was too stupid to be a high-ranking member. Money laundering is your gig. They use the dealership to clean up their dirty money, and all you do is oversee that little function. He got a little jittery, moving his hands inside his pockets as he shuffled his feet. You think you're smart but you are not. Just saying something like that could get you smoked. If you were really smart, you wouldn't have said a thing about something you know nothing of. I'm not afraid of you. And I honestly don't think the people you work under give a shit if you live or die. There are hundreds more who could do what you do for them. So these threats you're making need to stop. You're not from here. But I am. And I happen to know more good guys than you know bad ones. Judges, lawyers, cops, and even some who are higher up than all of them put together. Keep that in mind when you're dishing out your threats. He laughed like what I'd said was a joke. We have those kinds of people too, you fool. You think cops around here can make a living on what they get paid? They rely on the money we give them. I should know. I hand out a hell of a lot of it. Boasting about what he did for something as dangerous as the cartel was just stupid. Do yourself a favor and get back into that car, go back to the hole you crawled out of, and stay away from Ruby and me. This is over. I turn to leave, done with talking to the jerk. I can see that you need time to digest all I've told you. I get it. It's a lot to take in. I'll get to you in a day or two. By that time, you should be able to come to the conclusion that you should give me the money or the girl. I will have one or the other. I kept walking as fire filled me. It was all I could do to keep it reined in. The hell you will. I'll find you. Don't worry. Fifty million. Cash only. Large bills are fine. Another car pulled into the parking lot, and finally the fool was done talking. He got into his car, peeling out of the parking lot, his tires spitting loose gravel all over the place. Heading into the restaurant, I went straight to the bathroom, bypassing the hostess who looked at me with her mouth gaping. When I got into the bathroom and saw my reflection in the mirror, I understood why that was. My face was as red as a fire engine. I had never been so mad in my life and that showed on my face. 
Splashing cold water on my face, I took deep breaths to try and calm down. I had no idea how Ruby hadn't seen right through that guy from the very start. My guess was that he was somehow able to hide that slimy part of himself from her until it was too late, and he could use guilt to control her. Part of me wanted to pay him off to get him out of our town and out of our lives. But I knew he would be back for more if I gave him a dime. We would never be rid of him if he knew he could get money out of me. And we needed to be rid of him. My body shook, I was so angry. But it wasn't just anger that had me in its tight grasp. There was something else there too. Fear. I wasn't afraid for me. But for Ruby, I was terrified. He'd broken her in ways I never thought possible. If he got his hands on her again, I was afraid he would finish her off. If nothing else, just to spite me for not giving him the money he wanted. I knew without a single doubt, he wanted the money more than he wanted Ruby. He had just used that threat to try to get me to give him what he wanted. I wasn't a dumbass. Logan has to be stopped. There was no getting out of this. The good for nothing had to be stopped. If I didn't shut him down, he would end up making my life a nightmare the way he'd done to Ruby. And I wasn't about to let that happen to myself or her. My idea of us having a high profile relationship to make things look on the up and up seemed to have been a very bad idea now. It let Logan know who I was and what I had. I'd made bad decisions every way I turned where Ruby was concerned. Somehow, I had to stop wrecking shit and start cleaning up the mess I'd made. But I didn't have a clue as to how to go about doing it. And talking to my brothers about this would probably only make things worse. They had families to think about. Putting them in danger wouldn't be the right thing to do. I had gotten into this mess by myself without talking to anyone about what I should do, and I had to get out of it by myself without bringing anyone else into this crap fest. And what was worse was that I had brought Ruby into this shit show too. She'd already had enough shit in her life, and I'd gone and added more. How am I going to fix this? Chapter 14 Ruby After a night of having my own little pity party, I had come to some conclusions. Chance was right about one thing, I needed to get help. But I didn't want to use Chance's money to do it. I had health insurance through work, and I could get the help I needed on my own. It was important to me to do this on my own, without having someone pushing me to do it, or paying my way through it. My reaction to what Chance had said, had been based on embarrassment. I didn't want anyone to know what I'd put up with from Logan. I didn't want anyone to know that I wasn't myself anymore. Even though that had obviously shown through more often than I had realized. There had been something that Chance said that had gotten to me. The part about if I had been kidnapped, people would have made sure I got help for what had happened to me. That kept coming back to me. If someone is physically hurt, they go get medical help. My mind was what had gotten hurt. So I needed a doctor for my mind. And there was a list of psychologists and psychiatrists right there on my computer screen at work for me to pick from. So I picked one with five stars after her name and set up an appointment for the next week. And I felt amazingly good about doing it. So good that I wanted to keep doing things for myself. I asked Leslie if she would take my evening shift so I could take off after my first shift and get my nails done. And maybe get a massage, too. I had time to kill before my nail appointment, so I went shopping to buy something to wear to our fake engagement party. As I was trying on clothes, I looked in the mirror and told myself something. It's not a fake engagement party. He asked you to marry him, for real. This is all real. Stop thinking any other way. Chance had only been trying to help me from the moment I went to him. He wasn't perfect, so expecting him not to make mistakes wasn't realistic. He told his brother about what had happened to me. I had to get over that. I had to face the facts that the people closest to me were going to know about what I'd gone through. And that was okay. It wasn't like Chance's family was full of bad people. 
They were all very nice, considerate, and caring. There were really no better people than the Durands to know about what I'd been through and how it had changed me. Stepping out of the dressing room, I wanted to see myself in the three-way mirror outside of it. The red dress hugged my curves in a way that was on the daring side. It wasn't like me to wear something like this. A saleslady came in, picking up clothes that people hadn't put back up. Oh yeah girl. That is one hot look on you. Some strappy black or white sandals would really make that dress pop. Or silver. Yeah, definitely silver, and you could add silver jewelry. I held out my left hand, wiggling my fingers. My engagement ring is silver, so I'm going to agree with you. Wow. She looked at my ring. That's really beautiful. How long have you been engaged? A couple of days. We're having a big party to announce it too. That's what this dress is for. I looked in the mirror, noticing how nice my body looked in the dress. Do you think it's too much? No way. You look so good. That thing hugs your body in all the right places. What's your shoe size? I'll go grab some shoes so you can try them on with the dress. Seven and a half. I looked at my nails, which would soon be polished. You think I should do my nails the same shade of red as this dress, or something else? She looked at my hands as I held them out and then said, black. Shiny black. Nothing else. Don't junk them up with rhinestones or anything. Just shiny black and keep them that length too. Short is in right now. Don't get any fake ones put on. I'll be right back with some sandals. Wanting to make sure the dress was comfortable enough for me to spend hours in, I went to sit on the bench and found that the fabric stretched with my body, so it wasn't uncomfortable at all. Comfort was sort of a big deal to me. I didn't like tight-fitting clothes that wouldn't bend with my body. And I hated baggy clothes. Baggy clothes made me look bigger than I really was. Logan had pushed me to wear things that didn't fit me telling me that I shouldn't show off my body unless it was in perfect condition. Perfection had never been my thing. I was fine with not being perfect. Before Logan. But after Logan, I began noticing the cellulite that sprinkled each butt cheek and a bit down the backs of my legs. I noticed that when I sat down my stomach had a roll, and sometimes it had two of them when I was bloated. My upper arm sometimes wiggled when I waved a thing I had never noticed until he pointed it out to me. Stop it, I told my reflection. You're fine. No, you are not perfect, but no one is. You do that too, the saleslady asked as she came back in with four shoeboxes in her arms. Me too. I'm rail thin. In school kids called me bones. I just can't seem to put on weight. I try. Believe me, I try. I eat like a pig but I don't gain weight. Never have, and maybe I never will. So I had to get okay with the shape I have. I wonder when people began to think that everyone should be the same. The same height. The same weight. The same shape and size. It's crazy to think we can or even should all look the same. I had to stop over-examining my body, or I would never get back to the average amount of self-esteem anyone should have. So let's see the shoes. She pulled out the first pair and I fell in love. A two-inch heel is just enough to make my legs look great without making me feel like I'm walking on stilts. I walked around the room, making sure I didn't look like a baby giraffe first learning how to walk. Yes, I want these. You don't even need to take the others out of their boxes. You are easy girl, the saleslady said. I like you. I like you too. Thanks for all your help. The next stop was my massage. It was heavenly, and when the masseuse asked me if I'd like to get a facial and have someone do my makeup, it sounded like a great idea. So I got that done then headed to get my manicure. Shiny black, no extras, I told the manicurist. Same on my toes. She filed my nails into shape. You have lovely hands. And this ring is gorgeous. It looks nothing like the ones I've seen before. It's an antique. A family heirloom, I guess is what you would call it. I smiled as I thought about Chance on one knee in front of me. It belonged to my fiancé's great-grandmother. 
and get this, it fit me right off the bat. No resizing necessary. That's a good sign, she said. That's what everyone keeps saying. And when my fiancé took this ring and the wedding band that goes with it to the jewelry store to get them cleaned, he found an antique men's wedding band that matches this set. And guess what, I said. What? That one fit him right off the bat too. Could those things really be a sign? It felt like everything was pointing to the fact that Chance and I could have a real shot at a happy marriage and wonderful life together. If I could just get out of my own way. But for that, I would need the help of a professional. And I would get that help. I would do it for myself first, and for the relationship Chance and I could have second. It seems that you two have an amazing future ahead of you. Congratulations. I hope you let me do your nails for all your wedding things. The bridal shower. The actual wedding. Your baby showers that are sure to follow. She laughed. So much of life is ahead of you. So lucky. So very lucky. Yeah, I guess I am lucky to have a man like my fiancé. He and his family are the best. And he is lucky to have a fine woman like yourself too. Your beauty radiates from within. I wish you both the best. Thank you. I was getting compliments left and right. And it felt good. Just as I was paying for the money petty, my cell dinged. It was a text from Chance, telling me that he was bringing dinner home, and he added three little words to the end of the message that he'd never added before. He loves me, I whispered before putting the phone into my purse. I should have texted the words back to him. But I thought it might mean more to him if I said them in person. I had to allow myself to have happiness in my life again. I had to allow myself to be loved and to love in return. I had to put an end to the distrust I had in myself and others. If I didn't, I would never get better. And I needed to get better, so I could get to that amazing future people kept saying lay before me. Chance deserved that future too. We both did. There was no fooling myself. Things wouldn't be this rosy every day. But today, with all the things I'd done for myself, well, it was a good day. But I couldn't pretend that every day would be as good as this one. One day, with help, I would get to a place where I would have more good days than bad ones. I had to have faith in that. Pressing the key fob to unlock the car, I stopped dead in my tracks when I saw a man step out from behind the Range Rover. Ruby. What do you want? Had I just been thinking my day was rosy? Well, it vanished in that instant. I want to tell you that I met this fiancé of yours. Very nice. You have done well for yourself. Why do I feel like this isn't you being nice about things? Oh, I'm always nice, Ruby. Many times you've put your unique spin on my words, my actions, but I am nothing but nice. The hell you are. How did you run across my fiancé when I haven't told you his name? All our high-profile dates must have gotten word out to Logan. Chance and I both had thought that was what we wanted, but now I wasn't so sure that had been a good idea at all. Little birdies chirped and I heard them. Chance Duran billionaire. Nice Ruby. Very nice. He's a genius engineer. I preferred to think of him as that, instead of labeling him by how much money he has. Plus he's a nice person. A good person. An honest person who doesn't intentionally harm anyone. Unlike me, he asked with a grin. Of course Chance Duran is a saint. Such a great guy. A great catch. I need to get going. I took a step closer to the car, and he took one too, getting in front of the driver's side door. Logan don't. Don't what? Talk to the woman I love? I still love you. Have you stopped loving me completely? I mean, you were going to marry me only about six months ago. Is it that easy for you to turn your love off? I do not love you. I wanted to be sure he knew that. And you do not and never did love me. You can read my mind? He laughed. See, I had to go meet this man you say you're marrying. I had to see if he was someone you would truly be happy with. He is. 
Chance was probably the only man I could ever be happy with. See, you think you know things that you don't really know. And that could hurt you in the end. Let's be honest here, shall we? He is out of your league, honey. So far out of your league that a happy future with him can never be. He will begin to see through you. And where will that leave you? Heartbroken. That's where you will be. Well, I'm going to take my chances anyway. Thanks for caring. I do care. He reached out to me, and I recoiled from his touch. What? You don't want to feel my hand on your body? You used to love it when I touched you. Only because you would deny me any interaction for such long periods of time that I was starved for physical attention. But the real reason I don't want you to touch me is that you make me sick. I should have broken things off with you in the very beginning. Better yet, I shouldn't have gone out with you in the first place. But you did go out with me, and you didn't break up with me until you could humiliate me in front of everyone I know. Thanks for that, Ruby. Classy. Very classy. You're welcome. He wasn't going to get to me. I would not let him. I'm leaving. Get away from my car. I'll let you go. But you should know this. He's going to get tired of you. You will bore that man. Right now, I will take you back. But if you wait until he dumps you, then it will be too late. Do what's best for you and go back to him. Tell him you've made a mistake and you don't want to marry him. You don't want to live with him. You don't want to even date him. You belong with me, the only man who can put up with your uniqueness. No one else will ever put up with you the way I have and will continue to do, Ruby. You and I are soulmates. We were made for each other. I balance you out. Without me, you will make a fool of yourself. You'll dress in ways that make you look ridiculous. And that makeup you have on is preposterous. You look like a circus clown. And black fingernails? What are you? Some sort of emo chick? Come on. You're already making yourself look like an idiot. It's only been six months, and already you're going right back to those stupid ways. Big girls need to dress in ways that hide their lumps. You seem to like showing off that cellulite for some reason. Only I can make sure you don't make a laughingstock of yourself. I'm leaving. Move. I shoved him then got into my car. He held the door open, looking at me with penetrating eyes. Get away from me. I see the beauty underneath all that crap on your face. Take off the tight clothing and wear clothes that are your size. Stop pretending to be something you're so far from perfect. That perfect man wasn't meant for someone as imperfect as you. You don't even try, Ruby. You do not even try to be perfect. The hell with you. I pushed him back and grabbed the door, slamming it shut. And then the dam broke, leaving me in a blur of tears and torment. I'm never going to be good enough for anyone. Chapter 15 Chance A candlelight dinner would help me begin to fix things with Ruby. The salads were ready and chilling in the fridge. The pub-style pot roast, complete with potatoes, pearl onions and carrots, stayed warm in the oven in the aluminum tray I'd brought it home in from the restaurant. Red wine chilled in an ice bucket on the table that I'd covered with a white linen tablecloth. The stage was set. I just needed Ruby to come home. As soon as I heard the beeping of the lock, I hurried to meet her. I couldn't wait to hold her in my arms and tell her that I loved her and how sorry I was for everything I had done. I heard her sobbing before I got to her. Baby? Chance she cried. Don't look at me. She had her hands covering her face when I got to her. What's wrong? She couldn't stop crying, and I pried her hands away from her face, revealing that she'd been crying for a while. Her eyes were black with running mascara. Trails of the stuff ran down her cheeks and even over her chest. The pink blush was smudged, and so was her red lipstick. Chance, don't look at me, she said with quivering lips. Pulling her into my arms, I hugged her, rocking with her. Honey, what's wrong? Her arms wrapped around me as she buried her face in my chest. Logan. 
he found me and told me that he'd met you and that you were out of my league. And I looked like a circus clown. And I'm fat and wear my clothes too tight. And I'm not good enough for you, and you're going to dump me, and he wants me back but not after you dump me. I hate him. I hate. Him. Me too. I ran my hand over her hair as I tried to hold back the anger I felt toward the man. He'll get what's coming to him. Don't you worry. I'm not going to let him ever say another word to you. Not ever. I'm going to shut him up for good. Her fists pushed against my chest as she moved back, shaking her head. No. No, you can't do anything to him, Chance. Promise me that you won't. Promise me. If anything happens to you because of me, I will. I will. I'll kill myself. I mean it. Don't ever say that, Ruby. I had no idea what I was going to do to that creep, but I was definitely going to do something. I'm not afraid of him. And you shouldn't be either. You should have just walked away from him when he came up to you. You should have gotten in the car and drove away before he could say anything hurtful to you. He was at my car when I got to it. He got in front of the driver's side door. I couldn't get in. I couldn't walk away. Finally he had made me so mad that I pushed him out of the way. But he made sure he said plenty to bring me down before it came to that. She wiped her eyes, further smearing the makeup. I had the best day too, Chance. I made an appointment with a psychiatrist today. I took the first step to getting myself over this. I went shopping and bought a gorgeous dress for our party. And then I got a massage, and they did my makeup at the spa. And last, I went to get my nails done. I had a me day, and it was awesome. And then he showed up and ruined everything. Wait, he was already at your car when you got to it. How would he know what car you're driving now? How should I know? She threw her hands into the air. It was like he was stalking me. Because he was. And before that, he was stalking me. We can't let him get away with this. We just can't. I'm going to the police. It's illegal to stalk people. No, she shouted. You can't do that. He's got ties everywhere. Even in the police department. I know this sounds crazy, but we can't do anything to him, Chance. The retaliation would be deadly. You can't be afraid of him. I wasn't going to let this shit slide. Look what he did to you. I know. I know that I'm a mess right now. But really, what did he do to me? He said some hurtful things that I shouldn't have let get to me. But I did, and that's on me. I blame myself for you thinking that way. I had to blame myself. I'd been the one to tell her that they were just words. You didn't do this to yourself. He did it to you. He used manipulation to tear you down. You would have to be made of stone not to get upset by the things he told you. She dug in her purse, pulled out a package of makeup wipes, and began to try to clean the smudged and ruined makeup off her face. I had felt so confident, Chance. Like right up until the moment I saw him. Just the sight of him felt like a punch in the stomach. I know that sounds stupid and dramatic, but I swear that's how it felt. I knew something horrible was coming. And he made sure he targeted the things that I'm the most insecure about. Taking the wipe from her, I cleaned her face until all of it was gone. You don't need to be insecure about me. I love you. Part of me always has. And I think you're just afraid to admit that you love me for more than just a friend. She sniffled. The text you sent me, about dinner, I saw those last three words and my heart sort of jiggled with joy. She looked down with a frown on her face. I was going to type them back to you, but decided that saying them in person would be better. I lifted her chin to get her to look at me. You did? Yeah. I want to say them in person too. I love you, Ruby Salazar. I don't care if you marry me or not, I love you, and I always will. I love you too. She licked her lips. And I think that getting married might be the right thing for us. She sucked in her breath. But I don't want to say that for sure until I have some sessions with my therapist. 
Is that going to be okay with you? That is going to be okay with me. I couldn't have been happier with her answer. Kissing her softly, I moved my arms around her as our kiss went deeper. Tasting the saltiness of all the tears she'd been crying broke my heart. Ending the kiss, I rested my forehead against hers. I think we're going to be okay, baby. Her fingers moved along my back. Today, when I was talking about our engagement and the party, it was the first time that I thought about it as being real and not fake. It's not fake. I wanted her to say yes to me so bad that it hurt. I mean, I know you haven't answered me yet. But the question is as real as it gets. I can finally see that now. And I want to thank you for what you said to me last night. I know my reaction wasn't exactly stellar, but what you said sunk in. I felt a lot better today, you know, about myself. I've got faith that I can make a comeback. Me too. I kissed the tip of her nose. We're gonna get through this. I want you to know that. I am going to take care of that rat creep, and we will move on. Please don't say things like that. It scares me. She ran her hands through my hair. You really don't know what he's capable of doing. I know he seems like a blowhard, but I promise you that it's not all talk and no action. I do believe you. But I know that you can't let a bully run over you, or he'll just continue to do it. And I think he's going to get to you, as much as he can. I think he's going to continue telling you things that aren't true to wear you down, so you'll end up leaving me. The only reason he wants you back is so that he can squash you even more than he already has. It's payback for leaving him at the altar in front of everyone he knows. He thinks he's got egg on his face because of it. So as you can see, something has to be done about him. We can't do nothing and pretend that he'll find someone else to torture or simply forget and move on. That's not going to happen. You sure? She smiled, pulling me to kiss her. I mean we can hope, right? Our lips met, and I fell into her in a way I hadn't before. She was in this thing with me now. I could feel it. It wasn't her on one side and me on the other. It was like we were coming together, and it was beyond belief. If she hadn't had a deranged maniac of an ex, things with us would have been so damn easy. But then again, if she didn't have the psycho ex, she wouldn't have come to me in the first place, and both of us would be alone or with the wrong people. So I had to take the bad with the good and figure out how to get rid of the bad, once and for all. Chapter 16 Ruby The timer on the oven went off. Dinner's ready, Chance said jokingly. Not really. It was already cooked. But now it's on the verge of drying out. Which we do not want. He pulled me up. Come here. I'll carry you to the shower. We'll wash up a bit before we eat. Are you sure? It was a long way to the shower and up a flight of stairs. I am sure. Come on, wrap around me tightly and put your arms around my neck. I think I'm going to make this a part of my daily workout routine. You up for that, baby? Daily? I asked with surprise. Like every day. Do you really think we can do this every single day? I know we can. He pecked my lips with a quick kiss. If you think so, then I'm up for it. Leaning my head on his broad shoulder, I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. This was better than I thought it could be. Being with Chance like this was more than a dream come true. It was absolute paradise. I never wanted it to end. In the shower he washed my hair while I did nothing but enjoy it. I'm really glad that when we tell everyone at our party that we're getting married, it won't be a lie. Me too. Now I can invite my family. He leaned me back to rinse the shampoo from my hair. Your turn. I filled my hand with shampoo then moved in behind him to wash his hair, which wasn't easy since he was taller than me by about a foot. Maybe sit on that bench thingy. He took a seat, and I went to work on his thick, lustrous hair. Better? Much better. I massaged his scalp while washing his hair. So tell me what sort of things Logan told you. And don't worry, I won't let it upset me. 
I'm just thinking all sorts of things he might have said and want to know for sure what they were. Well, he thinks he's super smart and the best manipulator on the planet, so he said things to make it seem like he was your victim, which I just laughed at. I mean that's insane and I know it. He did tell me about the wreck, and he blamed it on you of course. But I told him that it wasn't your fault, and he shouldn't have gotten drunk in the first place. Thanks for sticking up for me, hun. I like that Logan knew Chance would stand up for me. He needed to know that I wasn't alone in this anymore. He had Chance to contend with now too. You know I've got your back, baby. What else did he say? I ran my soapy hands over his muscular shoulders, loving the way they felt. Well, he's such an ass. I mean, he said lots of mean shit about you that really doesn't need to be repeated. Like, when he said them, I pretty much put them out of my mind that very moment. He's totally see-through. He wanted me to think that you were the manipulator, but I know that you are so not that. I mean, he knew you for a couple of years and I've known you my whole life, pretty much. So, who is he to tell me what person you are? He is no one, that's who he is. Well, at least you didn't believe him. That's all that really matters. I wasn't feeling mad or sad about anything he'd said. So that was an improvement. I mean, he does know how to press people's buttons though. He told me he wanted me to pay him money as restitution for you leaving him at the altar and making him look bad in front of everyone. He said he wants $50 million. He laughed. Can you imagine that? $50 million? And in cash too. He's such an idiot if he thinks I would give him a dime. I mean, someone like him isn't going to stop demanding more and more money if we give in to him. You're right. He would probably spend that all up before you know it and then be back saying he wanted more or else he'd do something crazy he'd threaten. What did he say he would do if you didn't give him the money he wanted? He said that I had two choices. One was the money, and if I didn't want to make that deal, then I needed to boot you out so you would have nowhere to go and would have to go back to him. As if I would do that. Not ever. I mean, if you went back to him, he would make you pay for his humiliation in ways I cannot fathom. And I don't even want to think about that. Above anything else, that alone really scared me. I mean, I was deathly afraid for you. Well, when you said that you weren't going to give him the money, and I suppose you said you weren't going to break up with me, then what did he say? Something about giving me a day or so to think about things, and if I still didn't do one thing or the other, then something bad would happen to you or I, or maybe both, or some shit like that. I was really mad. I mean my face was as red as the nose on a clown. I'm not sure I even heard everything he said since the blood was rushing to my head. He wasn't taking Logan seriously, and that worried me. Chance, he can make something happen to us if he really wants to. You believe me about that, don't you? You know, I'm certain that he's just a money launderer. And that doesn't carry much weight. Well, he might just be that but I can assure you that it does carry enough weight for him to make people disappear. I knew he wasn't taking Logan seriously. And that was very bad. Because he told you that? He shook his head. Honey, I know he figured out how to get into your head and make you believe things that just aren't true. But he hasn't had enough chances to do that to me. So you should trust me on this. He's a blowhard bully. And I'm not going to cow down to him. He made a man he worked with disappear. The guy got crossways with him, and Logan told him that if he didn't quit his job and leave the dealership, then things weren't going to work out for him and maybe even for his family. The guy got furious when he said that, and actually punched Logan in the face. He had a black eye and a busted lip. I saw it. The altercation had been real. Yeah. I would bet that guy gets his butt handed to him, on a pretty regular basis. But how do you know for sure that he made the guy disappear? His disbelieving expression told me everything I needed to know. The man had a wife and kids, I told him, trying to get him to understand that Logan wasn't joking around. The day after Logan was hit, the guy didn't show up for work. 
and his wife came up later that morning to ask if anyone had seen her husband. He'd left home that morning, but he wasn't answering her phone calls. So she went to his work to see what was up. Let me guess, Logan told you this story. He nodded as if he knew he was right. Well, yeah. But so did other people. The missing man was featured on the local news. Do you remember hearing about a man named Robert Perez? Honestly, I don't watch the news. Never have. Anything really important is on the internet. I'm not saying the guy didn't disappear. I believe you about that. But I am saying that the little money launderer just got lucky that the man decided to leave his wife and kids at the same time that Logan had made the threat. That's all that happened. You really can't believe what that guy tells you. Chance was right about me not being absolutely positive about the story Logan had fed me. But I knew that Logan knew dangerous men. And I knew that Logan was in some sort of gang-like group. He had access to things that only a man with his connections could have. I had just found true love with Chance, and I wasn't about to lose him. So, it was going to be up to me to take care of Logan. But I wasn't sure how to do that without getting myself killed in the process. You have a gun, right? I asked, as I aimed one of the shower heads at him so I could rinse out the shampoo. I do have a gun. And if that will make you feel better, I'll show you where it is right after we eat dinner. While we're at home, there is absolutely nothing to worry about. I've got a kick-ass alarm system that no one can get through. I don't care if the entire mafia tries to get in, they won't accomplish their goal. Well, showing me where it is will make me feel better. If I knew where to get my hands on that gun, then I could take it with me when I left in the morning and use it to do whatever I had to do to make Logan leave us alone for good. Whatever had to be done, I would do it. It's a handgun, and it's registered to me. He turned off the water, then handed me a towel off the rack. I've only shot it at the gun range where I bought it. I can take you some time to teach you how to shoot. My dad had a handgun, and he taught me how. I hadn't thought about the gun being registered to chance. I couldn't use it to do any harm to Logan or they would think Chance did it. And I wasn't going to lose Chance to prison either. I would do anything to make sure that Chance's life wasn't on the line. Chapter 17 Chance Waking up alone in my bed, I wore a smile, even though Ruby had already gotten up to leave for work. The night had been like something out of a dream. Ruby couldn't seem to get enough of me. That was more than fine with me since I couldn't get enough of her either. If it hadn't been for work, we probably would have spent the whole day in bed together too. We'd found it. Our happily ever after. The engagement was now real. We were really going to get married. And I was pretty sure the wedding would be sometime within the next year or so. I couldn't wait for Ruby to become my wife. The little sleep I had gotten had been filled with dreams of her and I, and our life together. There had never been a time when I'd felt so happy and utterly complete. The one thing that was against us was her ex. So I was going to make it my mission for the day to track him down and make him understand that he was never to say another word to Ruby, much less stalk her, or hell would rain down on him like he didn't know possible. After a long hot shower, I got ready and went to the Lamborghini dealership where Logan worked. Getting in the place was a process that proved to be a real pain in the ass. When I walked up to the door, I found it locked and there was a button to push. So I pushed it and waited. Welcome to Star Lambo. How can we help you today? A woman asked through a speaker system that made her voice move like a wave around me. I couldn't come out and say I was there to threaten the manager, so I lied. I'd like to check out some of your cars today. Of course, she said. If you'll go online to Starlambo, all one word, dot com, then you can fill out the form and submit it. We'll get it here and run the information you give us. If it all checks out, then you'll be given a code that will allow you to enter the showroom. There will be a credit check and a bank check to make sure there is enough money in your account to make a purchase. You will also be asked to pick the car that you're interested in 
from the list on our website. Make sure you do that, or you won't be given a code for entry. Once you have that, you will be linked to one of our sales representatives who will meet you in the showroom upon your arrival. Can I help you with anything else? So, I can't just come in and take a look around like any other dealership? No, you may not do that. It's not allowed. Can I ask why not? Because it's not allowed, she said again. Please go to our website at. I got it, I interrupted her. Thanks. Heading back to my truck, I got on my cell phone and filled out the form. Then I began looking for the model I was most interested in, and found that there was an SUV Lambo, which I had never known before. So, now I was interested in one of the cars and checked the box next to the Urus model. It can't hurt to check out a cool car while I'm here. Unlike some of my brothers, I hadn't gotten into car collecting. So far, I had my truck and had bought a Range Rover for Ruby. Adding a badass Lamborghini SUV would make a great start for the car collection. After submitting everything, I had to sit there and wait. An hour later, I got an email with the code to get into the place. I'd never been into any super fancy showroom before, and when I walked inside, I was stunned to find one car in the middle of the large room, the model I had put a checkmark beside on their website. A woman wearing a tight red leather pantsuit and the tallest high heels I'd ever seen strolled out toward me. You have chosen the Urus. This beautiful automobile comes in either a pearl version or a graphite version. The one we have here is the pearl version in Verde Mantis. But you will be able to get yours in any color you want. I can't have this one. I walked around the car, finding insane detail in the body. No. She opened the driver's side door. This one is for show. We will order one for you, manufactured to your specifications. Do you make many sales? I had no idea the process was so lengthy. I mean, I know you make sales. But how long will it take for me to get my car? If I buy one? This model can take anywhere from 6 months up to 18 months to get to you. This is a supercar, you know. And if you're willing to pay more, you can get the car faster once it's built. So, it can be over a year before I get my car. I was the type of person who wanted it like yesterday. It can be. If you don't want to pay for the car to be flown over from Italy, then it's shipped on a cargo ship. That is the cheaper route, but it takes longer. If you want a car like this right now, may I suggest you look at the used cars on our website? We have 10 of them right now. You know, I bet people drive the hell out of Lambos so used isn't a good idea. But waiting forever is also not cool with me. I had to have a reason to get to talk to the manager, and this was as good as any. You know what? Can you just get your manager for me? He's out today. You can speak with the assistant manager if you would like. But he won't tell you anything different than what I'm telling you. I didn't want to talk to anyone other than Logan. When will the manager be back? I would really like to talk to them about my concerns. He's out for the next two weeks. He took his vacation leave, and it began today. The process is the same at any Lamborghini dealership. I can assure you of that. If you really want this car, then we can go to my office, and I'll help you decide what you want on your own unique Urus. It's quite an exhilarating process that I'm sure you will enjoy. I bet I would like it too. But I'm not really into waiting that long. I'm impatient, I suppose. I walk toward the exit. Sorry to have wasted your time. Of course, sir. I hope we see you again in the future. Her high heels clicked as she stormed out of the showroom while I let myself out. I didn't know what to do now. I was sure Ruby wouldn't give me the jerk's address since she was so afraid of what he might do to us. But I needed to get to him to let him know that I wasn't about to let him mess things up for Ruby and me. Heading to work, I thought about what Logan had said about giving me a day or two to make up my mind about what I was going to do. So that meant he would be stalking me in the next day or so. That wasn't the way I wanted to go with this thing. I wanted to go to him so he would know that I was in charge of the situation. 
I wanted the upper hand. If he came to me, then it wouldn't feel that way. Casey pulled in, parking beside me. How's it going baby bro? Well there is some good news to report. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. Ruby said yes to my marriage proposal. He looked like he didn't believe me. She did. Yeah she did. And I'm not trying to kiss and tell, but we took our relationship way out of the friend zone. Like all the way out. Like we went all the way. I get it. He laughed as we headed inside. I didn't tell you that. You guessed. I got in a lot of hot water for telling you things that I didn't know would upset her so much. So, I'm trying to be more careful about what I say now. She's a really private person, as I'm finding out. But she's going to be getting help with her issues. I slapped my hand over my mouth. Damn it. I'm just going to act like I didn't hear you say that, Chance. And you should know that most women are very private, and only share things with someone they love and trust. You'll figure out what to keep to yourself, and what you can share with others. It's what comes along with having a happy marriage, knowing when to keep your mouth shut and when it's okay to talk. Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, if I had something like, let's say jock itch, and she went around telling people that I had this bad case of it and wouldn't go to the doctor, then I might get pissed off too. Exactly. He patted me on the back. You'll make a good husband. The main thing is to have love and trust, and you guys have that. Yeah. We have that going for us. I felt good about our relationship. Except for the Logan factor. But I still didn't want to tell anyone about her crazy ex's threats, which I regarded as idle. Hey, you watch the local news, right? I thought I could at least ask him one thing about that whole situation. Every night, he said. Why do you ask? Well, Ruby was telling me this story about a man named Robert Lopez who went missing. Oh yeah. That was like a year ago, but I remember it well. It was big news too. He was a loving husband and devoted father to three kids. The wife was hysterical when they couldn't find him. They found his car, eventually. It was found at the city dump ground, underneath a pile of trash. But he wasn't in the car. And no blood or anything like that was found in the car either. But his cell phone was in there, and his wallet. They reported that everything was still inside of it, ruling out that he was robbed. Did they have any leads on what happened to him? I thought the wallet and phone being left in the car was sort of odd. I think he'd been working as a porter at a car dealership here in Brownsville. The police interviewed the manager of that place to see if Robert had any problems with any of the other employees. And what did the manager say? He said that Robert was well liked by all at work and there had never been any trouble between their employees. Ruby had told me that there had been a physical altercation between Logan and Robert, and that Logan had a black eye and a busted lip at that time. Did they show the manager on the news? Not that I recall. I couldn't say much more. So they never found the man then? Not as far as I know. There was speculation that he'd gotten sideways with the cartel. He wasn't into drugs from what his wife said, but he may have borrowed some money from someone he shouldn't have. She told the cops that anyway. Not that it helped a thing. No one is ever found when the cartel is involved. Well that's a little scary. That whole day, while I was supposed to be working, I was busy wondering if Ruby was right about me not taking Logan's threats seriously. But what could I do? I couldn't give him the money, or he would just keep coming back for more. I wasn't going to give him Ruby. That was a no-go. So, I was stuck not knowing what the hell to do. Killing the man myself was an option. But it was an option that could land me in prison. And that would devastate not only me and Ruby, but my entire family as well. Hiring someone to kill him was another option. But I didn't know a hitman, and asking around to find one could also land me in prison. There just didn't seem to be a way to handle Logan. I've got to give him the money. There's no other way. Pulling 50 million in cash out of the bank wasn't going to work though. 
so I would make Logan a payment deal. He didn't want things to be legit, but I didn't see why it would hurt. I could draw up a contract that would make the transaction legitimate. Maybe hire him to do something for me, but in reality, he wouldn't do a thing. If I did that, then I would be able to take a tax break on the money I gave him too. It was a win-win in my book. But Logan would have to agree to it. And that meant that I needed to find him, to talk to him about my deal. All the way home that evening, my mind spun with what I could tell Logan when he came to me for my answer. I could let him find a house and I would buy it for him. I could set him up then begin making payments to him. Nothing insane, but something good enough that he would leave us alone. If I gave him the 50 million all at one time, he would spend it all then come back for more, leaving me with no choice but to give him more money. But this way, he would always have money coming in that he could count on, which should keep him out of our hair, and his threats would be over. Stopping at a red light, I saw a man selling red roses and waved him over. I'll take them all. I handed him a hundred dollar bill. His eyebrows shot up. Thanks dude. When I got home, I went to Ruby's bedroom and laid them out on her bed. Just then, I noticed that something didn't seem right about the room. The phone charger that she kept plugged into the base of the lamp on the nightstand was missing. Scanning the room, I also noticed that the robe that always hung on the back of the bathroom door was gone. So, I went to her closet. There, I didn't find anything at all. Everything was gone. Please tell me she did not go back to that creep just to keep me safe. Chapter 18 Ruby It wasn't easy to make the decision to leave Chance, but it was the right thing to do. If I hadn't brought Chance into this, then this wouldn't have even been happening. But I'd been the one to go to him, asking him to lie. It was all my fault and my mess to clean up. There was no way I could talk to Chance about my decision, as I was sure he wouldn't let me do what I needed to do. My plan wasn't to stay with Logan forever. It was a bit more devious than that. While at work, I'd been thinking of ways that I could end Logan's life without getting caught. A gunshot was likely to put me behind bars, so that way was out. Any physical harm had to be counted out. That left me with the age-old poison idea. Of course, it had to be a poison that could either be hidden or be accidental. Like accidentally dropping some cyanide into a pitcher of sweet tea and serving it to him. No, that would be way too obvious, and I don't know where to get my hands on cyanide. There was also Logan's drinking problem that I could work with. Adding some tasteless alcohol, like a 190-proof Everclear to his drinks, might be able to do the trick. Alcohol poisoning could be seen as an accidental overdose. The man did consume large amounts of alcohol at times. That idea wasn't that far-fetched. And the sooner I could get rid of Logan and end the threat of him having Chance killed, the faster I could get back to Chance and the great future we both were looking forward to. There just wasn't any other way. I knew it would be hard to leave Chance even if it was only for as long as it took me to get rid of Logan. Yet, I'd packed my things and put them into the car so that I could go straight to Logan once I got off work that night. I didn't want to leave a note for chance. If the note ever surfaced, I was afraid that it could be used against me when something happened to Logan. And I couldn't tell chance what I was going to do, or he would just come get me and keep me with him at all times so that I couldn't go through with my plan. I couldn't let that happen. I felt I had to do this if I ever wanted to have some semblance of a normal life ever again. It took a while for me to think about what I could do to let Chance know I would be back home and that my absence wasn't permanent. So I took the Range Rover instead of my old car that was parked in the garage. My hope was that he would know that if I really was leaving him, then I would have taken my old car and not the one he bought for me. I had left my engagement ring on his bedside table. I didn't want Logan to find it in my belongings and get rid of it. I could say the car was a gift and that my old car had been sold if Logan asked about that. He wasn't likely to get jealous over the car. I couldn't say the same about the engagement ring. 
You look like you're lost in your own little world, Ruby, Leslie said as she walked up. Blinking, I looked at her. I hadn't realized I was so out of it. I didn't get much sleep last night. That was true. Knowing that I was going to leave Chance had made me sort of ravenous to get as much of him as I could. So there had been little sleep for both of us during the night. I wouldn't be able to get much sleep either if I was you. Your man is H.O.T. She was right. And he was amazing in so many ways. But I had to do what I had to do to keep him alive. Yeah, he is the very best too. I swayed a little as I remembered some of the things we'd done in his huge bed. I don't think there's anything that man isn't great at. I bet. She wore a dreamy expression. I sure do bet. I had the feeling she was fantasizing about my man. And I didn't care for it, at all. Hey. She shook her head, as if ridding her mind of thoughts of a man who was not hers to be fantasizing about. Oh. What? What are you doing here? This was her day off. Oh. Yeah. That's why I came. My mom's birthday is on Friday, and my sisters want us all to go in on a special present for her. It's a cruise. My part is $500. So I need to make a bit extra. You've given me some of your shifts before. Can I have what's left of this shift too? Please. If I let her take over my shift, then I'd be that much closer to facing Logan. The thought didn't thrill me. But she did need money, and I needed to get this Logan situation dealt with. So I said sure. I'll clock out now so you can clock in. A few minutes later, I got into my car and glanced at my luggage in the back seat. I didn't like the way it looked, and I hated what it represented. Checking the time, I knew Chance wouldn't be leaving work for another half hour. I could beat him home if I wanted to. Scrapping the idea of taking someone's life seemed like the right thing to do. Chance and I could figure something out together. I didn't need to do this all on my own. I had a great guy, and I had to trust that together we could do anything. Even deal with a shithead like Logan. I needed to hurry, though. I wanted to stop by the store to pick up something good, to make a special dinner for my man. And then I had to get back to the house to put my ring back on, before he realized I'd taken it off. I didn't want him to know that I'd even thought about leaving him to go deal with Logan on my own. Laughing as I pulled out of the parking lot, I thought it must be sleep deprivation that had me making such insane decisions in the first place. I can't eliminate anyone. In a rush to get to the store and back home before Chance got there, I sped a little. That proved to be a mistake when I saw red and blue lights flashing behind me. Dang it. Reaching for my purse, I realized that I was able to move a lot more freely than usual, and that was when it hit me that I hadn't put my seatbelt on. So I grabbed it trying to get it on before the cop realized and gave me two tickets, one for speeding and one for no seatbelt. Damn it. Tap. Tap. I looked up and saw the officer was already standing there, looking at me with a frown. So I let go of the seatbelt knowing I had already been caught and rolled down the window. He was ready with his first question. Do you know why I stopped you? Sort of. I nodded. Yeah. I mean yes sir. I was going about five miles faster than I should have been going. I pointed at the seat belt. And I forget to put that on too. And you switched lanes without signaling. You also were driving too close to the car in front of you. Do you have a reason that you're driving so absent-mindedly? Yeah. I stayed up pretty much all night long with my fiancé. Something told me not to say that out loud though. I'm a little tired. Didn't get much sleep last night. I think that's why I'm kind of absent-minded right now. Plus, there's the fact that I've been thinking about how to get rid of a man all day long. I knew I really shouldn't say that out loud. You could have caused a wreck. You and others could have been seriously injured or even worse. If you're too tired to drive, then just don't do it. There are plenty of other options available. First, call someone you know to come and get you. Second, he said, 
and then cocked his head as he caught sight of the luggage that filled the back seat. Are you planning on going somewhere? Were you planning on taking a trip of some kind that would have you driving a long way? No. I didn't know what to say about what was in my back seat. Just moving my things into my boyfriend's house. We're moving in together this evening. It's sort of a romantic occasion for us, I lied. Is this his car that you're driving? Um, yeah. He pulled his dark aviator sunglasses down to look me in the eyes. And would you mind telling me his name? I felt like he was trying to catch me in a lie, so I told him the real name the car was registered under. Chance Duran. That's right. I ran the plates and the car came back to him. He crossed his arms across his chest, as if he was about to go off on a lecture that could take a long time. And I didn't have a long time. Can you please just do what you're going to do, sir? I've got to get to the store and then get home. It's really important. I wanted to be all unpacked by the time my boyfriend gets home. And I wanted to surprise him with a home-cooked meal. Pushing his sunglass back up to cover his eyes, he said, I'll try to make this as quick as I can. First, there are some questions I have to ask. Like, have you taken a driver's safety class in the last six months? No, I said quickly so he would hurry the hell up. What age were you when you obtained your driver's license? Sixteen. I reached over to get my purse. Want to see it? Hang on, he said. I haven't asked you to get anything yet. Please put your hands on the steering wheel and keep them there until I ask you to get something. Doing as he said, I nodded. Yes, sir. Sorry. If I were to search this car, would I find any drugs or drug-related items such as bongs, pipes, or lighters? No, sir, you would not find anything like that. I do not use drugs. Never have and never will. I looked at him with a grin. I promise. Next question. If I were to search this car, would I find any weapon? That includes firearms of any size and caliber of bullets, knives of any length, pipe bombs, hand grenades, shivs of any kind, lead pips that could be used to hit someone in a manner which could incapacitate them, or rope? No. But can I ask you about that rope? Do you have any in this vehicle? No, I do not. But how would one use rope to incapacitate someone? I'm not about to stand here and tell you how you can hurt someone. The same way I'm not going to stand here and tell you how using a lead pipe to hit someone over the head could hurt them. But you sort of just did do that, I pointed out, and then took my hands off the wheel while I shrugged my shoulders. Did I say to take your hands off the wheel, young lady? Slamming them back on the wheel, I shook my head. No sir, you did not. Sorry. By the time he got through asking me his questions and telling me how I could have died and killed others, it was time for Chance to get off work, and I knew that I would now have some explaining to do where he was concerned. Thank you for not giving me a ticket, sir. I really do appreciate it. I buckled my seatbelt, feeling drained and beyond tired, and then slowly drove away. I looked over at my purse that still sat in the passenger seat, unopened, as the officer had never asked to see my driver's license. My cell phone sat on top of it, and I thought about giving Chance a call to let him know that I would be home soon and not to freak out when he saw my ring sitting on his nightstand. When I looked up, I saw that I had nearly missed turning in at the grocery store. Quickly flicking on my blinker, I made the turn, then found a space and parked. I wasn't even sure what I was going to make for dinner as I got out of the car leaning back in to grab my phone and purse. I could call Chance while I was in the store to let him know that I'd explain everything when I got home. Suddenly I felt hands on my waist and then I was heaved up. Panic filled me, as I hadn't even been able to grab my phone or purse. I saw the blue sky and some white fluffy clouds and then I saw a car with the back door open and a man in the driver's seat. He had on a dark shirt and sunglasses. Someone carried me the short distance to the other car, and then I was shoved into the back seat. Screaming, I watched another man slam the door shut on my car and then he was in the back seat with me. Who are you? What do you want? Neither of them said one word as the car sped off with me in it. I wasn't going to go easily, though. 
So I reached out to punch the man who was in the back seat with me. Only I didn't get a punch in, as he grabbed my wrist then managed to grab my other one as well. Pulling some rope out of the pocket on the door, he then tied my hands together like some rodeo expert would to a calf. Now the cop asking me about rope in the car began to make sense. And being kidnapped began making sense too. Logan put you up to this. The man grabbed something else from the pocket on the door. It was a plastic bag with something white inside of it. Out of it, he pulled what looked like a regular washcloth and then covered my nose and mouth with it. In an instant, everything went black. Chapter 19 Chance I wasn't going to just sit there and not even try to call Ruby to tell her that not only did she not have to go back to Logan to save my life, but she better not go back to him for any reason at all. I called her cell and it rang and rang, but she didn't pick up. She was supposed to still be at work, so I called her there. Island Charters, this is Leslie. How can I help you? Leslie, this is Chance, Rubies. I didn't get to finish as she said, fiancé. I remember you. I was here when you and Ruby went out on that fishing trip of yours. How are you doing? Not that good, actually. I've been calling Ruby's cell, but she isn't answering. She's still at work, right? No. She left here at about 4.30. I asked her if I could take her shift, and she let me. She should be home by now, I would think. But maybe she's shopping or something. I wouldn't worry if I were you. Yeah, you're probably right. Thanks, Leslie. You're coming to our engagement party on Saturday, right? You know I am. I cannot wait. She told me you have a gorgeous beach house where y'all are throwing the party. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's gonna be rockin'. See you then. Thanks. I hung up, not feeling any better about the situation. I didn't want to tell anyone about Ruby's stuff being gone. I'd gotten myself in hot water when I told my brother about what she'd been through. I wasn't about to repeat that mistake again. At least now I knew that Ruby wasn't at work. I knew her things were gone. And I knew she hadn't answered her cell but it was just one call so I tried again. And when she didn't answer once more, I texted her saying that she needed to call me right away. And then I sent another text telling her that I knew what she was doing, and to forget about doing it, and come home. Then I sent 15 more texts after that, with various messages about coming home, and not being a martyr, and other things of that nature. I went to my bedroom to change into some workout clothes, because I had to do something to deal with the anxiety that filled me. Something shiny caught my eye, and I looked to find she'd left her engagement ring on the nightstand by the bed. Damn it. Picking it up, I took it to the safe with our wedding bands and put it with them to make sure nothing happened to it. Now I knew for certain that she was going to Logan. Otherwise, why would she have left the ring? The minutes kept passing, and I kept exercising trying to think of what I could do to find her. Finally, I thought about calling Leslie back to see if she knew where Logan lived. Island Charters. This is Leslie. How can I help you? Leslie, it's me Chance again. I know this sounds crazy, but she hasn't answered my calls and she hasn't come home. I don't know where she is but I have a guess, so I need to know if you know where her ex Logan lives. She is so not with him. I can promise you that. I'm sure she's just shopping, and maybe she forgot her phone in the car or something. It's been over two hours now since she left work. I don't think she's just out shopping. I had to tell her about Ruby taking her things. Look, we have a situation with Logan. He's made some threats against us both. She took all her things when she left to go to work this morning. I'm afraid she's gone to him so that he won't try to hurt me. No way, she whispered. She looked so happy today. I can't imagine that she would do that. But I get why you're freaking out. I'll try calling her too. That way, if she's just with him and not answering your calls, she might answer mine. Do you know where he lives? I asked again. I'll go see for myself if she's there. I don't know where he lives. 
She never stayed with him. I know where her old apartment is, but that's it. Okay. Well, if you can think of anyone who might know his address, please ask them and call me back. And if you hear from her, whether she asks you not to tell me or not, please let me know. I'm sort of about to fall apart over here not knowing a damn thing. I get it. I will most definitely let you know if I find out anything at all. Thank you. I heard absolutely nothing for the next few hours. At 10, I was about to go get in my truck to begin cruising every neighborhood I could find, looking for my Range Rover. I couldn't wait around any longer. Just as I started my truck, a call came in from a number I didn't recognize. Hello. Hello, this is Officer John Randall. I'm looking for Chance Duran. A cop. This can't be good. I'm Chance Duran. Your Range Rover is parked here at the General Grocery Store, and the manager called the station to report a car that needs to be moved before they close the store. It's their policy not to let people park here overnight. Are you available to come and pick it up? I'm on my way. My fiancé was driving that car today. Can you find out if she made it inside the store? She's not answering my calls. Well, that may be because her cell phone and purse are still in the car. It's locked too, so make sure you bring a spare key. It's odd, because I actually stopped this car earlier today, around 4.30. I didn't get the young lady's identification, as I just spoke with her about driving in a distracted manner. She said she was moving in with her boyfriend when I asked her about the suitcases she had in the back seat. From what I can see, they're still there too. But you said she's your fiancé. I got back out of the truck and returned inside to get my set of keys for the Range Rover. Yeah. Can you maybe see if you can get some sort of order to start searching for her? I'm pretty sure she's in trouble right now, and it's important that we find her as soon as possible. I see a camera up on the light pole. I'll go talk to the store manager to see if they have any footage with her in it. I'll most likely be inside when you get here. Make sure you come and find me. Or better yet, just call this number. I think a man named Logan Cuevas might have her. If you can find him, I'm sure you're going to find her. I'll see what I can find out. See you soon. Hurrying back out to my truck, I got in and took off to get to the store as fast as I could. Beyond frantic, the worst fears possible began creeping into my head. Ruby wouldn't have left her purse, phone, and everything she owned in the car. Unless Logan had told her to. But why would he do that? Is he going to kill her? Getting rid of her would be such a dumb thing to do. If he had her, then he had me under his control, and would definitely know that he could hold her for ransom. Ruby would know that I would break the bank, to get her away from him, and back in my arms. No. He won't kill her. He'll be calling me any time now, to tell me how much money he wants. I had to believe that. And I had to believe that Logan knew he had to keep her unharmed, or I wouldn't give him a nickel. That was all that kept me hanging on to my sanity knowing that she was alive and well, just waiting for me to pay that jerk some money so she could come back home to me. When I pulled up next to the Range Rover, I noticed a tow truck driving by slowly. The driver had on sunglasses even though it was dark outside. I watched him through the rearview mirror as he looked at the Range Rover. He stopped right behind it, and I got the idea that he was there to pick it up. But I knew the manager of the store hadn't called for it to be picked up since the cop had found me to come and get it first. There weren't but six cars in the parking lot, and I got the impression that those belonged to the employees working that night. When the tow truck began moving around so it could back up to the front of the Range Rover, I got out and stood in front of it with my hand up. Whoa! I saw the man's face as he looked at me through the large side mirror. Then he put it in drive and hauled ass out of the parking lot, wheels squealing and tires smoking. What's going on out here? I heard a man shout. When I turned my head, I saw an officer running out of the double glass doors at the entrance of the grocery store. I think that tow truck was sent to get my car. Not by the store, it wasn't. He said something on the radio he wore on his shoulder, and a few moments later, 
I heard sirens and saw a couple of police cars flying down the street after the tow truck. I've got a bad feeling about this. Me too. I thought about the car they'd found in the city dump when that Robert guy had gone missing. His wallet and phone had been left inside, only he was gone. Did you see anything on the footage? No. He put his hands on his hips as he looked up at the pole the security camera was on. The video equipment was disconnected for the parking lot cameras. The ones inside were still working, but I checked who came in and out of that store from 4.30 this afternoon until the last customer who left at 9.30. The girl I saw when I stopped this car wasn't any of those people. Do you think someone set this up? I couldn't see how that could be done. I don't know if she told anyone whether she was coming to this store or not. But I kind of doubt that she did. Did she come here a lot? Well maybe. I mean she often brought stuff home for dinner. But not every night. And she usually doesn't get off at 4.30 either. She normally gets off at 7. You mentioned the name Logan Cuevas, he said. Yeah. He's her ex and he's trouble. He's actually been stalking both of us recently. He caught me where I work, in her outside a nail salon that she had just been to. I don't know how he found out what kinds of cars we drive, but he definitely knew what to look for. He doesn't have a criminal record, so there was nothing to find out about him. I think she told me that he came here from Mexico. So, he might not be a United States citizen. He's the manager of the Lamborghini dealership here in Brownsville. I went there this morning, and they told me that he started a two-week vacation today. Has he made any threats? He looked me up and found that I've got money. So yeah, he's made threats. He told me that he wants $50 million in cash. If I didn't want to give him money, then I had to kick my fiancé out so that she would have nowhere to go but back to him, which is ridiculous. She's been living on her own for years now. She never did live with him. She's had a stable job ever since she graduated from high school. She didn't ever need him, and even if we did break up, she wouldn't have gone back to him anyway. She left him, walked out on him at their wedding. Ouch, she said. That's plenty enough reason for him to want revenge, isn't it? That's what he was getting at. He said he wanted me to pay him restitution, for her embarrassing him, when she left him at the altar in front of everyone he knew. Did you say that you would pay him anything? I told him that I wouldn't pay him a dime, and that I wouldn't send my fiancé to him either. But the thing is that I recently changed my mind about it, and wanted to find him, and tell him we could make a deal. So long as he left us alone for the rest of our lives. He nodded in understanding. We'll do anything for the women we love. We sure will. And I'll do anything to get her back. If he contacts me asking for money, I'm going to give it to him. She's worth more to me than anything I own. Well that's noble of you. But I hate to say that it's not often that things like that work out. We need to find this Logan guy. If she isn't with him, we can still bring him in for questioning to see if he'll tell us where she is. And you can press charges on him for stalking and the threats. You said he's from Mexico. Happen to know whereabouts? Ruby said he's from Matamoras. Then I pulled out my cell. That's the woman you need to be looking for. Ruby Salazar. I'll send you a current picture of her. I've got your number saved. Do that. Matamoras is a hotspot for some pretty bad shit in that country. He could be part of something that would make it very easy for him to make people disappear. If you get what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. Chapter 20 Ruby Waking with a dry mouth, a headache and feeling sick to my stomach, I noticed that the room I was in was moving. There was a rocking motion that never seemed to end, and it made my head spin as I turned over on what felt like a bed. Opening my eyes proved difficult, but I finally got them open and saw a low ceiling above me. Sounds began to drift in, lapping water, blowing wind, and someone whistling a tune from close by. Slowly I sat up, feeling like I might throw up if I moved too fast. 
It took me a few minutes to figure out that I was on a boat. I'd been put in the cabin, but I could see from the little window by the bed that it was dark outside. Tiny lights ran around the tops of the walls, keeping the little cabin dimly lit. My head pounded. I leaned over and rested my head in my hands. I'd never been so thirsty in my life. And I couldn't even remember how I got there. Inhaling and exhaling, I smelled the salty air and knew that we were pretty far out, since I heard no seagulls. Pulling my head out of my hands, I looked around, finding a small door that I was sure led to a bathroom. I had to hold onto the wall for fear I would fall, as my legs shook with each step I took toward the door. When I opened it, I was relieved to find that it was a bathroom, and in I went. Turning on the faucet, I splashed cool water on my face. I found the light switch and turned it on. My hair was a mess. My eyes were bloodshot. I looked like complete hell. Cupping my hands, I filled them with water then gulped it down, trying to quench the terrible thirst. As I drank, short bursts of scenes began to hit my mind. A car with the back door open. The driver wearing sunglasses and a dark shirt. A white washcloth. And then nothing. Running my wet hands over my hair to smooth it out, I looked out of the door then up the stairs that led to the deck. Whoever had taken me had to be up there. Using the bathroom while I had the chance to, I tried to gather my strength and courage to face whoever was awaiting me. I wasn't sure if I preferred to deal with Logan or someone else. It wasn't like Logan had a soft spot for me. But dealing with someone who didn't know me at all might be even worse. Whoever it was, he hadn't tied me up to keep me in the cabin. Plus the door had been left open, so I felt free to move about. Taking a few deep breaths, I went up the stairs to find someone sitting at the back of the boat. The darkness kept the identity hidden, as there was no light on. Letting my eyes adjust to the moonless darkness, I finally began to see enough to take a step away from the cabin's entrance. The floor creaked under my weight, making me freeze in place. I see you've woken up, Ruby. It was Logan's voice. What are you doing, Logan? I asked warily. Fishing. What else would I be doing out here in the deep waters of the Gulf? Why did you bring me out here? I had a few ideas, none of them good. I hoped they were all wrong. Why do you think, Ruby? Nausea made me quiver as bile moved up my throat. I swallowed hard, knowing I had to get my strength back fast. It's funny that you had me picked up, because I was going to go and see you, actually. I wanted him to think that Chance was going to do one of the things he'd said he wanted. Chance told me to go back to you. He said that when I got back to you, you would tell me why he sent me to you. I find that really hard to believe. It's the truth. I had all my things in the car with me. You can ask whoever you sent after me if what I'm saying is true. I'm not going to ask anyone anything. I changed my mind about what I want anyway. I didn't know what he meant by that. He obviously still wanted me, so he could have his revenge. You don't want Chance's money? He told you about that too. He turned the chair to face me, swiveling it around. See, I find that odd, Ruby. I don't think you're being honest with me. Why would he tell you that I wanted money from him, or that I wanted him to send you back to me? He doesn't seem like the kind of man who would do that. I mean, what would you think of him if he said he wasn't going to give me any money at all, and that he would give me you instead? My brain wasn't working well yet. Logan, I really was going to come back to you. Okay, it wasn't because Chance told me to. I was going to do it on my own. I don't want him hurt. So I was going to give myself to you, just the way you wanted. He wasn't going to give you money. I knew you would go through with your threats if you didn't get the money or me. So I was coming to you myself. You thought that would please me? I hoped it would. But you had people pick me up. So what does that mean? I knew it meant something. From the corner of my eye, I saw a thin line on the horizon and realized the sun was about to rise. I'd been missing the whole night and knew that chance must be devastated. I told everyone I know, 
including my mother, that you and I had reconciled and that the wedding was back on. You'd come to me, asked for my forgiveness and I graciously gave it to you. I wasn't sure I liked that, for so many reasons. I can't imagine that anyone you know, especially your mother, was happy to hear that you took me back. On the contrary. I explained in detail how unstable your mental health is. I told them that you had agreed to get the help you needed, and I said that as long as you wanted help, we had a chance at happiness. It made me look like a hero. So the wedding is back on then? I asked, unsure of anything at that point. No. Okay. I saw more and more colors beginning to fill the horizon, making the deck of the boat easier to see. I went to take a seat, feeling weak in the knees. So much uncertainty wasn't easy for me to take. Is Chance safe? I honestly don't give two shits about him. He didn't come after you. You went after him. I have no reason to have beef with the man. Plus he's too important to disappear without causing a stir, and my people don't like things to be stirred. That made me feel relieved. Whatever Logan was a part of, had nixed his idea of doing any harm to Chance. I hadn't ever thought that Chance's high profile and money might stop Logan from going through with his threats. So, blackmailing Chance wasn't something they wanted you to do either. I was getting closer to understanding why he'd had me kidnapped. No Duran is to be touched or messed with in any way. I didn't know that. But now I do. They are pretty important to people, for their innovative energy ideas, if for nothing else. While I was happy that Chance was off-limits for Logan, I knew that I wasn't. And that made fear start to bubble up inside of me. Since I can't do anything about him, I decided I would do something about you. Logan, look, we can work things out. I really can marry you. I know what you want, and I can be that woman for you. You said it yourself, people think you're a hero for taking me back since I've got mental problems. I can play along. I just had to make it off the boat alive. At that moment, I would have said anything I thought would get him to take me back to shore. I don't want you, Ruby. You've stepped on my heart enough, and that's all I'm ever going to allow you to do. As if you have a heart, you son of a gun. What do you want? I hated to even ask that question, because I was pretty sure I knew the answer. And I wasn't going to like it. You put me through hell, so I want to send you to hell where you belong. Yeah, that's what I thought. Without moving my head, I began scanning the deck to find anything I could use as a weapon against him. Wanna tell me how you plan to do that, Logan? I would love to tell you about that. He turned back around and got up, then went to a ten-gallon bucket and opened its lid. I smelled the chum from where I sat. Do tell, Logan. I'm all ears. He scooped some out with a large cup, then tossed the chunks of rotting fish mixed with blood into the water. You and I are on a fishing excursion. We wanted to have some fun, since we're starting over. The sun's rays began to peek up from the water, as if it rose straight out of it. Although gorgeous, I prayed that it would not be the last sunrise I would ever see. The sound of a boat coming had me looking in that direction. It zipped along toward some fishing spot and would be driving right past us. Logan looked at me with his lips pulled in a thin line. You had better not do anything to make them think you're not perfectly safe and having the time of your life, Ruby. Nodding, I knew better than to scream for help. I'm not stupid. He took a seat as I stood. Can I get that other fishing pole to make it look right? Go ahead. The boat got closer and closer, and then I recognized it as one of the charter boats from our fleet. I didn't say a thing about it, since Logan had never taken a real interest in my work. He had no idea which boats were ours or who I worked with. With a big wave I shouted, have a great day. Y'all too, one of the guests on deck shouted back as they moved past us. Thanks, Logan said, his eyes on me and only on me. I was thankful for that because since he was looking at me, he didn't see the captain of the boat and one of the crew members looking at me. I waved at them. Have a safe trip, I shouted to them. They looked stunned as they waved back at me but said nothing. 
I prayed that they would tell someone they'd seen me. I was supposed to be at work that morning, and I was sure it had caused a stink when I hadn't shown up. Logan tossed out some more chum, watching the water as he sat back down. We're fishing for sharks this morning. Sharks were best fished for at night. And from what I saw of the things he had on deck, he didn't even have the right gear to fish for them. With no wire leader, he wasn't going to catch any shark, no matter what size it was. And I didn't see a single circle hook, either. If he did catch one, it would get off the regular fish hook he had on the pole. I don't see how. You don't have the right stuff. Well, I'm not really trying to catch one. I'm just trying to get them to come around the boat. Chills ran down my spine as I sat down hard on the seat nearest to me. I see. I could read the writing on the wall. Yes. I'm going to whip them into a feeding frenzy. That should be something to watch. I knew he didn't just want to watch them eat the chum he was dishing out. Logan, you loved me once. And you tore my heart out of my chest, bit off a chunk out of it, and then tossed it into the trash. Leaving him at the altar may have been the biggest mistake of my entire life. No, that's not true. My biggest mistake was going on that first date with him. I can fix it all. I promise you that I can fix it. You can dump me in front of everyone. I'll pay for the whole wedding, and you can walk out of there with a couple of girls on each arm. You can humiliate me any way you want. I don't care about doing that anymore. The way I see it, I'm not allowed to get rid of your boyfriend. And I'm not okay with you having some great life. If I take you back to the shore alive, you will get to Duran any way you can. And my chance to end you will be long gone. This is it. My one shot. And I'm taking it. Logan, this is crazy. Think about what you're doing. Chance is going to know that you're behind my disappearance. He won't stop until you're dead or in prison. And if your group won't let you touch him, he's going to be able to get to you. No one is going to stop him. I just want you to think about these things before you do something that's going to cost you your life. Why, he asked. You sure as hell didn't think about what you've been doing, costing your own life. Being killed by sharks probably isn't even that bad. I doubt you'll feel a thing. I didn't want to die, pain or no pain. But I was pretty damn sure that it would be quite painful to be eaten alive by sharks. I'm not going to let you do this to me. He laughed. Me? Do something to you? Oh heavens no. You're going to trip and fall overboard, my dear. And then I will rush back to the shore asking for help, crying my eyes out, screaming your name. It's going to be so dramatic and tragic. Your name and pictures are probably going to be on the local news channels this very evening. Won't that be something? And Chance doesn't even watch the news. Chapter 21 Chance the night had been like something out of a nightmare. I had to get one of the employees from the store to drive the Range Rover home. Then I had to take them back to the store, all the while hoping that the police were making some headway in finding Logan. I didn't want to admit to myself that the wrecker showing up to take the car Ruby had been driving was a very bad sign of what had happened to her. In my head, I kept replaying the conversation Casey and I had had about the missing man and how they'd found his car. She cannot be dead. Unsure of what to do next, I drove around, looking for anything at all. I just couldn't go back home. Not without Ruby. So I drove and drove, and not long after the sun came up, I ended up at the docks where she worked. There was no way she'd made it in to work, but I did wonder if she'd been able to call in. Just knowing she had called would mean she was alive, and I needed to know that. I had to keep up hope, but it was hard as hell to do that when Logan was involved. And I knew without a single doubt that he was behind her disappearance. The first thing I noticed was that the blue canopy they worked under wasn't there. Then a man came out of the nearby building, looking around with an angry expression on his face. I took a guess that it was Ruby's boss and got out of the truck. Hey. I'm looking for Ruby Salazar. Do you happen to know her? Yeah, I know her. 
And she's in some hot water, I can tell you that. She's supposed to be here, working. She didn't show up, and she won't answer my calls. I've just about had it with her. Jogging up to him, I tried to smooth out his obviously ruffled feathers. I'm her fiancé, Chance Duran. Oh? You're the guy everyone is talking about around here. He reached out to shake my hand. It's nice to meet you. I'm Steve, the owner of this business and Ruby's boss. He looked confused as we shook hands. You're here, so I'm guessing that you don't know where she is either. She never came home yesterday. I found her car abandoned in a grocery store parking lot. Her phone and purse were still inside of it. I decided not to say anything about the luggage that was in the back seat. The police are looking for her. I forgot to tell them that she worked here, so I thought I would check this place out for myself. Yeah, well, she's not here. And like I said before, she's not answering her phone. But now I know that's because she doesn't have it. This seems bad to me. He grabbed a blue box and carried it to the front of the dock. You mind helping me set up this canopy? It'll only take a minute if we both do it. Yeah, I can help. It wasn't like I had anything else to do. If Ruby wasn't there, she wasn't there. I hadn't really expected her to be. It was just something to do, a place to go to look for her. I'm trying not to go out of my mind with her missing like this. But it's not easy. To tell the truth, I'm feeling pretty bad about how mad I've been at her, since I had to come in early to get our guests on the morning charters. I can't tell you how many times I've shouted that I'm going to fire her since I got here this morning. To find out she's missing is really messing me up. Did you know her ex? No. I don't think anyone here really knew him. It was pretty bad when she was with him. She didn't come to work, except sporadically. He was always surprising her with unexpected getaways that she never seemed to turn down. In her defense, she told me that he almost never told her what they were going to do. So, I can see where she might have thought their date would only last a few hours, only to find out it was some trip that would take days. I helped him put the canopy up, then tied the top down so it wouldn't get blown away. Yeah, she would tell me that when she would call in. She always called in, giving me plenty of time to get someone to take over her shift. I got so tired of doing it that I told her to deal with finding someone to take her shift on her own, and to leave me the hell out of it. I got pretty sick of never knowing if she was going to be here, or not. But I didn't want to let her go. She's a good kid. She just got caught up in a bad relationship. Being with him really did a number on her. It changed her. I was glad when she said it was over. If you don't mind me asking, why didn't you fire her? She told me herself that she'd missed so much work when she was with that jerk. That guy never took care of her. She never moved in with him or him with her. She had bills to pay. And from what she told me, he didn't help her with any of them. I never could understand what that guy was thinking when he kept her from coming to work. If he wasn't going to pay her bills or move her in with him, then he needed to let her work and not jeopardize her job. Anyone else would have fired her. But I didn't. I let her work as much as she could. I didn't want to see her fail. She came here fresh out of high school. Up until she got started with him, she was one of my best employees. And after their breakup, she was right back in that top position again. She loves her job here. I knew she did. I just hope we find her and get her back to this. You and me both. I'm not gonna be able to rest until she's found. He walked back to the building he'd come out of. I've gotta get things set up. People will be coming soon to sign up for the afternoon charters. Leslie is gonna come in, but it'll take her a bit because she has to get ready. I'd love your help if you've got time. I'm not doing anything, and helping you out would help me stay busy and keep my mind from wandering off to some very bad places. I bet. Damn this shit is rough. I'm getting more and more worried by the minute. He pointed at the laptop computer that sat on a table. Can you get that and put it on that tall desk out there? I'll grab the brochure stand and get it out there too. 
Doing the things Ruby usually did when she came to work made me feel closer to her somehow. Maybe it was because I was touching things she'd touched. Maybe because I was talking to someone she'd talked to. Whatever it was, it made me feel closer to her. Most of the time, the smell of salty ocean water, the slightly sticky cool morning breeze, and the sounds of water lapping against the wooden beams that held the docks in place calmed me. But not this morning. My gut seemed to be in a permanent twist. My head ached, and it was for more than just lack of sleep. My cell rang, but I didn't recognize the number that was calling. I prayed Ruby had gotten to some phone and that this was her. Hello, I said quickly. This is the Brownsville Police Department. I'm looking for Chance Duran. Maybe they found her. This is he. I'm a dispatcher here. The officer in charge of the case of the missing person, Ruby Salazar, asked me to get more information from you. He wants the phone numbers and addresses of any family members she might be with. And he wants to speak with her parents, if that's possible. Also, he'd like information on any close friends that she has, so that he can get in touch with them before the news comes out. The bottom felt like it was dropping out from under me. She's going to be on the news? Only if we can let those who care about her know of her situation. If we can get her picture on television, we have a better chance of someone seeing her, or someone who has seen her recently, reporting to us. If you could hurry, the faster we make the calls, the faster we can get her picture out there. I didn't have the numbers. But I did have her phone. I'll get them and call you back. I'd put her phone inside her purse and left it in my truck. So I ran over to it and got it, but I didn't know the code to get the thing unlocked. Heading back to where Steve was, I asked, you wouldn't happen to know the code Ruby uses on her phone, would you? I don't know that, but I do know the code she uses to get onto this computer. You could try it. It's 9695. He messed with fixing the brochures in the stand while I tried the code and found that it did work. Yes. You're a lifesaver. The cops want to be able to contact her family and any close friends to let them know about her disappearance before they give the story to the news to help us find her faster. He went back inside then came out with a pen and a notebook. Here you go. Write them all down. I hadn't thought about doing that. I'll make sure all the employees here know about what's going on too, so the news doesn't blow them out of the water. He got on his cell making calls to the people who worked with Ruby, while I wrote down the most important phone numbers and addresses in her contact list. Thankfully she kept great records, making it easy for me. I didn't want another night to go by without knowing if she was alive or not. Even if that good-for-nothing just contacted me to tell me he was holding her for ransom, I would feel better. I needed to know that she was still alive, and there was still a chance of bringing her back home. After calling the police station and giving them what they needed, I felt the slightest bit of relief. Steve put his phone away as he said, I called everyone I could to tell them about her and to ask if anyone had seen or heard from her. No one has. I'll tell the boat crews when they come in, which will be within the next half hour. Giving this kind of news isn't easy. It's like the words coming out of my mouth make it all too real to me. I know what you're talking about. I haven't told my family yet. It's like I've got this hope that I'll find her before anyone else has to worry the way I am right now. This is all so hard. Like, in every way possible. I agree. I've never had to deal with someone who I actually know and care about going missing. It's impossible to describe how horrible it feels. The not knowing if she's okay or not is odd. It's like, well, we don't know for sure if she's dead. So that's good. But we also don't know if she's alive, and that's bad. Yeah. Exactly like that. You don't know whether to be mourning a loss or not. And my mind doesn't want to go to that place, but it keeps ending up there. I hate it. I want to believe with all my heart that she's alive, and that she will be found. But there's this nagging voice in my head, telling me that she's never coming back, and I may never know what happened to her. We can't think like that, he said. Let's stay positive. That's easier said than done. 
She kept telling me that her ex was part of a dangerous group of people. I didn't heed her warning. He made threats against us both, but I didn't take them seriously. He wanted money from me, and I should have just given it to him, no matter how ridiculous the amount was. It's just money. And now he has her because I didn't listen to her. I know I was wrong, and I know Logan has her. And I don't know what he'll do to her. Steve stared at the ground as he said, that man wasn't a good person. I had my suspicions about him, from the beginning. Especially when Ruby told me about how he would take her to do things that men who run auto dealerships don't have the money to do. Yeah, I have my suspicions that he launders money for some pretty dangerous people. And I told him what I thought too. Maybe I went too far. I mean obviously I went too far. If anything happens to her, I will never forgive myself. I saw the charter boats as they came into the marina. Steve's shoulders sagged. Now to deliver this sad news to more people. I really hate this. I hate that this is happening to her. She's got such a good heart. That jerk had already squashed her. If he hurts her anymore, he will have to deal with some very angry men. You don't have to worry about her ex. He'll get what's coming to him. The boats pulled up to their spaces along the dock, and the crews tied them off before coming ashore. One of the men came up to Steve. I wondered why you were working this morning, boss. I didn't know you gave Ruby the day off. I didn't give her the day off, Steve told him. Then why is she out there on a boat with that guy she was gonna marry, but walked out on? Steve and I looked at each other with dropped jaws. Can you take me to where you saw them? I asked. It's a matter of life and death. I'll call the authorities, Steve called out as I took off running. Please God, let her still be alive. Chapter 22 Ruby Mental torture was Logan's forte, so I had no idea why it kept surprising me when he would talk about my impending death like it was something he could be proud of. You should be thanking me, really. I mean, if you died of natural causes, then no one would care. People would care, Logan. He could be so callous. A few people would care, maybe. Your parents would care, and possibly even your siblings. But lots of people will be so upset by your death, once I tell the authorities about how you fell over the side of this boat and into a pack of sharks. When I tell them how they ripped you limb from limb. I mean, you'll have the entire world feeling terrible about your untimely and grisly demise. I didn't want to even think about being ripped apart by hungry sharks. So I had to come up with something that would make my life important to him. You know what would really be good for you is if you throw buckets of water over both of us until we're drenched. Then we go back to shore and tell a different story instead of the one that leaves me dead. You can say I fell overboard into the knot of frenzied sharks, but you heroically jumped in, punching the sharks to make them get away from me. Then you saved me, and got me and yourself safely back into the boat. That would be a newsworthy story too. Yes, it would be a newsworthy story and I would come off as a hero. But you're forgetting one very important detail. I will not sit back and watch you have a great life. He tossed in some more chum but there were no fins penetrating the ever-rolling surface yet. I had to come up with more. You're not thinking about the big picture. If I marry Chance, then I'll have access to his money. Your people may have told you that Chance can't be touched. But what about me? I could give you money. He laughed and looked at me like I was stupid. Ruby, if you marry that man, then the people I do business with will add you to the untouchables list. Sometimes, well most of the time, you can be so clueless. There really is no other way than this one. You should just accept your fate and be done with it. Accept the fate of being eaten by sharks? I had to laugh. You really are crazy. The one thing I had going for me, was that he hadn't managed to draw in even one shark yet. And what if this plan fails? What if no sharks come and you run out of chum? Then what? You can still fall overboard, you know. You would drown, eventually. We're too far out for you to swim to the shore. You know, 
I have to wonder why you didn't just toss me into the water while I was still knocked out. That would have been so much easier for you. You're like one of those super villains who set up something so elaborate that it takes too much time to kill the good guy who ends up getting away. A smirk formed on his thin lips. For your information, you still had the chloroform in your system at that time. If I had thrown you into the ocean and your body was found, they might have been able to trace that in your system, which could have been bad for me. I know your boyfriend will try to blame me for your death. I'm prepared for that. But there won't be any evidence that will point to taking someone's life. It will all point to a very tragic accident for a couple who had just reconciled and were going to get married. Chance isn't going to believe you. I had to say that, but there was the fact that I'd left my ring on his nightstand and taken all my things from the house. But then again, there was the car that had been left in the parking lot, and Chance may have been able to find it. If he'd done that, he would know that I was missing and hadn't simply run back to Logan. Once he finds my car, he won't find your car, Ruby. We're not a bunch of amateurs. Your car was picked up and taken far away. He will never find that car or anything that was left behind inside of it. That information dashed my hopes almost entirely. Without the abandoned car, Chance would think I really left him. He might be so hurt that he wouldn't even bother to look for me. I laid back in the chair, closing my eyes so the sun wouldn't blind me. I could tell by the position of the sun that it was getting closer to noon. I hadn't seen any of our charter boats since the one that had passed us earlier that morning. There was a chance I would see another one when they took off at four to go out on the evening fishing trips. But I had no idea if I would still be alive by then. I was supposed to be at work, so I knew Steve would have been trying to call me to see where the hell I was. And he was a loud man who shouted a lot when he was pissed. So it made sense that the people I worked with would know that I was supposed to be at work. I could only hope that once they spotted me, they would have to ask what the hell I was doing out there instead of working. It was kind of a good thing that Logan had never paid attention to my job. This way, he had no idea that he'd taken me to possibly the worst place possible if he didn't want anyone to get in the way of his plot to kill me. At least, I hoped that someone would get in his way. There was a chance that the guys who had seen me that morning would go back and tell Steve they'd seen me. If I knew Steve, he would most likely send them back out to bring me to him so that I could explain why I thought I didn't need to let anyone know that I wouldn't be at work that morning. I had never not called in when I wasn't going to be able to make a shift. And I always had someone lined up to go in for me. I was extremely reliable in that sense. So me being out on a boat fishing when I was supposed to be at work would seem way out of character for me. But Logan hadn't thought about that. In Logan's eyes, I had no character. He didn't see me as anything other than simple-minded, dull, incapable of making decent conversation, and dim-witted. In reality, I was none of those things. I was smart, and I had to start thinking smart if I wanted to get off that boat alive. I wanted to get back to Chance more than anything. We had a life to build together. Determination began to take over where worry and fear had taken root before. I will get off this boat alive. There had to be something on the boat that I could use to knock Logan over the head with. The lead pipe idea the cop had unintentionally given me cropped up, and I scanned the deck, looking for anything heavy enough that could do some damage. When I didn't find anything, I got up. I'm going down to the cabin to use the bathroom. He tossed in another cup of chum while shrugging. Go ahead. Searching through everything in the bathroom and the cabin, I came up empty. The people he was involved with must have owned the boat, and they'd probably made sure there was nothing on the boat that their victims could use as weapons. I looked at the blanket on the bed and wondered if I could throw it over Logan so that he wouldn't see anything. With him incapacitated like that, maybe I could push him overboard, start the engines, and speed away. Of course, once I got to the shore, I would tell the authorities what I'd done, and they could send out a boat to look for him. Logan was actively planning on killing me. So, 
It didn't bother me a bit to think about leaving him in the ocean to live or die. At least I was giving him a 50-50 shot at living. That's more than he wanted to give me. Before I came running out of the cabin with the blanket, I needed to be sure the key was in the ignition. So I went back up on deck, glancing in the direction of the steering wheel and found no key hanging from the switch. I looked at Logan but didn't see it on him, so I guessed it was most likely in the pocket of his shorts, which made my plan not so good after all. Taking a seat, I tried to keep thinking about what I could say or do to get myself out of the situation. One idea popped into my head about squirting something into Logan's eyes. While he tried to wipe them I would search his pockets, find the keys, push him overboard then speed away. Is there any sunscreen? He laughed. You're afraid of getting sunburned, Ruby? I'm sure the sharks will appreciate your taste even more if the sun cooks you a bit before I serve you up for breakfast. So is that a no to the sunscreen then? I asked. You didn't bring any? I didn't bring any. I didn't think it would take this long to get sharks to come to the boat. A thought occurred to me about the fact that there would be an investigation, no matter what Logan told the cops about my little accident. You know that you don't have anything on this boat that's specifically made for catching sharks. That's going to look suspicious on your part if you tell the cops that we were out here fishing for sharks. He looked at me for a long moment, obviously trying to figure out if I was right or not. It seemed I had him wondering if his plan was well thought out, so I added, and we have nothing on board that makes it look like we came ready to spend the day either. No ice chest with drinks and snacks in it. No sunscreen. None of the things people normally take out on a fishing trip. I'll just tell them that we weren't planning on making a day out of it. We just wanted to do a little fishing in the morning before it got too hot, and then we were going to head back in. And as for the things we need to catch sharks, I'll just say that we didn't know what things we would need. But I do know what things we would need. And there are quite a few people who know that about me. My father for one. Pretty much all the crew members who work on the fishing charter boats know that about me too. My boss. Chance. How are you going to explain that? I don't have to say that we were out here fishing for sharks. I can say that we just wanted to get out on the water for a bit this morning, and you had an accident. He smiled as he tossed in another cup of chum. You're not going to scare me, Ruby. I can make up a plausible reason why we were out here. Like, we wanted to do it while floating on the water. That should really hit your boyfriend while he's down. I like that. Yes, I think I'll use that as the reason for why we came out here. And the reason you're tossing chum into the water to draw in sharks. I was sure he didn't realize how many holes there were going to be in his story. Do you really think you're going to like prison? I mean, you have to know that this could end up with you behind bars. Is it worth that to you? Is my death that important to you? I'm not going to end up in prison. My people will make sure of that. I can simply leave this country and go back to Mexico. I do have the connections to make it so that it looks as if I have disappeared. He tossed in more chum, smiling away like he knew what the hell he was doing. You know, I thought about eliminating you myself. Sure you did. He laughed, as if the idea of me eliminating him was utterly ridiculous. No, really I did. Chance didn't think you were really dangerous. And I was afraid that you would hurt him, or worse, harm him. So, I was going to go to you yesterday as a matter of fact. I was going to go back to you, and I was going to eliminate you. Well, isn't that interesting? Then maybe I can say that you did come back to me. And you wanted to come out on the water. I borrowed this boat from a friend and out we came. You began to get physical with me, pushing and shoving me, trying to throw me overboard. I reacted and, in self-defense, knocked you out of the boat. When I started the boat to drive around and pick you back up, I didn't see you. Not anywhere. And then I saw a large fin, but I never saw you again. I never told anyone what I was thinking. I was going to go home to chance and forget I had ever had those thoughts. 
So, you would have one hell of a time proving that I wanted to kill you. Plus, you would have to explain why I would even want you dead. Throwing my head back, I laughed. You haven't even thought about the fact that Chance will tell the authorities about the extortion and the threats you made to both of us. The cops will take you straight to jail. Even without that, you know ex-boyfriends are always one of the prime suspects when a woman goes missing. You won't get the chance to run away. We will see about that. He went to toss in some more chum, and I saw a smile move over his lips. Ah, hello there, little buddy. It's nice to finally see you. Looking around the boat, I saw three sets of fins moving in. It's too late. Chapter 23 Chance All the guests had gotten off the boat as I rushed onto it with the crew member who'd brought great news. He was now running right behind me. Bob, do a quick fill-up of gas. We have to get right back out there to find Ruby. This guy says it's a matter of life and death. The captain came around the side, looking at me with his one good eye, a black patch covering the other one. And who is this guy? I'm Chance Duran, Ruby's fiancé. She's been kidnapped. This guy said y'all saw her this morning while you were out. That guy is Ralph, and I'm Captain Mike. And we did see her. She seemed fine. She is not fine. I'm not sure what that guy has planned for her, but I guarantee it's not anything good. We have to find her. And we have to do it as fast as we possibly can. I knew she didn't want to be out there with Logan. I told you that wasn't like her to skip work without even letting anyone know what she was doing Cap. Ralph ran around, quickly untying the boat from the dock. The one he'd called Bob shouted, filled up. Captain Mike looked a little uneasy about heading back out. They were drifting when we saw them. They could be anywhere by now. That was hours ago. We have to try, I said. Please. That man cannot be trusted. She did leave him at the altar cap, Bob reminded him. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Well, let's go see what we can find. Mind you, fiancé, if we find your girl in a compromising position, I don't want you losing your cool and doing something I'll regret. That's not going to happen. I stood next to the wheel as the captain got ready to take off. What kinds of weapons do you have on board? Ralph was quick to grab a long curved spear. We've got all sorts of things that we can use. Don't you worry. If that guy has hurt Ruby, we'll make sure he pays for it. As we headed out of the cove to get to the open water, I couldn't help myself and asked the captain, so, what happened to your eye? Did you lose it? A seagull hit me in the face last year while I was driving my jet ski. It knocked the sunglasses right off my face and pecked my eye out. Holy shit. I had no idea that could even happen. He raised the patch to show me the black hole that was left. Mind yourself when you're out on the water. You never know what might happen to you. Bob pointed to a chunk that was missing from the back of his leg. A shark took that bit out of me when we brought it on deck. Oh my. I couldn't believe their horror stories. Looking Ralph over, I saw nothing missing on him. You've made it so far without any scars, huh, Ralph? He made an X over his heart. Joni Armstrong. She stole my heart in third grade. This isn't the time for jokes, the captain growled. Ralph ducked his head, embarrassment flushing his cheeks. Sorry. I'm not offended, I let him know. I've been living on pure adrenaline and drama since about five o'clock yesterday evening. A little laughter is a welcome distraction for me. Is that because it was the last time you saw Ruby? Bob asked. No. But it was when I got home and found she wasn't there. And after that, I found that she wasn't answering her phone. Not long after, I got a call from the police that her car was left in a parking lot at a grocery store. When I got there I found her purse, cell phone and car keys still inside the locked car. The police haven't been able to track down her ex, Logan. And now you guys have told me that she's with him, on a boat, drifting in the Gulf of Mexico. So still more drama and lots of anxiety, coupled with the most adrenaline my body has ever produced. 
When you tell me all that, I do believe she was kidnapped, the captain said, and brought the speed of the boat way up. I hung onto the bar above my head as we sped out to sea. But I had more hope than I'd ever had about finding Ruby alive. They'd seen her alive only a few hours earlier. She could still be breathing. She was smart. I knew she would tell Logan anything she could think of to keep herself alive. How did she look when you saw her? I shouted so they could hear me, above the roaring motor, and the sound of water crashing against the hull of the boat. Just fine, Ralph shouted back. She waved at us and said for us to have a great day and a nice fishing trip. She did look a little stiff though, Captain Mike commented. But I thought that was because we'd caught her playing hooky from work. The man with her seemed calm. He sat at the back of the boat. He'd been putting chum into the water. I saw the red scum on the surface as we went by them. Ralph added, Ruby had a fishing pole and I saw another one lying near that guy's feet. They could have been about to start fishing, but it was obvious that they hadn't started yet. So maybe they'd just gotten there. Not that it mattered much. She'd been gone all night long. For all I knew, he'd had her out on that boat not long after she was taken from the parking lot at the store. But she looked okay. She looked fine, the captain said. I would have stopped had she looked out of sorts. That's exactly why I wasn't keen on taking you to find her. I thought she wanted to be there. But now, I'm remembering this look she had in her eyes. She was squinting. I'm wondering now where her sunglasses were. We always have them with us, since our job is outdoors. It was early. But the sun was already up. Ruby wears hers a lot though. I've rarely seen her without them on. They were in her car too. It bothered me that Logan didn't let her take anything at all with her. That told me his intentions for her didn't count for her needing anything again. Not her phone. Nothing from inside of her purse. And not even her sunglasses. I shivered as a chill ran through me. He didn't let her take a damn thing. He just snatched her up and they disappeared. Up until a few minutes ago, I had no idea where I could begin to even look for her. I have to find her. Bob nodded, gesturing to a boat that was moving in behind us. And it looks like we're going to have help finding her too. Check it out, that's the Coast Guard coming up behind us. Smiling, I felt even more hope than I had before. I saw another boat streaming through the water, going in a different direction. Three people on board had binoculars, searching in three different directions. Ralph shouted, it's Captain Jack's crew. They're looking for Ruby too. More and more boats joined the search. It seemed that island charters had sent their whole fleet out to look for Ruby. With so many people joining the search, my hope began to soar. Are there any binoculars on board? I asked. Ralph walked away then came back with two pairs. Here you go. I'll take the starboard side and you take the port. Um, which side is the port side? He pointed to the left, and I went to stand at the very front of the boat, looking in the left direction. Ralph went to the back of the boat, looking along the right side. Together, we had it covered, and with the captain having a general idea about where Ruby might be, I felt that we had things as covered as they could get. Hold on, baby. The posse is coming. An hour turned to two, and hope began to slip. When four hours had gone by, I lost a little more hope. By now, Logan could have done whatever he'd planned to do to her and gone back to the shore. What's that over there? Bob asked. The sun's in my eyes but I see a trail in the sky up there. The captain turned to go toward it. It looks like someone has shot off a flare. Let's go and check it out. Bob looked at me, shaking his head. Try not to get your hopes up man. It could be someone with a problem, like they've run out of gas. Nodding, I knew better than to think Logan would be setting off a flare. He was trying not to be noticed. A flare gets you noticed. The Coast Guard's boat put on the speed, zooming across the calm waters to get to whoever had set off the flare. I had to face the fact that they would be leaving the search to deal with whatever the flare shooters had going on. Using the binoculars, I looked in the direction the flare had come from and spotted a boat. 
I see the boat that shot the flare. I also saw a lot of white in the water, which was odd because the water was making fairly gentle rolls and not waves. But there was all sorts of splashing going on at the back of the boat. Ralph? Hey Ralph, check this out. I pointed in the direction he needed to look as he ran up to me. What do you think all that splashing by that boat is? Pulling the binoculars up to his eyes, he didn't take long to answer. See the fins? I looked harder, and sure enough, I saw fins moving around the outer edge of all the turmoil in the middle. Sharks? A feeding frenzy, he said. It's a pretty big one, too. And I don't see anyone on deck. The closer we got, the more I could see. The blood in the water became evident. Gosh. How much chum did those people use? The better question, the captain said, is why is there's no one on deck? And then there's the question of who shot off the flare. Plus, why did they shoot off the flare in the first place? The closer we got, the more my adrenaline began rushing through my body and brain. Hope began to build again. But overall else, fear that we may have been just a little too late to save Ruby filled me in a way nothing ever had. Ralph sucked in his breath. God help us all. That's the boat we saw Ruby on this morning. My knees buckled. My gut wrenched. I felt like I was going to pass out. No. Please God please let her be alive. Ralph turned as pale as a ghost as he said in almost a whisper, he was throwing chum in the water when we went by them this morning. I knew we were thinking the same horrifying thing. I couldn't even speak. It felt like my throat was closing up. My heart didn't seem to be beating. A fog began to cloud my brain. I was shutting down. I was literally losing the ability to function at a frighteningly rapid speed. The Coast Guard boat got there first and came up beside the other boat. I watched as a couple of men jumped from their boat to the one I now knew for certain Ruby had been on that very morning. Please God. Let her be alive. I couldn't imagine why the boat was still there if Logan had thrown her to the sharks. The terrifying scene that kept playing out inside my head just could not possibly be true. He wouldn't have stayed, waiting for someone to come and find him. And a flare had been set off too. They're taking a stretcher onto the boat, Bob said. Does that mean someone's alive? Praying that was what it meant, I couldn't pull my eyes off the boat as we got close enough that I no longer needed them. They can't move a dead body for investigation reasons, Ralph said. So someone is alive. And there's only one stretcher, so the other person isn't alive. Not blinking before I saw two guys carrying the stretcher off the boat, I quickly put the binoculars against my eyes. Oh God. Ralph looked through his two. Hallelujah. It's Ruby, the captain asked. It's Ruby. I shouted as I jumped up and down, pumping my fist into the air. Three minutes later, we pulled alongside the Coast Guard. Hey there, the captain said to the man who came to see what we wanted. We've got that young woman's fiancé. He's been awful worried about his girl. Let me guess, the guy said. Chance right? Yes, I said. I'm Chance Duran. She asked for you the moment she opened her eyes. Permission to come aboard, Chance Duran. They had her inside, and I saw her weak smile the moment I walked in. Am I Corazon, she whispered hoarsely. They'd already hooked her up to an IV, and had oxygen going for her. I kissed her forehead. My love, my life, my reason for living. I'm so glad to see you. He was going to throw me to the sharks. Her sun-cracked lips pulled up to one side. There was quite the struggle between us, but guess who won out in the end? He's gone, I said, then kissed her lips softly. You have battled your dragon and won. It was touch and go there for a while. I kept seeing your amazingly handsome face and felt your unending love for me. It made me fight harder. My little warrior. I kissed her again. I knew you had it in you. I knew he would never be able to extinguish that light inside of you. Do you still want to share the rest of our lives together? She coughed a little, and I looked at the medic who was watching over her. Should she be talking? Just a little bit longer. She will need her rest. 
but I'm actually interested in knowing what her answer is. With a nod, Ruby answered my question, I do. We will see our happily ever after, after all. Epilogue Ruby One year later You ready for tomorrow? Chance asked me as he came into our bedroom, taking his shirt off as he came toward the bed. I'd come to bed before him and was already lying under the blanket. I'm not the one you should be asking about that. Your mother's the one who's got too much on her plate tomorrow. She's made it super easy for me to just get dressed, walk down the aisle toward you, then say my vows and get kissed by my handsome prince. I mean, are you ready to become my wife? He dropped his pants before hopping into bed. Do you think we're going to feel any different after we say our vows than we feel right now? I'd been wondering about that. I mean, you've seen couples before marriage and after marriage. It's like they transform into sort of boring, responsible adults. I don't want to transform. I don't want you to transform either. I like us just the way we are. So you're not ready to get married, he said, followed by a long sigh. I didn't say that. I said that I don't want us to transform. I want to be your wife. I just don't want us to sprint forward to living in a rut. You're afraid we're going to get complacent with our relationship. He laughed then tickled my sides a little, making me laugh too. Don't worry. I'm not going to stop wanting to make you smile, girl. I love that smile. It does things to my heart that I didn't know it was capable of. Like makes it flip and melt and other things for which there just aren't any words. You're the sweetest. And I shouldn't even be thinking about how other couples are. We're different, you and I. We've got lots of history. We know how to evolve together. But if I begin to get stagnant, I want you to point that out to me and help me shake it back up. And I'll do the same for you. I want to always feel the sparks when you touch me. I never want that to fade away. He ran his hand over my shoulder. Like this. Just like that. He left twinkling trails behind on my skin that radiated into my body, helping to ignite the fire that always flickered within, a fire meant only for him. Our wedding had been a year in the making, and it was going to be off the charts. But it wouldn't be that day that would make Chance and I a permanent thing. The day he had brought an armada to rescue me was the day we had become one. No one could come between us. Nothing could separate us. No doubt was left about how he felt about me or how I felt about him. Loving him and knowing that he loved me had kept me fighting. Our love had kept me alive. It was stronger than I knew a shared emotion could be. When I'd been awakened by nightmares in the nights that followed my near-death ordeal, Chance was always right there, holding me, comforting me, telling me that I was with him and that I was safe. Tomorrow night, we'll be making love as a married couple, he whispered. You will be Mrs. Chance Duran in less than 24 hours. A lot came with holding that name. I would go from being a woman who'd never made more than $30,000 a year to a billionaire. As such, I had given my two weeks' notice at work, and that day had been my very last. The people I had worked with meant more to me than most co-workers mean to each other. They dropped everything to come searching for me. I owed them my life. Leaving work for the last time wasn't easy. But I knew I wasn't ever leaving those people behind. They would be my friends for the rest of my life. Good people stick together, and they were up there with the best of them. Chance moved his body over mine, and when we connected it was as if lighting ran through us both. When we made love, we went to another place in those moments. We soared so high that at times it felt like we would never come down. Like we could ride that high forever. I wanted our marriage to be a great one. But I wasn't putting pressure on myself or chance to have a perfect marriage. Perfection wasn't real. It couldn't exist for long at all. I'd stopped thinking of chance as perfect. I'd seen his flaws. For one, he could not remember to close the toilet lid after he was done using it. The man was thoughtful in so many ways, but when it came to that, he didn't have a thought in his mind. 
Too many times, I'd fallen in toilet when I went to the bathroom at night, in the dark. After the third time, I began to laugh about it and started checking the seat before I sat down. He also snored when he slept on his back. But all I had to do was gently turn him onto his side, and that took care of it. He had so many good things about him, that I had to let the few annoying things go. We all have flaws, even those of us who seem perfect. I wasn't looking for perfection. I just wanted a lifetime of happiness with the man I loved and knew, without a shred of doubt, loved me too. Chance We lived in a beach town, so a beach wedding was a must. My mother had outdone herself with the decorations. Our guests sat in white chairs as I stood under a white arch, decorated with real seashells that Ruby and I had gathered on the beach throughout the last year, just for this occasion. In a nearby trailer that was out of sight, hidden behind a wall of flowers, my bride was being fixed up to come and meet me on the sand so we could make our love official. My groomsman and myself had donned black tuxedos but wore no shoes. The maid of honor took her place, ready to begin the process of getting my bride to me. On her cue, the high school orchestra began playing the song Ruby had chosen for her bridesmaids to walk down the aisle to Breath of Life, a song she'd heard when we watched a movie one night. She loved the lyrics. She loved the power of the orchestra and the powerful voice of the woman who sang it. Ruby had found her power again, and with the knowledge that she was stronger than she knew possible, her light had reignited. The women who'd come that day to stand with her, supporting her decision, to become my wife, walked stoically down the sea-blue carpet wearing dresses that were light and airy, reminding me of something fairies would wear. They too wore no shoes, as they left white rose petals behind them for my bride to tread on when she came to me. The high school choir began singing, I was looking for a breath of life. A little touch of heavenly light. But all the choirs in my head sang no. To get a dream of life again. A little vision of the start and the end. But all the choirs in my head sang no. Those words meant something to Ruby. The song sort of told her tale. By the number of our guests dabbing their eyes, I knew they'd understood what she had wanted them to. She'd gone through some stuff but she'd come out on top. The girls took their places, all of us waiting for Ruby to come down and join us. With the song over, the orchestra moved on to the song Ruby had chosen for her to walk down the aisle to. Amazed by Lone Star had never sounded more beautiful as the orchestra played and the choir sang, Every time our eyes meet. This feeling inside me is almost more than I can take. Baby, when you touch me, I can feel how much you love me, and it just blows me away. I've never been this close to anyone or anything. I can hear your thoughts, I can see your dreams. I don't know how you do what you do. I'm so in love with you. It just keeps getting better. I want to spend the rest of my life with you by my side. Forever and ever. Ruby and her father appeared at the end of the carpet, and she took her first step toward me and our future together. The choir sang on, every little thing that you do. Baby, I'm amazed by you. And I was amazed by her. White satin flowed like waves down her body, covering her bare feet. Delicate white lace outlined the plunging neckline. Gorgeous wasn't a good enough word for what I saw coming my way. Slowly she came to me. Her father put her hand in mine. Take good care of her, son. I promise you that I will. I looked at her, unshed tears shining in her eyes. Baby, I'm amazed by you too. A smile curved her ruby red lips. Thank you. We turned to face the minister and said the words that bound us together, until death do us part. And then we headed into the hotel where the party of the century had been set up, waiting for our arrival. We'd booked the entire hotel. One so our guests could drink all they wanted and then go upstairs and crash without any real crashing happening. And two, so we could all enjoy the brunch buffet the following morning. I did love that buffet. Toasts were made, silly dances were danced, and then it was time to open the presents. Ruby had told me about the sunrise she'd seen that morning on the boat, when her life had been in jeopardy. She had said that it was the most beautiful sunrise she'd ever seen, and she had prayed that it wouldn't be her last. Ruby had loved her job working for the charter boat service. 
So, I wanted her to be able to still live that life. Just with much more style. Handing her the large white envelope with a red ribbon tied around it, I stood in front of her as she sat in a chair, looking confused about what I could have gotten her that could be stuffed into an envelope. Chance this is so mysterious. What can it be? Open it and see. She took her sweet time getting the ribbon off, then unclasping the little metal clasp that held it closed. I hope you haven't gone overboard. Funny you should say that. I waited for her to pull out the picture that was inside. You got me a picture of a beautiful yacht. She smiled. And the name of it is Another Sunrise. Nice. I couldn't help but laugh. She was just so sweet. I didn't just get you that picture. Take a closer look at the scene you see there. She looked it over then nodded. It's at the marina. Hey, that's Captain Jack's fishing boat beside it. Looking at me with confusion riddling her face, she added, You're going to have to spell this out for me. The yacht is yours. Her eyes went back to the insanely grand boat in the picture. Get out. There's more. It's the first yacht in your fleet, business owner. Island Sunrise Cruises can become whatever you want it to be since you own it. High-end, upscale boating tours that cater to not only the rich, but to anyone you choose to cater to. It's all up to you, honey. I'm a business owner? She shook her head. No way. You've got to go to the bank to give them your signature, since I've set up a business account with the funds you'll need to get your venture up and running in no time. You're giving me the yacht and money. She wiped a tear off her cheek that had managed to escape. All I got you was an antique sterling silver flask off Amazon. I really didn't know what to get the man who has everything. Your gift giving will get better with time. I have noticed that you would rather spend the money you make rather than use the credit card I gave you. That's why I gave you something that you can make big money with. So, you'll be able to build financial security for yourself. I want you to not just feel secure. I want you to be secure in every way possible. Standing up she threw her arms around me. I'm glad that you really get me. I love you so much. I know you do. And I love you too. I want you to know that I will always have your back. And I'll have yours too. She smiled at me, doing that thing only she could do to me with such a simple gesture. When I walked down the aisle to you, Every word they sang were words I've wanted to say to you. It really does feel like the first time, every time. I agree. I adore the smell of your skin and the taste of your kiss. And the way your whisper in the dark turns me into a puddle of desire. A chill ran through me. It does. With a slow nod she went on, you do touch every place in my heart. You do that to me too. I leaned in as I watched her eyes moving to look at my mouth. You've done very big things for me. Like rallying everyone to come and save me. But every little thing that you do has made me so in love with you. It really keeps getting better and better. And it will keep getting better. I'll never stop trying. I'll never stop wanting to see more smiles than frowns on your face. I'll never get tired of hearing your laughter. Your happiness means everything to me. I know it does. You make me happy, Chance Duran. You make me happy too, Ruby Duran. I couldn't believe how unbelievable saying my last name after hers felt on my tongue. Ruby Duran. Mrs. Duran. My wife. I laughed. I can't wait to introduce you to people. Hello, this is my wife, Ruby Duran. You're silly. She leaned in closer. I like that about you, hubby. You are amazing. I like that about you, wife. Our mouths finally met, the kiss telling us both that this was always meant to be. We were meant to spend our happily ever after together, from the moment she smiled at me in that kindergarten classroom. And that was that. The End Sneak peek for the Forbidden Sitter a Billionaire Holiday Romance, Nightclub Sins 1 Chapter 1 Gannon The first day of November, 
and a chilly wind tore through our fair city of Los Angeles at 10 in the morning. The first cold front of the fall season had arrived, bringing with it an enthusiasm for change. I stood, looking out the floor-to-ceiling windows of my 15th floor office. In the distance the waves coming in off the Pacific Ocean took my attention, as I waited for my personal assistant, Janine Lee, to let me know when my video conference was up and going. My job was CEO of Forrester Industries, a business passed down to me by my father. He'd inherited the company from his father, and had turned it from a million-dollar company to a billion-dollar one. Was I born with a silver spoon in my mouth? That would be a yes. I had never known hardships, poverty, or the feeling of going to bed hungry. I had only known the world of the super-rich. A world where you asked for something and you got it. And it all happened very quickly. Maybe all that instant gratification wasn't healthy for me, because I was impatiently waiting for the first time in my life. At 30, some might say I hadn't even begun to live my life yet, but waiting for my dream to be built felt like an eternity to me. At a prestigious nightclub in Vegas one night a few months ago, I met a couple of fellow billionaires at Hakkasan, a nightclub for the extremely wealthy. One could blow a hundred grand with ease at the place. And it was there that a plan was hatched to build a nightclub comparable to that one. Hakkasan was number one on the top 10 chart of high-status nightclubs around the world. The men I met that night wanted to build something even better than that. And right here in LA, the place we all called home, coincidentally. It took us no time to find a place and get construction going on the club. Currently, we were bantering about the name of the place, hence the conference I was waiting for. We were at the stage where the name was necessary, to order insignia and other things that would carry the nightclub's name on them. I turned away from the window as my office door opened. There stood Janine, all four feet five inches of her. Her short hair hung in dark black silky strands around her round face. Thick framed glasses housed her chocolate eyes. One hand on her hip, she jerked her head in gesture. Mr. Forrester, your Skype conference is up in the conference room. August Harlow and Nixon Slaughter are ready and waiting for you, sir. Excellent. I strode across my large office, following her to the room at the end of the hallway. Do you think you could find me a coffee this morning? Something that says fall is here. I'm on it, boss. She flipped her hair and turned, heading off to find what I'd asked for. The woman was amazing. At nearly 40, she was adept at making things happen for those she worked for. I was lucky enough to have found her when her old boss had passed away a few years back. She and I had something in common, we found out, as we accidentally met at the funeral home where her boss memorial was taking place and where my father's body had just arrived. It was in the hallway that we both went for the same box of tissues. And in that tragic moment, we found each other. She told me about her boss and her lack of a job as a personal assistant. I told her about how I was, now, with the loss of my father, the CEO of a large business and could use a personal assistant. And in that sad moment, a partnership was made that would make us both feel better about life in general after suffering from our losses. My mother had passed on several years prior to my father. Breast cancer took her from us. Being an only child, my father's death left me utterly alone in the world, something I wasn't real crazy about being. But with Janine's appearance right at the time I felt the most alone I'd ever felt, came hope. Perhaps things wouldn't always feel the way they did at that time. One day, things would get better. One day, I wouldn't be the only member of the Forrester family. Or so I hoped anyway. Not that I was looking for a wife or anything. I was a bit on the busy side to be doing that. But once I had things the way I wanted them, the nightclub included, then I would slow down and find time to date more and find Miss Wright. Instead of what I had been doing, settling for Miss Wright now. Currently, I wasn't even messing with Miss Wright now. I was involved in my work as the CEO and my work with the club. There just wasn't time for anything else. Stepping into the conference room, I found my partner's faces on two of the large screens that ran in a circle around the room. Some conferences for the business took up all seven screens at once. We were global, after all. August and Nixon greeted me with wide smiles as I came in and took a seat. Morning, gentlemen. 
and I do use that term lightly, I joked. August smirked. So the time has come for us to put our bickering behind us and agree on a name for this nightclub. Nixon picked up, let the record show, I like the name Club X. I threw down, and I've told you before, that name is much too common. Yes, August agreed. But Gannon, you have yet to come up with a name. You've shot down all the ones we've come up with though. So I am throwing you into the middle of this debate and challenging you to come up with a name on the fly, so to speak. You have one minute. What? I looked back and forth at the screens, finding two earnest faces. I'm not that creative. You guys are. You're wasting time, Gannon, Nixon reminded me. August's arched brow told me he was completely serious as he looked at his watch. The time is ticking away. 30 seconds, Gannon, or we're sticking with Club X. No. Wait, give me one more minute, I'm terrible under pressure. I pinched the bridge of my nose as I tried to inject some creativity into my business brain. August wasn't giving in and was not about to give me any more time. Nope, no extra time and we're coming in on 10, 9. One word popped into my head and I blurted it out, swank. I looked back and forth at my partners and was shocked to see smiles curling their lips. August nodded. I like it. Nixon chuckled. Me too. Swank it is then. He looked at August through the other screen. Seems we've had a productive meeting, August. Time to get back to our real jobs. Catch you guys later in the week. Nixon out. The screen with his face on it went black. August gave me a nod. Back to work, buddy. Let's get together on Friday evening for dinner and drinks. You got it. I had to laugh as he ended the call. My friends knew I worked best under pressure and they were, as always, expert manipulators. Walking out of the conference room, I heard Janine arguing with another woman. No, you may not go looking for Mr. Forrester, miss. Out of my way, you midget. I headed in the direction I heard the voices coming from and found my assistant trying her best to stop a tall, skinny redhead with a small boy at her side. He huddled against her leg, eyes wide with dismay at the shouting. The irate woman's dark brown eyes caught mine. Gannon Forrester, there you are. And you are? I inquired, giving the boy what I hoped was a reassuring smile. Not that I knew the first thing about kids. Surprisingly, he ducked his head shyly and then looked back up, offering a sweet gap tooth grin. The woman cleared her throat impatiently. Cassandra Harrington. Surely you remember me. Her thin lips pulled into a smile. Club Acapulco on the strip? Not a clue. I had the feeling I didn't want to talk to the woman in the hallway with so many people's ears leaning our way. Would you mind stepping into my office, Mrs. Harrington? Miss? And that's where I wanted to talk to you at in the first place, but this little troll. I took her by the arm and ushered her and the little boy into my office. The way she shoved the kid forward like he was a sack of flour irked me for some reason. As I closed the door behind us, I rolled my eyes apologetically at Janine and she winked, ever unperturbed. Her husband was a lucky man and he knew it. I turned back to Miss Harris and watched as her face twisted in what looked like disgust as she let the boy go and gave him a nudge, really more like a shove away. Stop clinging. Gannon, this is Braden Michael Forrester. Your son. My brain froze. My eyes shot straight to the little boy. He hovered uncertainly between the woman, his mother, presumably, poor kid, and my desk, before picking up courage. Walking around my desk and briefly disappearing, his tiny body dwarfed by its huge breadth and height, he reappeared moments later climbed up in my office chair. Leaning back in it, he kicked his feet and spun in a circle. Something tugged at my heartstrings, and let me tell you, up until then, I didn't know I had heartstrings. Gannon, the harpy snapped. Did you hear me? I refocused my attention from the boy onto Cassandra, even as he began to play with my stapler. My automatic instinct was to take it from him, so he didn't staple his little fingers. Which was bizarre, because, since when did I have automatic instincts when it came to anything except women and business? Still buying time, I offered Braden a box of paper clips in exchange for the high-powered electric stapler, and liked when he didn't fuss at all switching gears seamlessly to playing with the colorful, little metal clips. 
Gannon. Cassandra finally exploded. Yes, he was a really nice kid. But he wasn't mine. That, I knew for sure. I didn't know this crazy woman. Look lady, I informed her coolly and calmly. I don't know you. Oh but you do. Her snarl transformed into an equally unpleasant smirk, stretching her thin lips into a wide rictus. You and I went back to my place after drinking too much at that club that night, a little under three years ago. I ended up pregnant, something I didn't bother you with for nearly three years. Your son is too, just so you know. And I've done all of the mothering I care to. I want out. I'm not cut out to be a mother. As she spat the words at me, I couldn't help but marvel at how utterly unattractive she was in every way, way beyond just her witch-like exterior. Her voice was like nails on a chalkboard. I'd heard the expression, but had never actually seen it come to life until just now. For some reason, the bombshell she dropped kept getting replaced with other thoughts. Maybe I was avoiding it. Or maybe I just couldn't believe I would have had anything to do with a shrew. I had a type when I looked for female company. A very, very specific type that was more personality-based than physically-based, honestly. Gorgeous was hot, but fun to spend a long evening with was even better, and she didn't fit it in the slightest. I don't know you, I repeated. And he's not mine. Cassandra didn't even notice that the kid was reaching for scissors, or if she did, she didn't care. I cut him off at the pass, and handed him a stack of post-its instead. Aggravated, she snarled, I don't care if you believe me. I just wanted to let you know you have a kid, and I can't do this anymore. He's yours or social services. Choose. Now. Wait. What? For the second time that day, I was being forced into an instant decision, but this time the stakes were infinitely higher. Social services? I echoed in disbelief, grateful that the boy was clueless about what he was hearing as he giggled and decorated himself with sticky papers. What the hell is wrong with you? He's your child. And yours, she retorted. I'm not mother material. Are you listening to me at all, Gannon Forrester? I'm tired of talking. I'll just take the kid and dump him on social services doorstep. I can see you're not going to be a father to him. She started toward the boy, who dropped his newfound papers toys and shrank back into his seat. I felt a jolt of electricity shoot through me. Hey, wait a minute. I stepped in front of her and the desk. The words that came out of my mouth didn't even sound like mine. Listen, give me time to get a DNA test done. If he's mine, then I want him. Wait, what did I just say? One week. You have one week and that is it, Gannon Forrester. She stalked around me, picked up the boy, whose big eyes were suddenly filled with tears, and left my office in such haste that I had to run to catch up to her. I need your phone number and address. I grabbed a notepad off Janine's desk and a pen as I hurried after her. She stopped then and dumped Braden, that was his name right, on top of the desk while she scribbled those things down on the paper. As she scrawled, pressing hard enough to undoubtedly indent the whole notepad, I hesitantly leaned in to check on the toddler. His dark hair did look a lot like mine, but plenty of kids had dark hair. And his wide blue eyes gleaming with unshed tears, well, they kind of looked like what I saw in the mirror first thing every day, but still, just, not a possibility. Hey buddy. I smiled at him, and handed him a fresh pad of post-its, these far more colorful than the ones from my own office. How are you doing? Braden sniffed and smiled back shyly his pudgy little hand scrubbing across his eyes in a way that made those newly discovered heartstrings twang once again. Shoving the paper and pen back in my hands, Cassandra picked Braden up like a sack of potatoes. He can't talk, you idiot. He's only two. Stifling my anger, I straightened. I think toddlers can usually talk. Mum just used to say that by the end of the evening, she'd have no ears left from my chatter. Well, he's stupid. Cassandra informed me, and it was all I could do to keep from reaching out and wringing her scrawny neck. I better hear from you, by the end of the week, or it's off to foster care for your son. And with that, she left my office with my potential son looking forlornly over her shoulder, one small hand stretched out to me. Chapter 2 Brooke 
The first day of November had a chilly breeze washing over our city of Los Angeles. Wearing a light sweater over my t-shirt and blue jeans, I was ready for autumn to take over for a while, leaving the heat of summer behind us. My heels clicked along the sidewalk as I made my way to meet my brother Brad, for lunch at Pitfire, a pizza joint my brother and I loved. A whistle caught my attention, and I looked around to find Brad getting out of his brand new Lambo, the fire engine red exterior, sure to capture everyone's attention. Hey show off. His hand ran over the hood of the car as he made his way to me. You like my newest ride baby sis? It's awfully bright. Did you really have to go all out and get fire engine red Brad? I crossed my arms as I stood there, looking at the high dollar piece of machinery. My brother had struck it rich when he went to work for Forrester Industries, right out of college. From there he jumped off into his own business venture, procuring investments overseas for wealthy people. Brad came up to me, holding out his arms for a hug, which I gave him. That's not fire engine red little sis, it's called Rosso Mars, and that particular model is an Aventador Coupe. Fancy. I kissed his whisker-covered cheek. So you're sporting a beard now? How fashionably progressive of you. But it needs more conditioner, it tickles my lips. His eyebrows wiggled as he grinned. That's what she said. I punched him in the arm. E-W-W. Nasty. I didn't mean anything dirty by it, kid. He looped his arm through mine, leading me into the eatery. Get your mind out of the gutter. I rolled my eyes and leaned into him, not about to say I'd missed him while away at college, even though I had. After being seated in what used to be our usual booth, and ordering a blistered cherry tomato pizza and some root beers, my brother and I started catching up. I had been away, staying in the dorms at Berkeley for the last year. With my first year of college behind me, I was excited about my future and the new semester that I was a couple of months into. Brad had been gone all summer, having to work overseas, and had only been back a couple of weeks. He told me he was eager to talk to me and find out how my schooling was going. So how did you like your first year? I loved it Brad. I informed him, over a mouthful of lusciously buttery breadstick. Um. I miss these. I mean, I knew I would love it. But it's even better than I thought. The teachers, the campus, just, everything is amazing. And the classes. They're all theory right now, but I'm more convinced than ever that teaching little ones is where I want to be. No surprise there. What were you when you first started babysitting? 3. The tiny wrinkles that etched the sides of his grin reminded me that he was in his early 30s. That age group of people who had kids, even though he didn't have a wife and kids yet, himself. No 7. I watched Lainey Bradshaw down the street while her mum took piano lessons in the next room. Our conversation was briefly interrupted as our drinks arrived. He gave the waitress a nod as his eyes roamed up and down her body. Thanks. He leaned forward, steepling his fingers while resting his elbows on the table, obviously trying to look distinguished. You doing okay this afternoon? He looked at her name tag that was strategically pinned just above her left breast. Megan? Gag me with a spoon. I groaned, kicking him hard under the table. Her pretty green eyes lit up as she smiled at my brother. I'm doing fine. You. Pretty damn good. He winked at her. Thanks, sweetie. With a tiny wave and flushed cheeks, she left us alone as he watched her go. I rolled my eyes. Some things never change. So Brad. Have any of your friends had kids since I left? I've missed working with kids who aren't just textbook studies. And I want to try out some of the things I've learned. None of my close friends have kids, kiddo. Sorry. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a set of car keys. I have a surprise for you. No way, I mumbled, staring at his palm without touching the silvery keys. Brad? Brad only had the most badass automobiles. He'd given everyone in the family one of his used ones at one time or another. Brad's used cars weren't like normal ones. Bentleys, Mercedes, Beamers, you name the expensive car, he had owned one or more at one time or another, and my big brother had always been generous with his hand-me-downs around his friends. 
He jingled the keys playfully. Say please. Brad, I repeated, just as our pizza arrived and we had to wait till everything was settled in front of us. When Megan sauntered away, I turned back to my brother. Tell me you didn't. He placed the keys in my outstretched palm. You need transportation now that you're back here. Taxis eat up way too much spare cash. You are now the proud new owner of a gently used Carpathian Grey, Jaguar F-Type. Automatically, my fingers snapped shut around the keys. Even so, I had to protest. I mean, how did it look for a brother, even one as wealthy as mine, to be doling out $100,000 cars to his sister? I was no mooch. You really shouldn't have. I mean it, Brad. And I can't even promise to pay you back, because that would take me 5,000 years on a teacher's salary. He winked. I'll figure out some way for you to repay me. Lifting a dripping cheesy slice he dug in, grinning around his huge bite. A little in a daze, I got up and hugged him hard before sitting back down. You are crazy, I informed him, reaching for my own slice. But thank you. Wow. Thank you thank you thank you. And don't even start about insurance and crap. I'll find a way to pay for it. I had no idea how but I would I promised myself. Chapter 3 Gannon Only three days after having the DNA test done on the little boy, I held the envelope in my hand. Janine was by my side in my office as I pulled out the sheet of paper that would either change my entire world or leave me free. Before you read it, tell me what you're hoping for, Mr. Forrester. I'd been turning it over in my head ever since the skank had stalked in and out of my office in less than five minutes steamrollering my day and leaving my mouth close to hanging with her news. That he's mine. It wasn't that I wanted the responsibility of a kid. Far from it. But Cassandra had been such an obviously awful mother. And Brayden looked like such a nice kid. He deserved better. Way better. With a nod, Janine placed her hand on my shoulder. Then I'll pray that way for you, sir. Closing my eyes, I finished pulling the paper out, then I opened it, wanting to surprise myself. 99%. I blinked, and felt the strangest shifting in my newly discovered heart. He's mine. We remained in silence for a long moment, as I stared blankly at the page full of cryptic scientific info, with two bolder words standing out above everything. Probability of paternity, 99%. I have a kid, I whispered. Congratulations, Daddy. Janine squeezed my shoulder. I know it's not what you expected, but you'll be a great father, Mr. Forrester. Father. The fact that the word now applied to me didn't feel even close to sinking in. Janine. I cleared my throat and sat back. Get my lawyer on the phone and let him know to proceed with the custody paperwork. I want it today so I can take it to her when I pick up my son. Son? Oh God. I'm a father. Janine touched my shoulder once again and started for the door. I'll get on that right away. After she left, I sat in dumb silence for who knows how long before I took out my cell and made the call. Finally, she answered. Well, what do you want? I received the results. She didn't bother to let me finish. He's your son. Yes, he is. I had to put my cell down on the desk and press the speaker button. My head was aching and spinning with the news. I was both happy and deathly afraid at the same time. I don't know one damn thing about kids. Then come get him. I'm a father. And she's his mother. Jeez. Cassandra, aren't you going to miss him at all? I demanded. How can you treat a kid that way? Any kid. Much less your own. When will you be here? She replied without answering. I'll have him ready to go. Shock had me numb inside. As if on autopilot, I moved forward with the horrible conversation. My lawyer is drawing up papers you'll need to sign. I want full custody. And I don't want to wait through court proceedings to get it. Cassandra, you do realize you will never see your son again if you sign the papers, right? I'll want to make a life for the boy. One without a mother who seems to hate him. Yeah, whatever. 
Cry me a big old river. So hurry up and get your paper, and I'll sign it. I want to get rid of the burden you put on me. Fine. I'll be there, just as soon as my lawyer tells me the documents are ready. Goodbye. I ended the call, feeling as if I'd just had a conversation with the devil. The intercom buzzed. Bradmore is here to see you. As protective as she was of me, Brad was likely one of the few men Janine would have patched through at this stage. My head was still reeling as I leaned back in my chair. Send him in please. When my best friend opened the door to my office, he could tell immediately that something was wrong with me. What the hell happened to you? I just shook my head, numb. He made his way to my desk, taking the seat across from me. You look like a Mack truck just ran over your dog or something. You don't have a dog though, right? The words weren't coming to me. How in the hell do you tell someone this kind of news? Bluntly, apparently. I'm a father, Brad. His blue eyes went wide. His jaw dropped. He jumped up and slammed his palms on the desk, making a loud slapping noise. What did you say? Yeah, he took it the way I thought he would. I have a two-year-old son. His name is Brayden Michael. I got up and walked over to the mini-fridge to grab myself a bottle of something with alcohol in it. Picking out a bottle of beer, I tossed it to Brad then got myself one. Brad just looked at his without opening it. You know it's like nine in the morning, right? Twisting the metal top off the bottle, I nodded. And your point is? I looked at him with no expression at all on my face. With a shrug, he opened his bottle and took a swig. So day drinking it is then. He went back to sit in his chair, looking as if he was as lost in thought as I was. Who's the mother? A redhead from a strip club, who I don't remember in the slightest. If DNA hadn't confirmed the evidence, I wouldn't believe it. So what, he asked taking a long pull of the cold brew. She hitting you hard for custody and cash? No, actually. I made my way to the sofa. I needed to lie down for a minute. Let my body catch up to my scattered mind. I'm taking him. What? Brad spun around in the chair to face me as I plopped down on the overstuffed black leather. You can't just take him away from his mother, Gannon. Pressing my forehead to the cold beer, I shook my head. She doesn't want him. She was going to give the kid away if I didn't take him. I looked over at him. Brad's face went from stunned to horrified. She what? She's a real pain, Brad. Like the meanest woman I've ever met. And somehow, I don't know how, I don't know what got into me about three years ago, but I was with her without using protection, apparently. More beer went down my throat as I tried to drown the anxieties that were bubbling up inside of me. Brad, I need help. Like permanent help, dude. Do you really not remember sleeping with this woman? Not at all. I jerked my head toward the paper on the desk. But I had a DNA test done, and the boy is definitely mine. Brad walked over to the desk and picked up the paper, staring at it as he spoke. Well, at least you did the smart thing and had that done, instead of taking this woman's word for it. So what now? I took another chug. As soon as my lawyer calls to let me know the documents I need are ready, I'll go get him. I closed my eyes. Brad, what am I going to do? I don't know the first thing about raising a kid. I don't know how to take care of one. Like what do two-year-olds eat? Drink? Do? Can they bathe themselves? Can they dress themselves? Cause I don't know how to do that for him. You need a nanny, Gannon. And fast, I agreed. I put the bottle to my lips, but found it was empty. Brad reached out, taking the bottle away from me. Fathers don't day drink. I don't think they do, anyway. Not the first day they're meeting their kid. I met him already, I informed him. A few days back. She treated him like a dog toy. He was a really nice little boy, Brad. Quiet. Calm. Friendly. No tantrums or anything. But, he wasn't my son then. Oh, and he can't talk, she says. Can't two-year-olds, I don't know, babble or something? He shrugged. No idea, man. None whatsoever. But if you make me a promise, I think I can help you out. 
I cracked an eye and watched as he hauled up a chair and sat down beside me. Yeah? Ha! You have to mean what you promised me, Ganon. I'm dead serious about this. Lethally serious. Anything. I sat up and rubbed the back of my neck. What do I have to promise? His light blonde brows scrunched together. You remember my baby sister? I knew of her in passing, even though we'd never met. Yeah? She's in her second year of college, majoring in early childhood development. She was just asking me about possible jobs she could take to pay bills and practice what she's learning in theory, since the school won't let them handle actual small humans yet. She'd jump at the chance to take care of this kid for you. My eyes popped. Brad, that would be fantastic. Hold on there, Gannon. He leaned in close, eyes flashing. If I do this for you, I don't want you to so much as lay one finger on Emily. I started to protest, and he cut me off. Because if you do, then I'll have to reach into your chest. He pounded his fist on my chest just once. And I will pull your beating heart out and feast on it. You got me, bro. Leave your little sister alone. That would be more than easy. Got it. As long as you understand me, repeat these words, and we'll have us a deal. Oh, and you have to pay her pretty well too. That's a given, dude. He thumped my chest once more. Chill on that shit, Brad. I can only take so much, bro. Tell me these magic words you want me to say, to make you believe that I will never lay a finger on your little sister. I, Gannon Forrester, do solemnly swear never to flirt with, fondle, or otherwise bother my best friend's baby sister, the apple of his eye, and the sweetest and most innocent girl on the planet. Who is this chick? All I could do was nod as I recited his words, sealing our deal and getting me the babysitter I needed. And can she move in with us too? I'll need her 24-7. I'll check with her, but I'm guessing that'll be fine. Fewer bills for her to pay. I almost sagged with relief. I now had a kid and a babysitter to go with said kid. Things might just turn out okay after all. End of sneak peek for The Forbidden Sitter, a billionaire holiday romance, Nightclub Sins 1. Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel, it helps more than you know.